the life and passion of cyprian bishop and martyr by pontius the deacon this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org although cyprian the devout priest and glorious witness of god composed many writings whereby the memory of his worthy name survives and although the profuse fertility of his eloquence and of god's grace so expands itself in the exuberance and richness of his discourse that he will probably never cease to speak even to the end of the world yet since to his works and deserts it is justly due that his example should be recorded in writing i have thought it well to prepare this brief and compendious narrative not that the life of so great a man can be unknown to any even of the heathen nations but that to our posterity also this incomparable and lofty pattern may be prolonged into immortal remembrance it would assuredly be hard that when our fathers have given such honour even to lay people and catechumens who have obtained martyrdom for reverence of their very martyrdom as to record many or i had nearly said well nigh all of the circumstances of their sufferings so that they might be brought to our knowledge also who as yet were not born the passion of such a priest and such a martyr as cyprian should be passed over who independently of his martyrdom had much to teach and that what he did while he lived should be hidden from the world and indeed these doings of his were such and so great and so admirable that i am deterred by the contemplation of their greatness and confess myself incompetent to discourse in a way that shall be worthy of the honour of his deserts and unable to relate such noble deeds in such a way that they may appear as great as in fact they are except that the multitude of his glories is itself sufficient for itself and needs no other heraldry it enhances my difficulty that you also are anxious to hear very much or if it be possible everything about him longing with eager warmth at least to become acquainted with his deeds although now his living words are silent and in this behalf if i should say that the powers of eloquence fail me i should say too little for eloquence itself fails of suitable powers fully to satisfy your desire and thus i am sorely pressed on both sides since he burdens me with his virtues and you press me hard with your entreaties at what point then shall i begin from what direction shall i approach the description of his goodness except from the beginning of his faith and from his heavenly birth inasmuch as the doings of a man of god should not be reckoned from any point except from the time that he was born of god he may have had pursuits previously and liberal arts may have imbued his mind while engaged therein but these things i pass over for as yet they had nothing to do with anything but his secular advantage but when he had learned sacred knowledge and breaking through the clouds of this world had emerged into the light of spiritual wisdom if i was with him in any of his doings if i have discerned any of his more illustrious labours i will speak of them only asking meanwhile for this indulgence that whatever i shall say too little for too little i must needs say may rather be attributed to my ignorance than subtracted from his glory while his faith was in its first rudiments he believed that before god nothing was worthy in comparison of the observance of continency for he thought that the heart might then become what it ought to be and the mind attain to the full capacity of truth if he trod under foot the lust of the flesh with the robust and healthy vigour of holiness who has ever recorded such a marvel his second birth had not yet enlightened the new man with the entire splendour of the divine light yet he was already overcoming the ancient and pristine darkness by the mere dawning of the light then what is even greater when he had learned from the reading of scripture certain things not according to the condition of his novitiate but in proportion to the earliness of his faith 
he immediately laid hold of what he had discovered for his own advantage in deserving well of God. By distributing his means for the relief of the indigence of the poor, by dispensing the purchase money of entire estates, he at once realized two benefits, the contempt of this world's ambition than which nothing is more pernicious, and the observance of that mercy which God has preferred even to his sacrifices, and which even he did not maintain, who said that he had kept all the commandments of the law, whereby, with premature swiftness of piety, he almost began to be perfect before he had learnt the way to be perfect. Who of the ancients, I pray, has done this? Who of the most celebrated veterans in the faith, whose hearts and ears have throbbed to the divine words for many years, has attempted any such thing as this man of faith yet unskilled, and whom, perhaps, as yet nobody trusted, surpassing the age of antiquity, accomplished by his glorious and admirable labors? No one reaps immediately upon his sowing. No one presses out the vintage harvest from the trenches just formed. No one ever yet sought for ripened fruit from newly planted slips. But in him all incredible things concurred. In him the threshing proceeded, if it may be said, for the thing is beyond belief, proceeded the sowing, the vintage, the shoots, the fruit, the root. The Apostle's epistle says that novices should be passed over lest by the stupor of heathenism that clings to their yet unconfirmed minds, their untaught inexperience should in any respect sin against God. He first, and I think he alone, furnished an illustration that greater progress is made by faith than by time. For although in the Acts of the Apostles the eunuch is described as at once baptized by Philip because he believed with his whole heart, this is not a fair parallel. For he was a Jew, and as he came from the temple of the Lord, he was reading the prophet Isaiah, and he hoped in Christ, although as yet he did not believe that he had come, while the other, coming from the ignorant heathens, began with a faith as mature as that with which few perhaps have finished their course. In short, in respect of God's grace, there was no delay, no postponement. I have said but little. He immediately received the presbyteriate and the priesthood. For who is there that would not entrust every grade of honor to one who believed with such a disposition? There are many things which he did while still a layman, and many things which now as a presbyter he did, many things which, after the examples of righteous men of old, and following them with a close imitation, he accomplished with the obedience of entire consecration, that deserved well of the Lord. For his discourse concerning this was usually, that if he had read of any one being set forth with the praise of God, he would persuade us to inquire on account of what doings he had pleased God. If Job, glorious by God's testimony, was called a true worshipper of God, and one to whom there was none upon earth to be compared, he taught that we should do whatever Job had previously done, so that while we were doing like things, we may call forth a similar testimony of God for ourselves. He, contemning the loss of his estate, gained such advantage by his virtue thus tried, that he had no perception of the temporal losses even of his affection. Neither poverty nor pain broke him down. The persuasion of his wife did not influence him. The dreadful suffering of his own body did not shake his firmness. His virtue remained established in its own home, and his devotion, founded upon deep roots, gave way under no onset of the devil, tempting him to abstain from blessing his God with a grateful faith, even in his adversity. His house was open to every comer. No widow returned from him with an empty lap. No blind man was unguided by him as a companion. None faltering in step was unsupported by him for a staff. None stripped of help by the hand of the mighty was not protected by him as a defender. Such things ought they to do. He was accustomed to say who desire to please God. 
and thus running through the examples of all good men by always imitating those who were better than others he made himself also worthy of imitation he had a close association among us with a just man and of praiseworthy memory by name caecilius and in age as well as in honour a presbyter who had converted him from his worldly errors to the acknowledgment of the true divinity this man he loved with entire honour and all observance regarding him with an obedient veneration not only as the friend and comrade of his soul but as the parent of his new life and at length he influenced by his attentions was as well he might be stimulated to such a pitch of excessive love that when he was departing from this world and his summons was at hand he commended to him his wife and children so that him whom he had made a partner in the fellowship of his way of life he afterwards made the heir of his affection it would be tedious to go through individual circumstances it would be laborious to enumerate all his doings for the proof of his good works i think that this one thing is enough that by the judgment of god and the favour of the people he was chosen to the office of the priesthood and the degree of the episcopate while still a neophyte and as it was considered a novice although still in the early days of his faith and in the untaught season of his spiritual life a generous disposition so shone forth in him that although not yet resplendent with the glitter of office but only of hope he gave promise of entire trustworthiness for the priesthood that was coming upon him moreover i will not pass over that remarkable fact of the way in which when the entire people by god's inspiration leapt forward in his love and honour he humbly withdrew giving place to men of older standing and thinking himself unworthy of a claim to so great honour so that he thus became more worthy for he is made more worthy who dispenses with what he deserves and with this excitement were the eager people at that time inflamed desiring with a spiritual longing as the event proved not only a bishop for in him whom then was a latent foreboding of divinity they were in such wise demanding they were seeking not only a priest but moreover a future martyr a crowded fraternity was besieging the doors of the house and throughout all the avenues of access an anxious love was circulating possibly that apostolic experience might then have happened to him as he desired of being let down through a window had he also been equal to the apostle in the honour of ordination it was plain to be seen that all the rest were expecting his coming with an anxious spirit of suspense and received him when he came with excessive joy i speak unwillingly but i must needs speak some resisted him even that he might overcome them yet with what gentleness how patiently how benevolently he gave them indulgence how mercifully he forgave them reckoning them afterwards to the astonishment of many among his closest and most intimate friends for who would not be amazed at the forgetfulness of a mind so retentive henceforth who is sufficient to relate the manner in which he bore himself what piety was his what vigour how great his mercy how great his strictness so much sanctity and grace beamed from his face that it confounded the minds of the beholders his countenance was grave and joyous neither was his severity gloomy nor his affability excessive but a mingled tempering of both so that it might be doubted whether he most deserved to be revered or to be loved except that he deserved both to be revered and to be loved and his dress was not out of harmony with his countenance being itself also subdued to a fitting mien the pride of the world did not inflame him nor yet did an excessively affected penury make him sordid because this latter kind of attire arises no less from boastfulness than to such an ambitious frugality from ostentation but what did he as bishop in respect of the poor 
whom as a catechumen he had loved. Let the priests of piety consider, or those whom the teaching of their very rank has trained to the duty of good works, or those whom the common obligation of the sacrament has bound to the duty of manifesting love. Cyprian, the bishop's throne, received such as he had been before. It did not make him so. And therefore, for such merits, he at once obtained the glory of prescription also. For nothing else was proper than that he who, in the secret recesses of his conscience, was rich in the full honor of religion and faith, should moreover be renowned in the publicly diffused report of the Gentiles. He might, indeed, at that time, in accordance with the rapidity wherewith he always attained everything, have hastened to the crown of martyrdom appointed for him, especially when with repeated calls he was frequently demanded for the lions, had it not been needful for him to pass through all the grades of glory, and thus to arrive at the highest, and had not the impending desolation needed the aid of so fertile a mind. For conceive of him as being at that time taken away by the dignity of martyrdom. Who was there to show the advantage of grace advancing by faith? Who was there to restrain virgins to the fitting discipline of modesty and address worthy of holiness as if with a kind of brittle of the lessons of the Lord? Who was there to teach penitence to the lapsed, truth to heretics, unity to schismatics, peacefulness and the law of evangelical prayer to the sons of God? By whom were the blaspheming Gentiles to be overcome by retorting upon themselves the accusations which they heap upon us? By whom were Christians of too tender an affection, or, what is of more importance, of a too feeble faith in respect of the loss of their friends, to be consoled with the hope of futurity? When should we so learn mercy? Whence patience? Who was there to restrain the ill blood arising from the envenomed malignity of envy with the sweetness of a wholesome remedy? Who was there to raise up such great martyrs by the exhortation of his divine discourse? Who was there, in short, to animate so many confessors sealed with a second inscription on their distinguished brows and reserved alive for an example of martyrdom? kindling their ardour with a heavenly trumpet. Fortunately, fortunately, it occurred then, and truly by the Spirit's direction, that the man who was needed for so many and so excellent purposes was withheld from the consummation of martyrdom. Do you wish to be assured that the cause of his withdrawal was not fear? To allege nothing else, he did suffer subsequently, and this suffering he assuredly would have evaded as usual if he had evaded it before. It was indeed that fear, and rightly so, that fear which would dread to offend the Lord, that fear which prefers to obey God's commands rather than to be crowned in disobedience. For a mind dedicated in all things to God, and thus enslaved to the divine admonitions, believed that even in suffering itself it would sin, unless it had obeyed the Lord, who then bade him seek the place of concealment. Moreover, I think that something may here be said about the benefit of the delay, although I have already touched slightly on the matter. By what appears subsequently to have occurred, it follows that we may prove that that withdrawal was not conceived by human pusillanimity, but, as indeed is the case, was truly divine. The usual and violent rage of a cruel persecution had laid waste God's people, and since the artful enemy could not deceive all by one fraud, wherever the incautious soldier laid bare his side, there in various manifestations of rage he had destroyed individuals with different kinds of overthrow. There needed someone who could when men were wounded and hurt by the various art of the attacking enemy, use the remedy of the celestial medicine according to the nature of the wound, either for cutting 
or for cherishing them. A man was preserved of an intelligence, besides other excellences, also spiritually trained, who between the resounding waves of the opposing schisms could steer the middle course of the church in a steady path. Are not such plans, I ask, divine? Could this have been done without God? Let them consider who think that such things as these can happen by chance. To them the church replies with clear voice, saying, I do not allow and do not believe that such needful men are reserved without the decree of God. Still, if it seem well, let me glance at the rest. Afterwards, there broke out a dreadful plague, and excessful destruction of a hateful disease invaded every house in succession of the trembling populace, carrying off, day by day, with abrupt attack, numberless people, every one from his own house. All were shuddering, fleeing, shunning the contagion, impiously exposing their own friends, as if, with the exclusion of the person who was sure to die of the plague, one could exclude death itself also. There lay, about, the meanwhile, over the whole city, no longer bodies, but the carcasses of many, and, by the contemplation of a lot, which in their turn would be theirs, demanded the pity of the passer-by for themselves. No one regarded anything besides his cruel gains. No one trembled at the remembrance of a similar event. No one did to another what he himself wished to experience. In these circumstances, it would be a wrong to pass over what the pontiff of Christ did, who excelled the pontiffs of the world as much in kindly affection as he did in truth of religion. On the people assembled together in one place, he first of all urged the benefits of mercy, teaching by examples from divine lessons how greatly the duties of benevolence avail to deserve well of God. Then afterwards, he subjoined that there was nothing wonderful in our cherishing our own people only with the needed attentions of love, but that he might become perfect who would do something more than the publican or the heathen, who, overcoming evil with good, and practicing a clemency which was like the divine clemency, loved even his enemies, who would pray for the salvation of those that persecute him, as the Lord admonishes and exhorts. God continually makes his sun to rise, and from time to time gives showers to nourish the seed, exhibiting all these kindnesses not only to his people, but to aliens also. And if a man professes to be a son of God, why does not he imitate the example of his father? It becomes us, said he, to answer to our birth, and it is not fitting that those who are evidently born of God should be degenerate, but rather that the propagation of a good father should be proved in his offspring by the emulation of his goodness. I omit many other matters, and, indeed, many important ones, which the necessity of a limited space does not permit to be detailed in more lengthened discourse, and concerning which this much is sufficient to have been said. But, if the Gentiles could have heard these things as they stood before the rostrum, they would probably at once have believed. What then should a Christian people do, whose very name proceeds from faith? Thus the ministrations are constantly distributed according to the quality of the men and their degrees. Many who, by the straightness of poverty, were unable to manifest the kindness of wealth, manifest more than wealth, making up by their own labor a service dearer than all riches. And under such a teacher who would not press forward to be found in some parts of such a warfare, whereby he might please both God the Father and Christ the Judge, and for the present so excellent a priest. Thus what is good was done in the liberality of overflowing works to all men, not to those only who are of the household of faith. Something more was done than is recorded of the incomparable benevolence of Tobias. He must forgive, and forgive again, and frequently forgive, or, to speak, more truly, he must of right concede that, 
although very much might be done before Christ, yet that something more might be done after Christ, since to his times all fullness is attributed. Tobias collected together those who were slain by the king and cast out, of his own race only. Banishment followed these actions, so good and so benevolent, for impiety always makes this return, that it repays the better with the worse. And what God's priests replied to the interrogation of the proconsul, there are acts which relate. In the meantime, he is excluded from the city who had done some good for the city's safety. He who had striven that the eyes of the living should not suffer the horrors of the infernal abode. He, I say, who vigilant in the watches of benevolence had provided, O oh wickedness, with unacknowledged goodness, that when all were forsaking the desolate appearance of the city, a destitute state and a deserted country should not perceive its many exiles. But let the world look to this, which accounts banishment a penalty. To them, their country is too dear, and they have the same name as their parents, but we abhor even our parents themselves if they would persuade us against God. To them, it is a severe punishment to live outside their own city. To the Christian, the whole of this world is one home. Wherefore, though he were banished into a hidden and secret place, yet associated with the affairs of his God, he cannot regard it as an exile. In addition, while honestly serving God, he is a stranger even in his own city. For while the continency of the Holy Spirit restrains him from carnal desires, he lays aside the conversation of the former man and even among his fellow citizens, or, I might also say, among the parents themselves of his earthly life. He is a stranger. Besides, although this might otherwise appear to be a punishment, yet in causes and sentences of this kind, which we suffer for the trial of the proof of our virtue, it is not a punishment because it is a glory. But indeed, suppose banishment not to be a punishment to us, yet the witness of their own conscience may still attribute the last and worst wickedness to those who can lay upon the innocent what they think to be a punishment. I will not now describe a charming place, and, for the present, I pass over the addition of all possible delights. Let us conceive of the place, filthy in situation, squalid in appearance, having no wholesome water, no pleasantness of verdure, no neighboring shore, but vast wooded rocks between the inhospitable jaws of a totally deserted solitude far removed in the pathless regions of the world. Such a place might have borne the name of exile if Cyprian, the priest of God, had come thither, although to him, if the ministrations of men had been wanting either birds, as in the case of Elias, or angels, as in that of Daniel, would have ministered. Away, away with the belief that anything would be wanting to the least of us, so long as he stands for the confession of the name. So far was God's pontiff, who had always been urgent in merciful works from needing the assistance of all these things. And now let us return with thankfulness to what I had suggested in the second place, that for the soul of such a man there was divinely provided a sunny and suitable spot, a dwelling, secret as he wished, and all that has before been promised to be added to those who seek the kingdom and righteousness of God, and, not to mention, the number of the brethren who visited him, and then the kindness of the citizens themselves, which supplied to him everything whereof he appeared to be deprived. I will not pass over God's wonderful visitation, whereby he wished his priest to be so certain in exile of his passion that was to follow, that in his full confidence of the threatening martyrdom, Cherubis possessed not only an exile, but a martyr too. For on that day whereon we first abode in the place of banishment, for the condensation of his love had chosen me among his household companions to be a voluntary exile, would that he could also have chosen me to share his passion. There appeared to me, said he, ere 
yet I was sunk in the repose of slumber, a young man of unusual stature, who, as it were, led me to the praetorium, where I seemed to myself to be led before the tribunal of the proconsul then sitting. When he looked upon me, he began at once to note down a sentence on his tablet, which I knew not, for he had asked nothing of me with the accustomed interrogation. But the youth, who was standing at his back, very anxiously read what had been noted down, and because he could not then declare it in words, he showed me by an intelligible sign what was contained in the writing of that tablet. For, with hand expanded and flattened like a blade, he imitated the stroke of an accustomed punishment and expressed what he wished to be understood as clearly as by speech. I understood the future sentence of my passion. I began to ask and beg immediately that a delay of at least one day should be accorded me until I should have arranged my property in some reasonable order. And when I had urgently repeated my entreaty, he began again to note down, I know not what, on his tablet. But I perceived from the calmness of his countenance that the judge's mind was moved by my petition as being a just one. Moreover, that youth, who already had disclosed to me the intelligence of my passion by gesture rather than by words, hastened to signify repeatedly by secret signal that the delay was granted which had been asked for until the morrow, twisting his fingers one behind the other. And I, although the sentence had not been read, although I rejoiced with very glad heart with joy at the delay accorded, yet trembled so with fear of the uncertainty of the interpretation that the remains of fear still set my exulting heart beating with excessive agitation. What could be more plain than this revelation? What could be more blessed than this condensation? Everything was foretold to him beforehand, which subsequently followed. Nothing was diminished of the words of God. Nothing was mutilated of so sacred a promise. Carefully consider each particular in accordance with its announcement. He asks for delay till the morrow, when the sentence of his passion was being deliberated on, begging that he might arrange his affairs on the day which he had thus obtained. This one day signified a year, which he was about to pass in the world after his vision. For, to speak more plainly, on that day, after the year was expired, he was crowned, on which, at the commencement of the year, the fact had been announced to him. For although we do not read of the day of the Lord as a year in the sacred scriptures, yet we regard that space of time as due in making promise of future things. Whence it is of no consequence if, in this case, under the ordinary expression of a day, it is only a year that in this place is implied, because that which is the greater ought to be fuller in meaning. Moreover, that it was explained rather by signs than by speech, was because the utterance of speech was reserved for the manifestation of the time itself. For anything is usually set forth in words whenever what is set forth is accomplished. For indeed, no one knew why this had been shown to him until afterwards, when, on the very day on which he had seen it, he was crowned. Nevertheless, in the meantime, his impending suffering was certainly known by all, but the exact day of his passion was not spoken of by any of the same, just as if they were ignorant of it. And, indeed, I find something similar in the scriptures. For Zacharias the priest, because he did not believe the promise of his son, made to him by the angel, became dumb, so that he asked for tablets by a sign, being about to write his son's name rather than utter it. With reason, also, in this case, where God's messenger declared the impending passion of his priest rather by signs, he both admonished his faith and fortified his priest. Moreover, the ground of asking for delay arose out of his wish to arrange his affairs and settle his will. Yet what affairs or what will had he to arrange except ecclesiastical concerns? And thus that last delay was received in order 
that whatever had to be disposed of by his final decision concerning the care of cherishing the poor might be arranged and i think that for no other reason indeed for this reason only indulgence was granted to him even by those very persons who had ejected and were about to slay him that being at hand he might relieve the poor also who were before him with the final or to speak more accurately with the entire outlay of his last stewardship and therefore having so benevolently ordered matters and so arranged them according to his will the morrow drew near now also a messenger came to him from the city from zixtus the good and peacemaking priest and on that account most blessed martyr the coming executioner was instantly looked for who should strike through that devoted neck of the most sacred victim and thus in the daily expectation of dying every day was to him as if the crown might be attributed to each in the meantime there assembled to him many eminent people and people of most illustrious rank and family and noble with the world's distinctions who on account of ancient friendship with him repeatedly urged his withdrawal and that their urgency might not be in some sort hollow they also offered places to which he might retire but he had now set the world aside having his mind suspended upon heaven and did not consent to their tempting persuasions he would perhaps even then have done what was being asked for by so many and faithful friends if it had been bidden him by divine command but that lofty glory of so great a man must not be passed over without announcement that now when the world was swelling and of its trust in its princes breathing out hatred of the name he was instructing god's servants as opportunity was given in the exhortations of the lord and was animating them to tread underfoot the sufferings of this present time by the contemplation of a glory to come hereafter indeed such was his love of sacred discourse that he wished that his prayers in regard to his suffering might be so answered that he would be put to death in the very act of speaking about god and these were the daily acts of a priest destined for a pleasing sacrifice to god when behold at the bidding of the proconsul the officer with his soldiers on a sudden came unexpectedly on him or rather to speak more truly thought that he had come unexpectedly on him at his gardens at his gardens i say which at the beginning of his faith he had sold and which being restored by god's mercy he would assuredly have sold again for the use of the poor if he had not wished to avoid ill will from the persecutors but when could a mind ever prepared be taken unawares as if by an unforeseen attack therefore now he went forward certain that what had been long delayed would be settled he went forward with a lofty and elevated mien manifesting cheerfulness in his look and courage in his heart but being delayed to the morrow he returned from the praetorium to the officer's house when on a sudden a scattered rumour prevailed throughout all carthage that now the sais was brought forward whom there was nobody who did not know as well for his illustrious fame in the honourable opinion of all as on account of the recollection of his most renowned work on all sides all men were flocking together to a spectacle to us glorious from the devotion of faith and to be mourned over even by the gentiles a gentle custody however had him in charge when taken and placed for one night in the officer's house so that we his associates and friends were as usual in his company the whole people in the meantime in anxiety that nothing should be done throughout the night without their knowledge kept watch before the officer's door the goodness of god granted him at that time so truly worthy of it that even god's people should watch on the passion of the priest yet perhaps some one may ask 
what was the reason of his returning from the praetorium to the officer and some think that this arose from the fact that for his own part the proconsul was then unwilling far be it from me to complain in matters divinely ordered of slothfulness or aversion in the proconsul far be it from me to admit such an evil into the consciousness of a religious mind as that the fancy of man should decide the fate of so blessed a martyr but the morrow which a year before the divine condensation had foretold required to be literally the morrow and hence the respite at last that other day dawned that destined that promised that divine day which if even the tyrant himself had wished to put off he would not have had any power to do so the day rejoicing at the consciousness of the future martyr and the clouds being scattered throughout the circuit of the world the day shone upon with a brilliant sun he went out from the house of the officer though he was the officer of christ and god and was walled in on all sides by the ranks of a mingled multitude and such a numberless army hung upon his company as if they had come with an assembled troop to assault death itself now as he went he had to pass by the race course and rightly and as if it had been contrived on purpose he had to pass by the place of a corresponding struggle who having finished his contest was running to the crown of righteousness but when he had come to the praetorium as the proconsul had not yet come forth a place of retirement was accorded him there as he sat moistened after his long journey with excessive perspiration the seat was by chance covered with linen so that even in the very moment of his passion he might enjoy the honour of the episcopate one of the officers tesserarius who had formerly been a christian offered him his clothes as if he might wish to change his moistened garments for drier ones and he doubtless coveted nothing further in respect of his proffered kindness than to possess the now blood-stained sweat of the martyr going to god he made reply to him and said we apply medicines to annoyances which probably to-day will no longer exist is it any wonder that he despised suffering in body who had despised death in soul why should we say more he was suddenly announced to the proconsul he is brought forward he is placed before him he is interrogated as to his name he answers who he is and nothing more and thus therefore the judge reads from his tablet the sentence which lately in the vision he had not read a spiritual sentence not rashly to be spoken a sentence worthy of such a bishop and such a witness a glorious sentence wherein he was called a standard-bearer of the sect and an enemy of the gods and one who was to be an example to his people and that with his blood discipline would begin to be established nothing could be more complete nothing more true than the sentence for all the things which were said although said by a heathen are divine nor is it indeed to be wondered at since priests are accustomed to prophesy of the passion he had been a standard-bearer who was accustomed to teach concerning the bearing of christ's standard he had been an enemy of the gods who commanded the idols to be destroyed moreover he gave example to his friends since when many were about to follow in a similar manner he was the first in the province to consecrate the first fruits of martyrdom and by his blood discipline began to be established but it was the discipline of martyrs who emulating their teacher in the imitation of a glory like his own themselves also gave a confirmation to discipline by the very blood of their own example and when he left the doors of the praetorium a crowd of soldiery accompanied him and that nothing might be wanting in his passion centurions and tribunes guarded his side now the place itself where he was about to suffer is level so that it affords a noble spectacle with its trees thickly planted on all sides but as by the extent of the space beyond the view was not attainable to the confused crowd 
persons who favored him had climbed up into the branches of the trees that there might not even be wanting to him what happened in the case of zacchaeus that he was gazed upon from the trees and now having with his own hands bound his eyes he tried to hasten the slowness of the executioner whose office was to wield the sword and who with difficulty clasped the blade in his failing right hand with trembling fingers until the mature hour of glorification strengthened the hand of the centurion with power granted from above to accomplish the death of the excellent man and at length supplied him with the permitted strength o blessed people of the church who as well in sight as in feeling and what is more in outspoken words suffered with such a bishop as theirs and as they had ever judged him in his own discourses were crowned by god the judge for although that which the general wished desired could not occur viz that the entire congregation should suffer at once in the fellowship of a like glory yet whoever under the eyes of christ beholding and in the hearing of the priest eagerly desired to suffer by the sufficient testimony of that desire did in some sort send a missive to god as his ambassador his passion being thus accomplished it resulted that cyprian who had been an example to all good men was also the first who in africa imbued his priestly crown with blood of martyrdom because he was the first who began to be such after the apostles for from the time at which the episcopal order is enumerated at carthage not one is ever recorded even of good men and priests to have come to suffering although devotion surrendered to god is always in consecrated men reckoned instead of martyrdom yet cyprian attained even to the perfect crown by the consummation of the lord so that in that very city in which he had in such wise lived and in which he had been the first to do many noble deeds he also was the first to decorate the insignia of his heavenly priesthood with glorious gore what shall i do now between joy at his passion and grief at still remaining my mind is divided in different directions and twofold affections are burdening a heart too limited for them shall i grieve that i was not his associate but yet i must triumph in his victory shall i triumph at his victory still i grieve that i am not his companion yet still to you i must in simplicity confess what you also are aware of that it was my intention to be his companion much and excessively i exult at his glory but still more do i grieve that i remain behind End of the Life and Passion of Cyprian, Bishop and Martyr by Pontius the Deacon Read by David Ronald Epistle 1 of Epistles of Cyprian by Cyprian This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Epistle 1 to Donatus Argument Cyprian had promised Donatus that he would have a discourse with him concerning things divine and now being reminded of his promise he fulfils it commending at length the grace of god conferred in baptism he declares how he had been changed thereby and finally pointing out the errors of the world he exhorts to contempt of it and to reading and prayer caecilius cyprian to donatus sends greeting you rightly remind me dearest donatus for i not only remember my promise but i confess that this is the appropriate time for its fulfilment when the vintage festival invites the mind to unbend in repose and to enjoy the annual and appointed respite of the declining year moreover the place is in accord with the season and the pleasant aspect of the gardens harmonizes with the gentle breezes of a mild autumn in soothing and cheering the senses in such a place as this it is delightful to pass the day in discourse and by the study of the sacred narratives to train the conscience of the breast to the apprehension of the divine precepts and that no profane intruder may interrupt our converse 
nor any unrestrained clatter of a noisy household disturb it. Let us seek this bower. The neighboring thickets ensure us solitude, and the vagrant trailings of the vine, branches creeping in pendant mazes among the reeds that support them, have made for us a porch of vines and a leafy shelter. Pleasantly, here we clothe our thoughts in words, and while we gratify our eyes with the agreeable outlook upon trees and vines, the mind is at once instructed by what we hear, and nourished by what we see, although, at the present time, your only pleasure and your only interest is in our discourse. Despising the other pleasures of sight, your eye is now fixed on me. With your mind as well as your ears, you are altogether a listener, and a listener, too, with an eagerness proportioned to your affection. And yet, of what kind, or of what amount is anything that my mind is likely to communicate to yours? The poor mediocrity of my shallow understanding produces a very limited harvest, and enriches the soil with no fruitful deposits. Nevertheless, with such powers as I have, I will set about the matter, for the subject itself on which I am about to speak will assist me. In courts of justice, in the public assembly, in political debate, a copious eloquence may be the glory of a voluble ambition, but in speaking of the Lord, God, a chaste simplicity of expression strives for the conviction of faith rather with the substance than with the powers of eloquence. Therefore, except from me things, not clever, but weighty, words not decked up to charm a popular audience with cultivated rhetoric, but simple and fitted by their unvarnished truthfulness for the proclamation of the divine mercy. Except what is felt before it is spoken, what has not been accumulated with tardy painstaking during the lapse of years, but has been inhaled in one breath of ripening grace. While I was still lying in darkness and gloomy night, wavering hither and thither, tossed about on the foam of this boastful age, and uncertain of my wandering steps, knowing nothing of my real life, and remote from truth and light, I used to regard it as a difficult matter, and especially as difficult in respect of my character at that time, that a man should be capable of being born again, a truth which the divine mercy had announced for my salvation, and that a man quickened to a new life in the laver of saving water should be able to put off what he had previously been, and although retaining all his bodily structure should be himself changed in heart and soul. How, said I, is such a conversion possible, that there should be a sudden and rapid divestment of all which, either innate in us has hardened in the corruption of our material nature, or acquired by us has become inveterate by long accustomed use. These things have become deeply and radically ingrained within us. When does he learn thrift who has been used to liberal banquets and sumptuous feasts? And he who has been glittering in gold and purple, and has been celebrated for his costly attire, when does he reduce himself to ordinary and simple clothing? One who has felt the charm of the facies and of civic honors shrinks from becoming a mere private and inglorious citizen. The man who is attended by crowds of clients and dignified by the numerous association of an officious train regards it as a punishment when he is alone. It is inevitable, as it ever has been, that the love of wine should entice, pride inflate, anger inflame, covetousness disquiet, cruelty stimulate, ambition delight, lust hasten to ruin, with allurements that will never let go their hold. These were my frequent thoughts, for as I myself was held in bonds by the innumerable errors of my previous life, from which I did not believe that I could by possibility be delivered, so I was disposed to my acquiesce in my clinging vices, and because I despaired of better things, I used to indulge my sins as if they were actually parts of me and indigenous to me. But after that, by the help of the water of the new birth, the stain of former years had been washed away, and a light from above, serene and pure, had been infused into my reconciled heart. After that, 
by the agency of the spirit breathed from heaven, a second birth had restored me to a new man. Then, in a wondrous manner, doubtful things at once began to assure themselves to me, hidden things to be revealed, dark things to be enlightened. What before had seemed difficult began to suggest a means of accomplishment. What had been thought impossible to be capable of being achieved, so that I was enabled to acknowledge that what previously, being born of the flesh, had been living in the practice of sins, was of the earth earthly, but had now begun to be of God, and was animated by the spirit of holiness. You yourself assuredly know, and recollect as well as I do, what was taken away from us, and what was given to us by that death of evil and that life of virtue. You yourself know this without my information. Anything like boasting in one's own praise is hateful, although we cannot, in reality, boast, but only be grateful for whatever we do not ascribe to man's virtue, but declare to be the gift of God, so that, now we sin not, is the beginning of the work of faith, whereas that we sinned before was the result of human error. All our power is of God, I say, of God. From him we have life, from him we have strength. By power derived and conceived from him we do, while yet in this world, for know the indications of things to come. Only let fear be the keeper of innocence, that the Lord, who of his mercy has flowed into our hearts in the access of celestial grace, may be kept by righteous submissiveness in the holstery of a grateful mind, that the assurance we have gained may not beget carelessness, and so the old enemy creep upon us again. But if you keep the way of innocence, the way of righteousness, if you walk with a firm and steady step, if depending on God with your whole strength and with your whole heart, you only be what you have begun to be, liberty and power to do is given you in proportion to the increase of your spiritual grace. For there is not, as is the case with earthly benefits, any measure of stint in the dispensing of the heavenly gift. The spirit freely flowing forth is restrained by no limits, is checked by no closed barriers within certain bounded spaces. It flows perpetually. It is exuberant in its affluence. Let our heart only be a thirst and be ready to receive, in the degree in which we bring to it a capacious faith, in that measure we draw from it an overflowing grace. Thence is given power, with modest chastity, with a sound mind, with a simple voice, with unblemished virtue, that is, able to quench the virus of poisons for the healing of the sick to purge out the stains of foolish souls by restored health, to bid peace to those that are at enmity, repose to the violent, gentleness to the unruly, by startling threats to force to avow themselves the impure and vagrant spirits that have betaken themselves into the bodies of men whom they purpose to destroy, to drive them with heavy blows to come out of them, to stretch them out, struggling, howling, groaning with increase of constantly renewing pain, to beat them with scourges, to roast them with fire. The matter is carried on there, but is not seen. The strokes inflicted are hidden, but the penalty is manifest. Thus, in respect of what we have already begun to be, the spirit that we have received possesses its own liberty of action, while in that we have not yet changed our body and members, the carnal view is still darkened by the clouds of this world. How great is this empire of the mind, and what a power it has, not alone that itself is withdrawn from the mischievous associations of the world, as one who is purged and pure can suffer no stain of a hostile eruption, but that it becomes still greater and stronger in its might, so that it can rule over all the imperious host of the attacking adversary with its sway, but in order that the characteristics of the divine may shine more brightly by the development of the truth, I will give you light to apprehend it, the obscurity caused by sin being wiped away. I will draw away the veil from the darkness of this hidden world, 
for a brief space conceive yourself to be transported to one of the loftiest peaks of some inaccessible mountain thence gaze on the appearances of things lying below you and with eyes turned in various directions look upon the eddies of the billowy world while you yourself are removed from earthly contacts you will at once begin to feel compassion for the world and with self-recollection and increasing gratitude to god you will rejoice with all the greater joy that you have escaped it consider the roads blocked up by robbers the seas beset with pirates wars scattered all over the earth with the bloody horror of camps the whole world is wet with mutual blood and murder which in the case of an individual is admitted to be a crime is called a virtue when it is committed wholesale impunity is claimed for the wicked deeds not on the plea that they are guiltless but because the cruelty is perpetrated on a grand scale and now if you turn your eyes and your regards to the cities themselves you will behold a concourse more fraught with sadness than any solitude the gladiatorial games are prepared that blood may gladden the lust of cruel eyes the body is fed up with stronger food and the vigorous mass of limbs is enriched with brawn and muscle that the wretch fattened for punishment may die a harder death man is slaughtered that man may be gratified and the skill that is best able to kill is an exercise and an art crime is not only committed but it is taught what can be said more inhuman what more repulsive training is undergone to acquire the power to murder and the achievement of murder is its glory what state of things i pray you can that be and what can it be like in which men whom none have condemned offer themselves to the wild beasts men of ripe age of sufficiently beautiful person clad in costly garments living men they are adorned for a voluntary death wretched men they boast of their own miseries they fight with beasts not for their crime but for their madness fathers look on their own sons a brother is in the arena and his sister is hard by and although a grander display of pomp increases the price of the exhibition yet o oh shame even the mother will pay the increase in order that she may be present at her own miseries and in looking upon scenes so frightful and so impious and so deadly they do not seem to be aware that they are parasites with their eyes hence turn your looks to the abominations not less to be deplored of another kind of spectacle in the theatres also you will behold what may well cause you grief and shame it is the tragic buskin which relates in verse the crimes of ancient days the old horrors of parricide and incest are unfolded in action calculated to express the image of the truth so that as the ages pass by any crime that was formerly committed may not be forgotten each generation is reminded by what it hears that whatever has once been done may be done again crimes never die out by the lapse of ages wickedness is never abolished by process of time impiety is never buried in oblivion things which have now ceased to be actual deeds of vice become examples in the mimes moreover by the teaching of infamies the spectator is attracted either to reconsider what he may have done in secret or to hear what he may do adultery is learnt while it is seen and while the mischief having public authority panders to vices matron who perchance had gone to the spectacle a modest woman returns from it immodest still further what a degradation of morals it is what a stimulus to abominable deeds what food for vice to be polluted by histrionic gestures against the covenant and law of one's birth to gaze in detail upon the endurance of incestuous abominations men are emasculated and all the pride and vigour of their sex is effeminated in the disgrace of their enervated body and he is most pleasing there who has most completely broken down the man into the woman 
he grows into praise by virtue of his crime, and the more he is degraded, the more skillful he is considered to be. Such a one is looked upon, O oh shame, and looked upon with pleasure. And what can not such a creature suggest? He inflames the senses, he flatters the affections, he drives out the more vigorous conscience of a virtuous beast. Nor is there wanting authority for the enticing abomination that the mischief may creep upon people with a less perceptible approach. They picture Venus immodest, Mars adulterous, and that Jupiter of theirs not more supreme in dominion than in vice, inflamed with earthly love in the midst of his own thunders, now groaning white in the feathers of a swan, now pouring down in a golden shower, now breaking forth by the help of birds to violate the purity of boys, and now put the question, can he who looks upon such things be healthy-minded or modest? Men imitate the gods whom they adore, and to such miserable beings their crimes become their religion. Oh, if placed on that lofty watchtower you could gaze into the secret places, if you could open the closed doors of sleeping chambers and recall their dark recesses to the perception of sight, you would behold things done by immodest persons with no chaste eye could look upon. You would see what even to see is a crime. You would see what people imbruted with the madness of vice deny that they have done and yet hasten to do. Men with frenzied lusts rushing upon men doing things which afford no gratification even to those who do them. I am deceived if the man who is guilty of such things as these does not accuse others of them. The depraved maligns the depraved, and thinks that he himself, though conscious of the guilt, has escaped as if consciousness were not a sufficient condemnation. The same people who are accusers in public are criminals in private, condemning themselves at the same time as they condemn the culprit. They denounce abroad what they commit at home, willingly doing what, when they have done, they accuse, a daring which assuredly is fitly mated with vice, and an impudence quite in accordance with shameless people. And I beg you not to wonder at the things that persons of this kind speak, the offense of their mouths in words is the least of which they are guilty. But after considering the public roads full of pitfalls, after battles of many kinds scattered abroad over the whole world, after exhibitions either bloody or infamous, after the abominations of lust, whether exposed for sale in brothels or hidden within the domestic walls, abominations, the audacity of which is greater in proportion to the secrecy of the crime, Possibly, you may think that the forum at least is free from such things, that it is neither exposed to exasperating wrongs nor polluted by the association of criminals. Then turn your gaze in that direction. There you will discover things more odious than ever, so that thence you will be more desirous of turning away your eyes, although the laws are carved on twelve tables and the statutes are publicly prescribed on brazen tablets. Yet wrong is done in the midst of the laws themselves. Wickedness is committed in the very face of the statutes. Innocence is not preserved even in the place where it is defended. By turns the rancor of disputants rages, and when peace is broken among the togas, the forum echoes with the madness of strife. There close at hand is the spear and the sword, and the executioner also. There is the claw that tears, the rack that stretches, the fire that burns up, more tortures for one poor human body than it has limbs, and in such cases who is there to help? One's patron? He makes a feint and deceives. The judge? But he sells his sentence. He who sits to avenge crimes commits them, and the judge becomes the culprit in order that the accused may perish innocently. Crimes are everywhere common, and everywhere is the multiform character of sin. The pernicious poison acts by means of degraded minds. One man forges a will, another by a capital fraud makes a false deposition. On the one hand, 
children are cheated of their inheritances. On the other, strangers are endowed with their estates. The opponent makes his charge. The false accuser attacks. The witness defames. On all sides, the venal impudence of hired voices sets about the falsification of charges, while in the meantime the guilty do not even perish with the innocent. There is no fear about the laws, no concern for either inquisitor or judge. When the sentence can be bought off for money, it is not cared for. It is a crime now among the guilty to be innocent. Whoever does not imitate the wicked is an offense to them. The laws have come to terms with crimes, and whatever is public has begun to be allowed. What can be the modesty, what can be the integrity, that prevails there, when there are none to condemn the wicked, the one only meets with those who ought themselves to be condemned? But that we may not perchance appear as if we were picking out extreme cases, and with the view of disparagement were seeking to attract your attention to those things whereof the sad and revolting view may offend the gaze of a better conscience, I will now direct you to such things as the world in its ignorance accounts good. Among these also you will behold things that will shock you, in respect of what you regard as honors, of what you consider the facies, what you count affluence in riches, what you think power in the camp, the glory of the purple in the magisterial office, the power of license in the chief command, there is hidden the virus of ensnaring mischief and an appearance of smiling wickedness joyous indeed but the treacherous deception of hidden calamity just as some poison in which the flavor having been medicated with sweetness craftily mingled in its deadly juices seems when taken to be an ordinary draught but when it is drunk up the destruction that you have swallowed assails you you see forsooth that man distinguished by his brilliant dress, glittering as he thinks in his purple. Yet with what baseness has he purchased this glitter? What contempts of the proud has he had first to submit to? What haughty thresholds has he as an earthly courtier besieged? How many scornful footsteps of arrogant great men has he had to precede, thronged in the crowd of clients, that by and by a similar procession might attend and precede him with salutations, a train waiting not upon his person, but upon his power. For he has no claim to be regarded for his character, but for his facies. Of these, finally, you may see the degrading end, when the time-serving sycophant has departed, and the hanger-on deserting them has defiled and exposed side of the man who has retired into a private condition. It is then that the mischiefs done to the squandered family estate smite upon the conscience, then the losses that have exhausted the fortune are known, expenses by which the favor of the populace was bought, and the people's breath asked for with fickle and empty entreaties. Assuredly, it was a vain and foolish boastfulness to have desired to set forth in the gratification of a disappointing spectacle what the people would not receive, and what would ruin the magistrates. But those, moreover, whom you consider rich, who add force to force, and who, excluding the poor from their neighborhood, stretch out their fields far and wide into space without any limits, who possess immense heaps of silver and gold and mighty sums of money, either in built-up heaps or in buried stores, even in the midst of their riches, those are torn to pieces by the anxiety of vague thought, lest the robber should spoil, lest the murderer should attack, lest the envy of some wealthier neighbor should become hostile and harass them with malicious lawsuits. Such an one enjoys no security, either in his food or in his sleep. In the midst of the banquet he sighs, although he drinks from a jeweled goblet, and when his luxurious bed has enfolded his body languid with feasting in its yielding bosom he lies wakeful in the midst of the down nor does he perceive poor wretch that these things are merely gilded torments that he is held in bondage by his gold and that he is the slave of his luxury and wealth rather than their master and oh the odious blindness of perception and the deep darkness of senseless greed 
although he might disburden himself and get rid of the load he rather continues to brood over his vexing wealth he goes on obstinately clinging to his tormenting hordes from him there is no liberality to dependence no communication to the poor and yet such people call that their own money which they guard with jealous labor shut up at home as if it were another's and from which they derive no benefit either for their friends for their children or in fine for themselves their possession amounts to this only that they can keep others from possessing it and oh what a marvellous perversion of names they called those things goods which they absolutely put to none but bad uses or think you that even those are secure that those at least are safe with some stable permeance among the chaplets of honour and vast wealth whom in the glitter of royal palaces the safeguard of watchful arms surrounds on the contrary they have greater fear than others a man is constrained to dread no less than he is dreaded exaltation exacts its penalties equally from the more powerful although he may be hedged in with bands of satellites and may guard his person with the enclosure and protection of a numerous retinue even as he does not allow his inferiors to feel security it is inevitable that he himself should want the sense of security the power of those whom power makes terrible to others is first of all terrible to themselves it smiles to rage it cajoles to deceive it entices to slay it lifts up to cast down with a certain usury of mischief the greater the height of dignity and honours attained the greater is the interest of penalty required hence then the one peaceful and trustworthy tranquillity the one solid and firm constant security is this for a man to withdraw from these eddies of a distracting world and anchored on the ground of the harbour of salvation to lift his eyes from earth to heaven and having been admitted to the gift of god and being already very near to his god in mind he may boast that whatever in human affairs others esteem lofty and grand lies altogether beneath his consciousness he who is actually greater than the world can crave nothing can desire nothing from the world how stable how free from all the shocks is that safeguard how heavenly the protection in its perennial blessings to be loosed from the snares of this entangling world and to be purged from earthly drags and fitted for the light of eternal immortality he will see what crafty mischief of the foe that previously attacked us has been in progress against us we are constrained to have more love for what we shall be by being allowed to know and to condemn what we were neither for this purpose is it necessary to pay a price either in the way of bribery or of labor so that man's elevation or dignity or power should be begotten in him with elaborate effort but it is a gratuitous gift from god and it is accessible to all as the sun shines spontaneously as the day gives light as the fountain flows as the shower yields moisture so does the heavenly spirit infuse itself into us when the soul in its gaze into heaven has recognized its author it rises higher than the sun and far transcends all this earthly power and begins to be that which it believes itself to be you however whom the celestial warfare has enlisted in the spiritual camp only observe a discipline uncorrupted and chastened in the virtues of religion be constant as well in prayer as in reading now speak with god now let god speak with you let him instruct you in his precepts let him direct you whom he has made rich none shall make poor for in fact there can be no poverty to him whose breast has once been supplied with heavenly food ceilings enriched with gold and houses adorned with mosaics of costly marble will seem mean to you now when you know that it is you yourself who are rather to be perfected you who are rather to be adorned and that that dwelling in which god has dwelt as in a temple in which the holy spirit has begun to make his abode is of more importance than all others 
Let us embellish this house with the colors of innocence. Let us enlighten it with the light of justice. This will never fall into decay with the wear of age, nor shall it be defiled by the tarnishing of the colors of its walls, nor of its gold. Whatever is artificially beautified is perishing, and such things as contain not the reality of possession afford no abiding assurance to their possessors. But this remains in a beauty perpetually vivid, in perfect honor, in permanent splendor. It can neither decay nor be destroyed. It can only be fashioned into greater perfection when the body returns to it. These things, dearest Donatus, briefly for the present. For although what you profitably hear delights your patience, indulgent in its goodness, your well-balanced mind, and your assured faith, and nothing is so pleasant to your ears as what is pleasant to you and God, yet, as we are associated as neighbors and are likely to talk together frequently, we ought to have some moderation in our conversation, and since this is a holiday rest and a time of leisure, whatever remains of the day, now that the sun is sloping towards the evening, let us spend it in gladness, nor let even the hour of repast be without heavenly grace. Let the temperate meal resound with psalms, and as your memory is tenacious and your voice musical, undertake this office as is your wont. You will provide a better entertainment for your dearest friends, if, while we have something spiritual to listen to, the sweetness of religious music charm our ears. End of Epistle 1 of Cyprian Read by David Ronald Epistle 2 of Epistles of Cyprian by Cyprian Translated by Robert Wallace This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Epistle 2 From the Roman Clergy to the Carthaginian Clergy about the retirement of the blessed Cyprian. Argument. The Roman clergy had learnt from Crementius, the subdeacon, that, in the time of persecution, Cyprian had withdrawn himself. Therefore, with their accustomed zeal for the faith, they remind the Carthaginian clergy of their duty and instruct them what to do in the case of the lapsed during the interval of the bishop's absence. We have been informed by Crementius, the subdeacon, who came to us from you, that the blessed father Cyprian has for a certain reason withdrawn, in doing which he acted quite rightly, because he is a person of eminence, and because a conflict is impending, which God has allowed in the world for the sake of cooperating with his servants in their struggle against the adversary, and was, moreover, willing that this conflict should show to angels and to men that the victor shall be crowned, while the vanquished shall in himself receive the doom which has been made manifest to us. Since, moreover, it devolves upon us who appear to be placed on high in the place of a shepherd to keep watch over the flock, if we be found neglectful, it will be said to us, as it was said to our predecessors also, who in such wise negligent had been placed in charge, that we have not sought for that which was lost, and have not corrected the wanderer, and have not bound up that which was broken, but have eaten their milk, and have been clothed with their wool, and then also the Lord himself, fulfilling what had been written in the law and the prophets, teaches, saying, quote, I am the good shepherd, who lay down my life for the sheep. But the hireling, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth, and the wolf scattereth them. End quote. To Simon, too, he speaks thus, quote, Lovest thou me? He answered, I do love thee. He saith to him, Feed my sheep. End quote. We know that this saying arose out of the very circumstance of his withdrawal and the rest of the disciples did likewise. We are unwilling, therefore, beloved brethren, that you should be found hirelings, but we desire you to be good shepherds, since you are aware that no slight danger threatens you if you do not exhort our brethren to stand steadfast in the faith, so that the brotherhood be not absolutely rooted out, 
as being of those who rush headlong into idolatry. Neither is it in words only that we exhort you to this, but you will be able to ascertain from very many who come to you from us that, God blessing us, we both have done and still do all these things ourselves with all anxiety and worldly risk, having before our eyes rather the fear of God and eternal sufferings than the fear of men and a short-lived discomfort, not forsaking the brethren, but exhorting them to stand firm in the faith and to be ready to go with the Lord. And we have even recalled those who were ascending to do that to which they were constrained. The church stands in faith, notwithstanding that some have been driven to fall by very terror, whether that they were persons of eminence, or that they were afraid, when seized with the fear of man. These, however, we did not abandon, although they were separated from us, but exhorted them, and do exhort them, to repent. If in any way they may receive pardon from him who is able to grant it, lest happily, if they should be deserted by us, they should become worse. You see, then, brethren, that you also ought to do the like, so that even those who have fallen may amend their minds by your exhortation, and if they should be seized once more, may confess, and may so make amends for their previous sin. And there are other matters which are incumbent on you, which also we have here added, as that if any who may have fallen into this temptation begin to be taken with sickness, and repent of what they have done, and desire communion, it should in any wise be granted to them. Or if you have widows or bedridden people who are unable to maintain themselves, or those who are in prisons or are excluded from their own dwellings, these ought in all cases to have some to minister to them. Moreover, catechumens, when seized with sickness, ought not to be deceived, but help is to be afforded to them. And as matter of the greatest importance, if the bodies of the martyrs and others be not buried, a considerable risk is incurred by those whose duty it is to do this office. But whomsoever of you, then, and on whatever occasion this duty may have been performed, we are sure that he is regarded as a good servant, as one who has been faithful in the least, and will be appointed ruler over ten cities. May God, however, who gives all things to them that hope in him, grant to us that we may all be found in these works. The brethren who are in bonds greet you, as do the elders, and the whole church, which itself also with the deepest anxiety keeps watch over all who call on the name of the Lord. And we likewise beg you in your turn to have us in remembrance. Know, moreover, that Bassanius has come to us, and we request of you, who have a zeal for God, to send a copy of this letter to whomsoever you are able, as occasions may serve, or make your own opportunities, or send a message, that they may stand firm and steadfast in the faith. We bid you, beloved brethren, ever heartily farewell. End of Epistle 2 of Cyprian Read by David Ronald Epistle 3 of Epistles of Cyprian by Cyprian Translated by Robert Wallace This LibriVox recording is of the public domain. Epistle 3 To the Presbyters and Deacons Abiding at Rome Argument This is a familiar and friendly epistle, so that it requires no formal argument, especially as it can be sufficiently gathered from the title itself. The letter of the Roman clergy to which Cyprian is replying is missing. Cyprian, to the elders and deacons, brethren, abiding at Rome, sends greeting. When the report of the departure of the excellent man, my colleague, was still uncertain among us, my beloved brethren, and I was wavering doubtfully, in my opinion on the matter, I received a letter sent to me from you by Crementius, the subdeacon, in which I was most abundantly informed of his glorious end, and I rejoiced greatly that, in harmony with the integrity of his administration, an honorable consummation also attended him, wherein, moreover, 
I greatly congratulate you that you honor his memory with a testimony so public and so illustrious, so that by your means is made known to me not only what is glorious to you in connection with the memory of your bishop, but what ought to afford to me also an example of faith and virtue. For in proportion as the fall of a bishop is an event which tends ruinously to the fall of his followers, so on the other hand it is a useful and helpful thing when a bishop, by the firmness of his faith, sets himself forth to his brethren as an object of imitation. I have, moreover, read another epistle in which neither the person who wrote nor the persons to whom it was written were plainly declared, and inasmuch as in the same letter both the writing and the matter, and even the paper itself, gave me the idea that something had been taken away or had been changed from the original, I have sent you back the epistle as it actually came to hand, that you may examine whether it is the very same which you gave to Crementius, the subdeacon, to carry. For it is a very serious thing if the truth of a clerical letter is corrupted by any falsehood or deceit. In order, then, that we may know this, ascertain whether the writing and subscription are yours, and write me again what is the truth of the matter. I bid you, dearest brethren, ever heartily farewell. End of Epistle 3 by Cyprian Read by David Ronald Epistle 4 of Epistles of Cyprian by Cyprian Translated by Robert Wallace This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Epistle 4 to the Presbyters and Deacons Argument Cyprian exhorts his clergy from his place of retirement that in his absence they should be united, that nothing should be wanting to prisoners or to the rest of the poor, and further, that they should keep the people in quiet, lest, if they should rush in crowds to visit the martyrs in prison, this privilege should at length be forbidden them. Cyprian, to the presbyters and deacons, his beloved brethren, greeting. Being by the grace of God in safety, dearest brethren, I salute you, rejoicing that I am informed of the prosperity of all things in respect of your safety also, and as the condition of the place does not permit me to be with you now, I beg you, by your faith and your religion, to discharge there both your own office and mine, that there may be nothing wanting either to discipline or diligence, in respect of means, moreover, for meeting the expenses, whether for those who, having confessed their Lord with a glorious voice, having been put in prison, or for those who are laboring in poverty and want, and still stand fast in the Lord, I entreat that nothing be wanting, since the whole of the small sum which was collected there was distributed among the clergy for cases of that kind, that many might have means whence they could assist the necessities and burthens of individuals. I beg also that there may be no lack on your parts of wisdom and carefulness to preserve peace. For although from their affection the brethren are eager to approach and to visit those good confessors on whom by their glorious beginnings the divine consideration has already shed a brightness, yet I think that this eagerness must be cautiously indulged, and not in crowds, not in numbers collected together at once, lest from this very thing ill will be aroused, and the means of access be denied, and thus, while we insatiably wish for all, we lose all. Take counsel, therefore, and see that this may be more safely managed with moderation, so that the presbyters also, who there offer, with the confessors, may one by one take turns with the deacons individually, because, by thus changing the persons and varying the people that come together, suspicion is diminished. For, meek and humble in all things, as befits the servants of God, we ought to accommodate ourselves to the times, and to provide for quietness, and to have regard to the people. I bid you, brethren, beloved and dearly longed for, always heartily farewell, and have me in remembrance. Greet all the brotherhood, Victor the deacon, and those who are with me, 
greet you. Farewell. End of Epistle 4 by Cyprian. Read by David Ronald. Epistle 5 of Epistles of Cyprian by Cyprian. Translated by Robert Wallace. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Epistle 5 to the Presbyters and Deacons. Argument. The argument of this letter is nearly the same as that of the preceding one, except that the writer directs the confessors also to be admonished by the clergy of their duty to give attention to humility and obey the presbyters and deacons. His own retirement incidentally furnishes an occasion for this. Cyprian, to the presbyters and deacons, his brethren, greeting. I had wished indeed, beloved brethren, with this my letter to greet the whole of my clergy in health and safety. But since the stormy time, which has in a great measure overwhelmed my people, has, moreover, added this enhancement to my sorrows, that it has touched with its desolation even a portion of the clergy, I pray the Lord that, by the divine mercy, I may hereafter greet you at all events as safe, who, as I have learned, stand fast both in faith and virtue. And although some reasons might appear to urge me to the duty of myself hastening to come to you firstly, for instance, because of my eagerness and desire for you, which is the chief consideration in my prayers, and then, that we might be able to consult together on those matters which are required by the general advantage in respect of the government of the church, and having carefully examined them with abundant counsel, might wisely arrange them, yet it seemed to me better, still, to preserve my retreat and my quiet for a while, with a view to other advantages connected with the peace and safety of us all, of which advantages an account will be given you by our beloved brother Tertullius, who, besides his other care which he zealously bestows on divine labors, was, moreover, the author of this counsel, that I should be cautious and moderate, and not rashly trust myself into the sight of the public, and especially that I should beware of that place where I had been so often inquired for and sought after, relying, therefore, upon your love and your piety, which I have abundantly known in this letter, I both exhort and command you that those of you whose presence there is least suspicious and least perilous should in my stead discharge my duty in respect of doing those things which are required for the religious administration. In the meantime, let the poor be taken care of as much and as well as possible, but especially those who have stood with unshaken faith and have not forsaken Christ's flock, that, by your diligence, means be supplied to them to enable them to bear their poverty, so that what the troublous time has not effected in respect of their faith may not be accomplished by want in respect of their afflictions. Let a more earnest care, moreover, be bestowed upon the glorious confessors. And although I know that very many of those have been maintained by the vow and by the love of the brethren, yet if there be any who are in want either of clothing or maintenance, let them be supplied with whatever things are necessary, as I formerly wrote to you while they were still kept in prison. Only let them know from you and be instructed and learn what, according to the authority of Scripture, the discipline of the church requires of them, that they ought to be humble and modest and peaceable, that they should maintain the honor of their name, so that those who have achieved glory by what they have testified may achieve glory also by their characters, and in all things, seeking the Lord's approval, may show themselves worthy in consummation of their praise to attain a heavenly crown. For there remains more than what is yet seen to be accomplished, since it is written, quote, Praise not any man before his death. End quote. And again, quote, 
Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. End quote. And the Lord also says, quote, He that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. End quote. Let them imitate the Lord, who at the very time of his passion was not more proud, but more humble. For then he washed his disciples' feet, saying, quote, If I, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, Ye ought also to wash one another's feet, for I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. End quote. Let them also follow the example of the Apostle Paul, who, after imprisonment, often repeated, after scourging, after exposures to wild beasts, and everything continued meek and humble, and even after his rapture to the third heaven in paradise, he did not proudly arrogate anything to himself when he said, quote, Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day that we might not be chargeable to any of you. End quote. These several matters, I pray you, suggest to our brethren, and as he who humbleth himself shall be exalted, now is the time when they should rather fear the ensnaring adversary who more eagerly attacks the man that is strongest and becoming more virulent for the very reason that he is conquered strives to overcome his conqueror. The Lord grant that I may soon both see them again and by salutary exhortation may establish their minds to preserve their glory. For I am grieved when I hear that some of them run about wickedly and proudly and give themselves up to follies or to discords, that members of Christ, and even members that have confessed Christ, are defiled by unlawful concubinage, and cannot be ruled either by deacons or by presbyters, but cause that, by the wicked and evil characters of a few, the honorable glories of many and good confessors are tarnished, whom they ought to fear, lest, being condemned by their testimony and judgment, they be excluded from their fellowship. That, finally, is the illustrious and true confessor concerning whom afterwards the church does not blush, but boasts. In respect of that which our fellow presbyters, Donatus and Fortunatus, Novatus and Gorgias, wrote to me, I have not been able to reply by myself, since, from the first commencement of my episcopacy, I made up my mind to do nothing on my own private opinion without your advice and without the consent of the people. But as soon as, by the grace of God, I shall have come to you, then we will discuss in common, as our respective dignity requires, those things which either have been or are to be done. I bid you, brethren, beloved, and dearly longed for, ever heartily farewell, and be mindful of me. Greet the brotherhood that is with you, earnestly from me, and tell them to remember me. Farewell. End of Epistle 5 by Cyprian Read by David Ronald Epistle 6 of Epistles of Cyprian by Cyprian Translated by Robert Wallace This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Epistle 6 to Rogatianus the presbyter, and the other confessors. Argument. He exhorts Rogatianus and the other confessors to maintain discipline, that none who had confessed Christ in word should seem to deny him in deed, casually rebuking some of them, who, being exiled on account of the faith, were not afraid to return unbidden into their country. Cyprian, to the presbyter Rogatianus, and to the other confessors, his brethren, greeting. I had both, heretofore, dearly beloved and bravest brethren, sent you a letter in which I congratulated your faith and virtue with exulting words, and now my voice has no other object, first of all, than with joyous mind, repeatedly and always, to announce the glory of your name. For what can I wish, greater or better in my prayers, than to seek the flock of Christ enlightened by the honor of your confession? For although all the brethren ought to rejoice in this, yet, 
in the common gladness the share of the bishop is the greatest for the glory of the church is the glory of the bishop in proportion as we grieve over those whom a hostile persecution has cast down in the same proportion we rejoice over you whom the devil has not been able to overcome yet i exhort you by our common faith by the true and simple love of my heart towards you that having overcome the adversary in this first encounter you should hold fast your glory with a brave and persevering virtue we are still in the world we are still placed in the battlefield we fight daily for our lives care must be taken that after such beginnings as these there should also come an increase and that what you have begun to be with such a blessed commencement should be consummated in you it is a slight thing to have been able to attain anything it is more to be able to keep what you have attained even as faith itself and saving birth makes alive not by being received but by being preserved nor is it actually the attainment but the perfecting that keeps a man for god the Lord taught this in his instruction when he said, quote, Behold, thou art made whole, sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. End quote. Conceive of him as saying this also to his confessor, quote, Lo, thou art made a confessor, sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. End quote. Solomon also, and Saul, and many others so long as they walked in the lord's ways were able to keep the grace given to them when the discipline of the lord was forsaken by them grace also forsook them we must persevere in the straight and narrow road of praise and glory and since peacefulness and humility and the tranquillity of a good life is fitting for all christians according to the word of the lord who looks to none other man then to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit and that trembleth at his word it the more behooves you confessors who have been made an example to the rest of the brethren to observe and fulfil this as being those whose characters should provoke to imitation the life and conduct of all for as the jews were alienated from god as those on whose account the name of god is blasphemed among the gentiles so on the other hand those are dear to god through whose conformity to discipline the name of god is declared with a testimony of praise as it is written the lord himself were warning and saying quote, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father which is in heaven End quote. and paul the apostle says quote, shine as lights in the world end quote. and similarly peter exhorts quote, as strangers says he abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul having your conversation honest among the gentiles that whereas they speak against you as evil doers they may by your good works which they shall behold glorify the lord end quote. this indeed the greatest part of you I rejoice to say are careful for and made better by the honor of your confession itself guard and preserve its glory by tranquil and virtuous lives but i hear that some infect your number and destroy the praise of a distinguished name by their corrupt conversation whom you yourselves even as being lovers and guardians of your own praise should rebuke and check and correct for what a disgrace is suffered by your name when one spends his days in intoxication and debauchery another returns to that country whence he was banished to perish when arrested not now as being a christian but as being a criminal i hear that some are puffed up and are arrogant although it is written quote, be not high-minded but fear for if god spared not the natural branches take heed lest he also spare not thee End quote. our lord was led as a sheep to the slaughter and as a lamb before her shearers is dumb so he opened not his mouth i am not rebellious says he neither do i gainsay 
I gave my back to the smiters, and my cheeks to the palms of their hands. I hid not my face from the filthiness of spitting. And dares any one now, who lives by and in this very one, lift up himself and be haughty, forgetful as well of the deeds which he did, as well of the commands which he left to us either by himself or by his apostles? But if the servant is not greater than his lord, let those who follow the Lord humbly and peacefully and silently tread in his steps, since the lower one is, the more exalted he may become. As says the Lord, quote, He that is least among you, the same shall be great. End quote. What then is that? How execrable should it appear to you, which I have learnt with extreme anguish and grief of mind, to wit, that there are not wanting those who defile the temples of God, and the members sanctified after confession and made glorious, with a disgraceful and infamous concubinage, associating their beds promiscuously with women's, in which, even if there be no pollution of their conscience, there is a great guilt in this very thing, that by their offense originate examples for the ruin of others. There ought also to be no contentions and emulations among you, since the Lord left to us his peace, and it is written, quote, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. End quote. But if ye bite and find fault with one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. From abuse and revilings also I entreat you to abstain, for quote, revilers do not attain the kingdom of God. End quote. And the tongue which has confessed Christ should be preserved sound and pure with its honor. For he who, according to Christ's precept, speaks things peaceable and good and just, daily confesses Christ. We had renounced the world when we were baptized, but we have now indeed renounced the world when tried and approved by God. We leave all that we have and have followed the Lord and stand and live in his faith and fear. Let us confirm one another by mutual exhortations, and let us more and more go forward in the Lord, so that, when of his mercy he shall have made that peace which he promises to give, we may return to the church new and almost changed men, and may be received, whether by our brethren or by the heathen, in all things corrected and renewed for the better, and those who formerly admired our glory and our courage may now admire the discipline in our lives. And although I have most fully written to our clergy, both lately when you were still kept in prison, and now also again to supply whatever was needful, either for your clothing or for your food, yet I myself have also sent you from the small means of my own which I had with me, 250 pieces, and another 250 I had also sent before. Victor also, who from a reader has become a deacon, and is with me, sent you 175. But I rejoice when I know that very many of our brethren of their love are striving with each other, and are aiding your necessities with their contributions. I bid you, beloved brethren, ever heartily farewell. And be mindful of me. End of Epistle 6 of Cyprian Read by David Ronald Epistle 7 of Epistles of Cyprian by Cyprian Translated by Robert Wallace This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Epistle 7 To the Clergy Concerning Prayer to God Argument the argument of the present epistle is nearly the same as that of the two preceding, except that he exhorts in this to diligent prayer. Cyprian, to the presbyters and deacons, his brethren, greeting. Although I know, brethren, beloved, that from the fear which we all of us owe to God, you also are instantly urgent in continual petitions and earnest prayers to him, Still I myself remind your religious anxiety that in order to appease and entreat the Lord, we must lament 
not only in words, but also with fastings, and with tears, and with every kind of urgency. For we must perceive and confess that the so disordered ruin arising from that affliction which has in a great measure laid waste, and is even still laying waste, our flock, has visited us according to our sins, in that we do not keep the way of the Lord, nor observe the heavenly commandments given to us for our salvation. Our Lord did the will of his Father, and we do not do the will of our Lord, eager about our patrimony and our gain, seeking to satisfy our pride, yielding ourselves wholly to emulation and to strife, careless of simplicity and faith, renouncing the world in words only and not in deeds, every one of us pleasing himself and displeasing all others. Therefore, we are smitten as we deserve, since it is written, quote, And that servant which knoweth his master's will, and has not obeyed his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. End quote. But what stripes, what blows, do we not deserve, when even confessors who ought to be an example of virtuous life to others do not maintain discipline? Therefore, while an inflated, an immodest boastfulness about their own confession excessively elates some, tortures come upon them, and tortures without any cessation of the tormentor, without any end of condemnation, without any comfort of death, tortures which do not easily let them pass to the crown, but wrench them on the rack until they cause them to abandon their faith unless some one taken away by the divine compassion should depart in the very midst of the torment, gaining glory, not by the cessation of his torture, but by the quickness of his death. These things we suffer by our own fault and our own deserving, even as the divine judgment has forewarned us, saying, quote, If they forsake my law and walk not in my judgments, if they profane my statutes and keep not my commandments, then will I visit their transgressions with the rod and their iniquities with stripes. End quote. It is for this reason that we feel the rods and the stripes, because we neither please God with good deeds nor atone for our sins. Let us with our inmost heart and of our entire mind ask for God's mercy, because he himself also adds saying, quote, Nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not scatter away from them. End quote. Let us ask, and we shall receive. And if there be delay and tardiness in our receiving, since we have grievously offended, let us knock, because quote, to him that knocketh also it shall be opened. End quote. If only our prayers, our groanings, and our tears knock at the door, and with these we must be urgent and persevering, even although prayer be offered with one mind. For, which the more induced and constrained me to write this letter to you, you ought to know, since the Lord has condescended to show and reveal it, that it was said in a vision, quote, Ask, and ye shall obtain. End quote. Then, afterwards, that the attending people were bidden to pray for certain persons pointed out to them, but that, in their petitions, there were dissonant voices and wills disagreeing, and that this excessively displeased him who had said, quote, Ask, and ye shall obtain, end quote, because the disagreement of the people was out of harmony, and there was not a consent of the brethren, one and simple, in a united concord, since it is written, quote, God who maketh men to be of one mind in a house, end quote. And we read in the Acts of the Apostles, quote, And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul, end quote. And the Lord has bidden us with his own voice, saying, quote, This is my command, that ye love one another. And again, 
I say unto you, that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that you should ask, it shall be done for you of my Father which is in heaven. End quote. But if two of one mind can do so much, what might be effected if the unanimity prevailed among all? But if, according to the peace which our Lord gave us, there were agreement among all brethren, we should before this have obtained from the divine mercy what we seek, nor should we be wavering so long in this peril of our salvation and our faith. Yes, truly, and these evils would not have come upon the brethren if the brotherhood had been animated with one spirit. For there also was shown that there sate the father of a family, a young man also being seated at his right hand, who, anxious and somewhat sad, with a kind of indignation, holding his chain in his right hand, occupied his place with a sorrowful look. But another, standing on the left hand, bore a net, which he threatened to throw, in order to catch the people standing round. And when he, who saw, marveled what this could be, it was told him that the youth, who was thus sitting on the right hand, was saddened and grieved, because his commandments were not observed, but that he on the left was exultant, because an opportunity was afforded him of receiving from the father of the family the power of destroying. This was shown long before the tempest of this devastation arose, and we have seen that which had been shown fulfilled, that while we despise the commandments of the Lord, while we do not keep the salutary ordinances of the law that he has given, the enemy was receiving a power of doing mischief, and was overwhelming by the cast of his net those who were imperfectly armed and too careless to resist. Let us urgently pray and groan with continual petitions, for know, beloved brethren, that I was not long ago reproached with this also in a vision, that we were sleepy in our prayers, and did not pray with watchfulness, and undoubtedly God who rebukes whom he loves, when he rebukes, rebukes, that he may amend, amends, that he may preserve. Let us, therefore, strike off and break away from the bonds of sleep, and pray with urgency and watchfulness, as the Apostle Paul bids us, saying, quote, Continue in prayer, and watch in the same. End quote. For the Apostles also cease not to pray day and night, and the Lord also himself, the teacher of our discipline, and the way of our example, frequently and watchfully prayed, as we read in the Gospel, quote, he went out into a mountain to pray, and continued all night in prayer to God. End quote. And assuredly, what he prayed for, he prayed for on our behalf, since he was not a sinner, but bore the sins of others. But he so prayed for us, that in another place we read, quote, And the Lord said to Peter, Behold, Satan has desired to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not, end quote. But if for us and for our sins he both labored and watched and prayed, how much more ought we to be instant in prayers, and, first of all, to pray and entreat the Lord himself, and then, through him, to make satisfaction to God the Father. We have an advocate and an intercessor for our sins, Jesus Christ the Lord and our God, if only we repent of our sins past, and confess and acknowledge our sins, whereby we now offend the Lord, and for the time to come engage to walk in his ways, and to fear his commandments, the Father corrects and protects us, if we still stand fast in the faith both in afflictions and perplexities, that is to say, cling closely to his Christ, as it is written, quote, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? End quote. None of these things can separate believers. Nothing can tear away those who are clinging to his body and blood. 
persecution of that kind is an examination and searching out of the heart god wills us to be sifted and proved as he has always proved his people and yet in his trials help has never at any time been wanting to believers finally to the very least of his servants although placed among very many sins and unworthy of his condensation yet he has condescended of his goodness towards us to command quote, tell him said he to be safe because peace is coming but that in the meantime there is a little delay that some who still remain may be proved End quote. but we are admonished by these divine condensations both concerning a spare diet and a temperate use of drink to wit lest worldly enticement should enervate the breast now elevated with celestial vigour or lest the mind weighed down by too abundant feasting should be less watchful unto prayers and supplication it was my duty not to conceal these special matters nor to hide them alone in my own consciousness matters by which each one of us may be both instructed and guided and do not you for your part keep this letter concealed among yourselves but let the brethren have it to read for it is the part of one who desires that his brother should not be warned and instructed to intercept these words with which the lord condescends to admonish and instruct us let them know that we are proved by our lord and let them never fail of that faith whereby we have once believed in him under the conflict of this present affliction let each one acknowledging his own sins even now put off the conversation of the old man quote, for no man who looks back as he putteth his hand on the plough is fit for the kingdom of god End quote. and finally lot's wife who when she was delivered looked back in defiance of the commandment lost the benefit of her escape let us look not to things which are behind whither the devil calls us back but to things which are before whither christ calls us let us lift up our eyes to heaven lest the earth with its delights and enticements deceive us let each one of us pray god not for himself only but for all the brethren even as the lord has taught us to pray when he bids to each one not private prayer but enjoin them when they prayed to pray for all in common prayer and concordant supplication if the lord shall behold us humble and peaceable if he shall see us joined one with another if he shall see us fearful concerning his anger if corrected and amended by the present tribulation he will maintain us safe from the disturbances of the enemy discipline hath proceeded pardon also shall follow let us only without ceasing to ask and with full faith that we shall receive in simplicity and unanimity beseech the lord entreating not only with groaning but with tears as it behooves those to entreat who are situated between the ruins of those who wail and the remnants of those who fear between the manifold slaughter of the yielding and the little firmness of those who still stand let us ask that peace may be soon restored that we may be quickly helped in our concealments and our dangers that those things may be fulfilled which the lord deigns to show to his servants the restoration of the church the security of our salvation after the rains serenity after the darkness light after the storms and whirlwinds a peaceful calm the affectionate aids of paternal love the accustomed grandeurs of the divine majesty whereby both the blasphemy of persecutors may be restrained the repentance of the lapsed renewed and the steadfast faith of the persevering may glory i bid you beloved brethren ever heartily farewell and have me in remembrance salute the brotherhood in my name and remind them to remember me farewell end of epistle seven by cyprian read by david ronald epistle eight of epistles of cyprian by cyprian 
Translated by Robert Wallace. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Epistle 8 to the Martyrs and Confessors. Argument. Cyprian, commending the African martyrs and marvelously for their constancy, urges them to perseverance by the example of their colleague, Mapalicus. Cyprian, to the martyrs and confessors in Christ, our Lord, and in God, the Father, everlasting salvation. I gladly rejoice and am thankful, most brave and blessed brethren, at hearing of your faith and virtue, wherein the church, our mother, glories. Lately, indeed, she gloried, when, in consequence of an enduring confession, that punishment was undergone which drove the confessors of Christ into exile. Yet the present confession is so much the more illustrious and greater in honor as it is braver in suffering. The combat has increased, and the glory of the combatants has increased also. Nor were you kept back from the struggle by fear of tortures, but by the very tortures themselves you were more and more stimulated to the conflict. Bravely and firmly you have returned with ready devotion to contend in the extremest contest. Of you I find that some are already crowned, while some are even now within reach of the crown of victory, but all whom the danger has shut up in a glorious company are animated to carry on the struggle with an equal and common warmth of virtue as it behooves the soldiers of Christ in the divine camp that no allurements may deceive the incorruptible steadfastness of your faith. No threats terrify you, no sufferings or tortures overcome you, because, quote, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world, end quote. Nor is the earthly punishment able to do more towards casting down than is the divine protection towards lifting up. This truth is proved by the glorious struggle of the brethren, who, having become leaders to the rest in overcoming their tortures, afforded an example of virtue and faith, contending in the strife, until the strife yielded, being overcome. With what praises can I commend you, most courageous brethren? With what vocal proclamation can I extol the strength of your heart and the perseverance of your faith? You have borne the sharpest examination by torture, even unto the glorious consummation, and have not yielded to sufferings, but rather the sufferings have given way to you. The end of torments, which the tortures themselves did not give, the crown was given. The examination by torture, waxing severer, continued for a long time to this result, not to overthrow the steadfast faith, but to send the men of God more quickly to the Lord. The multitude of those who were present saw with admiration the heavenly contest, the contest of God, the spiritual contest, the battle of Christ, saw that his servants stood with free voice, with unyielding mind, with divine virtue, bare, indeed, of weapons of this world, but believing and armed with the weapons of faith. The tortured stood more brave than the torturers, and the limbs, beaten and torn as they were, overcame the hooks that bent and tore them. The scourge, often repeated with all its rage, could not conquer invincible faith, even although the membrane which enclosed the entrails were broken, and it was no longer the limbs but the wounds of the servants of God that were tortured. Blood was flowing, which might quench the blaze of persecution, which might subdue the flames of Gehenna with its glorious gore. Oh, what a spectacle was that to the Lord! How sublime! How great! How acceptable to the eyes of God in the allegiance and devotion of his soldiers! As it is written in the Psalms, when the Holy Spirit at once speaks to us and warns us, quote, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. End quote. Precious is the death which has brought immortality at the cost of its blood, which has received the crown from the consummation of its virtues. How did Christ rejoice therein? How willingly did he both fight and conquer in such servants of his as the protector of their faith, in giving to believers as much as he who taketh believes that he receives? He was present at his own contest. 
he lifted up, strengthened, animated the champions and asserters of his name, and he who once conquered death on our behalf always conquers it in us. Quote, when they, says he, deliver you up, take no thought what ye shall speak, for it shall be given you in that hour what ye shall speak. For it is not ye that speak, but the spirit of your father which speaketh in you. End quote. The present struggle has afforded a proof of this saying. A voice filled with the Holy Spirit broke forth from the martyr's mouth when the most blessed Mapalicus said to the proconsul in the midst of his torments, quote, You shall see a contest tomorrow. End quote. And that which he said with the testimony of virtue and faith the Lord fulfilled. A heavenly contest was exhibited, and the servant of God was crowned in the struggle of the promised fight. This is the contest which the prophet Isaiah of old predicted, saying, quote, It shall be no light contest for you with men, since God appoints the struggle. End quote. And in order to show what this struggle would be, he added the words, quote, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and ye shall call his name Emmanuel. End quote. This is the struggle of our faith in which we engage, in which we conquer, in which we are crowned. This is the struggle which the blessed Apostle Paul has shown to us, in which it behooves us to run and to attain the crown of glory. Quote, Do ye not know, says he, that they which run in a race run all indeed, but one receiveth the prize? So run that ye may obtain. End quote. Quote, Now they do it that they may receive a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. End quote. Moreover, setting forth his own struggle, and declaring that he himself should soon be a sacrifice for the Lord's sake, he says, quote, I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my assumption is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. End quote. This fight, therefore, predicted of old by the prophets, begun by the Lord, waged by the apostles, Mapalicus promised again to the proconsul in his own name and that of his colleagues. Nor did the faithful voice deceive in his promise. He exhibited the fight to which he had pledged himself, and he received the reward which he deserved. I not only beseech, but exhort the rest of you, that you all should follow that martyr now most blessed, and the other partners of that engagement, soldiers and comrades, steadfast in faith, patient in suffering, victors in tortures, that those who are united at once by the bond of confession and the entertainment of a dungeon may also be united in the consummation of their virtue and a celestial crown, that you, by your joy, may dry the tears of our mother, the church, who mourns over the wreck and death of very many, and that you may confirm, by the provocation of your example, the steadfastness of others who stand also. If the battle shall cry you out, if the day of your contest shall come, engage bravely, fight with constancy, as knowing that you are fighting under the eyes of a present Lord, that you are attaining by the confession of his name to his own glory, who is not such a one as that he only looks on his servants, but he himself also wrestles in us, himself is engaged, himself also in the struggles of our conflict, not only crowns, but is crowned. For if before the day of your contest of the mercy of God peace shall supervene, let there still remain to you the sound will and the glorious conscience. Nor let any one of you be saddened as if he were inferior to those who before you have suffered tortures, have overcome the world and trodden it under foot, and so have come to the Lord by a glorious road. For the Lord is the, quote, searcher out of the reins and the hearts, end quote. He looks through secret things, and beholds that which is concealed. In order to merit the crown from him, his own testimony alone is sufficient, who will judge us. Therefore, beloved brethren, either case is equally lofty and illustrious, the former more secure, to wit, to hasten to the Lord with the consummation of our victory, the latter more joyous, a leave of absence after glory, 
being received to flourish in the praises of the church. O blessed church of ours, which the honor of the divine condensation illuminates, which in our own times the glorious blood of martyrs renders illustrious, she was white before in the works of the brethren, now she has become purple in the blood of the martyrs. Among her flowers are wanting neither roses nor lilies. Now let each one strive for the largest dignity of either honor. Let them receive crowns, either white as of labors, or of purple as of suffering. In the heavenly camp both peace and strife have their own flowers, with which the soldier of Christ may be crowned for glory. I bid you, most brave and beloved brethren, always heartily farewell in the Lord, and have me in remembrance. Fare ye well. End of Epistle 8 by Cyprian Read by David Ronald Epistle 9 of Epistles of Cyprian by Cyprian This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Epistle 9 to the clergy concerning certain presbyters who had rashly granted peace to the lapse before the persecution had been appeased and without the privity of the bishops argument the argument of this epistle is contained in the following words of the fourteenth epistle Quote, to the presbyters and deacons he says was not wanting the vigor of the priesthood so that some too little mindful of discipline and hasty with a rash precipitation who had already begun to communicate with the lapsed, were checked. End quote. Cyprian, to the presbyters and deacons, his brethren, greeting. I have long been patient, beloved brethren, hoping that my forbearing silence would avail to quietness. But since the unreasonable and reckless presumption of some in seeking by its boldness to disturb both the honor of the martyrs and the modesty of the confessors and the tranquility of the whole people, it behooves me no longer to keep silence, lest too much reticence should issue in danger both to the people and to ourselves. For what danger ought we not to fear from the Lord's displeasure, when some of the presbyters, remembering neither the gospel nor their own place, and, moreover, considering neither the Lord's future judgment nor the bishop now placed over them, claim to themselves entire authority a thing which was never in any wise done under our predecessors, with discredit and contempt of the bishop. And I wish, if it could be so without the sacrifice of our brethren's safety, that they could make good their claim to all things. I could dissemble and bear the discredit of my episcopal authority, as I always have dissembled and borne it. But it is not now the occasion for dissimulating, when our brotherhood is deceived by some of you, who, while without the means of restoring salvation they desire to please, become a still greater stumbling block to the lapsed. For that it is a very great crime which persecution has compelled to be committed, they themselves know who have committed it, since our Lord and Judge has said, quote, Whosoever shall confess me before men, him will I also confess before my Father, which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me, him will I also deny. End quote. And again, he has said, quote, All sin shall be forgiven unto the sons of men, and blasphemies. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost shall not have forgiveness, but is guilty of eternal sin. End quote. Also, the blessed apostle has said, quote, Ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord, and the cup of devils. Ye cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. End quote. He who withholds these words from our brethren deceives them, wretched that they are, so that they who truly repenting might satisfy God, both as the Father and as merciful with their prayers and works, are seduced more deeply to perish, and they who might raise themselves up fall the more deeply. For although in smaller sins sinners may do penance for a set time and according to the rules of discipline come to public confession and by imposition of the hand of the bishop and clergy receive the rite of communion, now with their time still unfulfilled while persecution is still raging, while the peace of the church itself is not yet restored, they are admitted to communion and their name is presented. And while the penance is not yet performed, confession is not yet made, 
the hands of the bishop and clergy are not yet laid upon them the eucharist is given to them although it is written quote, whosoever shall eat the bread and drink the cup of the lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the lord End quote. but now they are not guilty who so little observe the law of scripture but they will be guilty who are in office and do not suggest these things to brethren so that being instructed by those placed above them they may do all things with the fear of god and with the observance given and prescribed by him then moreover they lay the blessed martyrs open to ill will and involve the glorious servants of god with the priest of god so that although they mindful of my place have directed letters to me and have asked that their wishes should then be examined and peace granted them when our mother the church herself should first have received peace from the lord's mercy and the divine protection have brought me back to his church yet these disregarding the honor which the blessed martyrs with the confessors maintain for me despising the lord's law and that observance which the same martyrs and confessors bid to be maintained before the fear of persecution is quenched before my return almost even before the departure of the martyrs communicate with the lapsed and offer and give them the eucharist when even if the martyrs in the heat of their glory were to consider less carefully the scriptures and to desire anything more they should be admonished by the presbyters and deacons suggestions as was always done in time past for this reason the divine rebuke does not cease to chastise us night nor day for besides the visions of the night by day also the innocent age of boys is among us filled with the holy spirit seeing in an ecstasy with their eyes and hearing and speaking those things whereby the lord condescends to warn and instruct us and you should hear all things when the lord who bade me withdraw shall bring me back again to you in the meanwhile let those certain ones among you who are rash and incautious and boastful and who do not regard man at least fear god knowing that if they shall persevere still in the same course i shall use that power of admonition which the lord bids me use so that they may meanwhile be withheld from offering and have to plead their cause both before me and before the confessors themselves and before the whole people when with god's permission we begin to be gathered together once more into the bosom of the church our mother concerning this matter i have written to the martyrs and confessors and to the people letters both of which i have bidden to be read to you i wish you dearly beloved brethren and earnestly longed for ever heartily farewell in the lord and have me in remembrance fare ye well end of epistle nine by cyprian read by david ronald Epistle 10 of Epistles of Cyprian by Cyprian. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Epistle 10 to the martyrs and confessors who sought that peace should be granted to the lapsed. Argument. The occasion of this letter is given below in Epistle 14 as follows. Quote, when I found that those who had polluted their hands and mouths with sacrilegious contact or had no less infected their conscience with wicked certificates, were everywhere soliciting the martyrs, and were also corrupting the confessors with importunate and excessive entreaty, so that, without any distinction or examination of the individuals, thousands of certificates were given against the gospel law. I wrote letters in which I recalled, by my advice, as much as possible, the martyrs and confessors to the Lord's commands. End quote. Cyprian, to the martyrs and confessors, his beloved brethren, greeting. The anxiety of my situation and the fear of the Lord constrain me, my brave and beloved brethren, to admonish you in my letters that those who so devotedly and bravely maintain the faith of the Lord should also maintain the law and discipline of the Lord. For while it behooves all Christ's soldiers to keep the precepts of their commander, to you it is more especially fitting that you should obey his precepts, inasmuch as you have been made an example to others, both of valor and of the fear of God. 
and I had indeed believed that the presbyters and deacons who are there present with you would admonish and instruct you more fully concerning the law of the gospel, as was the case always in time past under my predecessors, so that the deacons, passing in and out of the prison, controlled the wishes of the martyrs by their counsels and by the scripture precepts. But now, with great sorrow of mind, I gather that not only the divine precepts are not suggested to you by them, but that they are even rather restrained, so that those things which are done by you yourselves, both in respect of God with caution, and in respect of God's priests with honor, are relaxed by certain presbyters, who consider neither the fear of God nor the honor of the bishop. Although you sent letters to me in which you ask that your wishes should be examined, and that peace should be granted to certain of the lapsed as soon as, with the end of the persecution, we should have begun to meet with our clergy, and to be gathered together once more. Those presbyters, contrary to the gospel law, contrary also to your respectful petition, before penance was performed, before confession even of the gravest and most heinous sin was made, before hands were placed upon the repentance by the bishops and clergy, dare to offer on their behalf and to give them the Eucharist, that is, to profane the sacred body of the Lord, although it is written, quote, Whosoever shall eat the bread and drink the cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord, end quote. And to the lapsed, indeed, pardon may be granted in respect of this thing, for what dead person would not hasten to be made alive? Who would not be eager to attain to his own salvation? But it is the duty of those placed over them to keep the ordinance and to instruct those that are either hurrying or ignorant, that those who ought to be shepherds of the sheep may not become their butchers. For to concede those things which tend to destruction is to deceive, nor is the lapsed raised in this manner, but, by offending God, he is more urged on to ruin. Let them learn, therefore, even from you, what they ought to have taught. Let them reserve your petitions and wishes for the bishops, and let them wait for ripe and peaceable times to give peace at your requests. The first thing is that the mother should first receive peace from the Lord, and then, in accordance with your wishes, that the peace of her children should be considered. And since I hear, most brave and beloved brethren, that you are pressed by the shamelessness of some, and that your modesty suffers violence, I beg you, with what entreaties I may, that, as mindful of the gospel, and considering what and what sort of things in past time your predecessors, the martyrs conceded, how careful they were in all respects, you also should anxiously and cautiously weigh the wishes of those who petition you, since, as friends of the Lord, and hereafter to exercise judgment with him, you must inspect both the conduct and the doings and the deserts of each one. You must consider also the kinds and qualities of their sins, lest, in the event of anything being abruptly and unworthily either promised by you or done by me, our church should begin to blush, even before the very Gentiles. For we are visited and chastened frequently, and we are admonished that the commandment of the Lord may be kept without corruption or violation, which I find does not cease to be the case there among you, so as to prevent the divine judgment from instructing very many of you also in the discipline of the church. Now this can all be done if you will regulate those things that are asked of you with a careful consideration of religion, perceiving and restraining those who, by accepting persons, either make favors in distributing your benefits or seek to make a profit of an unlawful trade. Concerning this, I have written both to the clergy and to the people, both of which letters I have directed to be read to you. But you ought also to bring back and amend that matter according to your diligence in such a way as to designate those by name to whom you desire that peace should be granted. 
For I hear that certificates are so given to some as that it is said, quote, Let such a one be received to communion along with his friends, end quote, which was never in any case done by the martyrs, so that a vague and blind petition should by and by heap reproach upon us. For it opens a wide door to say, Such a one with his friends, and twenty or thirty more may be presented to us, who may be asserted to be neighbors and connections and freedmen and servants of the man who receives the certificate. And for this reason, I beg you that you will designate by name in the certificate those whom you yourself see, whom you have known, whose penitence you see to be very near to full satisfaction, and so direct to us letters in conformity with faith and discipline. I bid you, very brave and beloved brethren, ever heartily, in the Lord, farewell, and have me in remembrance. Fare ye well. End of Epistle 10 by Cyprian Read by David Ronald Epistle 11 of Epistles of Cyprian by Cyprian This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Epistle 11 To the People Argument the substance of this letter is also suggested in Epistle 14. Among the people also, he says, I have done what I could to quiet their minds and have instructed them to be retained in ecclesiastical discipline. Cyprian, to his brethren, among the people who stand fast, greeting, that you bewail and grieve over the downfall of our brethren, I know from myself, beloved brethren, who also bewail with you and grieve for each one and suffer and feel what the blessed apostle said quote, who is weak said he and i am not weak who is offended and i burn not End quote. and again he has laid it down in his epistle saying quote, whether one member suffer all the members suffer with it or one member rejoice all the members rejoice with it End quote. I sympathize with you in your suffering and grief. Therefore, for our brethren, who, having lapsed and fallen prostrate under the severity of the persecution, have inflicted a like pain on us by their wounds, inasmuch as they tear away part of our bowels with them, to these the divine mercy is able to bring healing. Yet I do not think that there must be any haste nor that anything must be done incautiously and immaturely, lest, while peace is being grasped at, the divine indignation be more seriously incurred. The blessed martyrs have written to me about certain persons, requesting that their wishes may be examined into, when, as soon as peace is given to us all by the Lord, we shall begin to return to the church, then the wishes of each one shall be looked into in your presence and with your judgment. Yet I hear that certain of the presbyters, neither mindful of the gospel, nor considering what the martyrs have written to me, nor reserving to the bishop the honor of his priesthood and of his dignity, have already begun to communicate with the lapsed and to offer on their behalf and to give them the Eucharist when it was fitting that they should attain to these things in due course. For, as in smaller sins which are not committed against God, penance may be performed in a set time, and confession may be made with investigation of the life of him who performs the penance. And no one can come to communion unless the hands of the bishop and clergy be first imposed upon him, how much more ought all such matters as these to be observed with caution and moderation according to the discipline of the Lord in these gravest and extremest sins? This warning, indeed, our presbyters and deacons ought to have given you, that they might cherish the sheep committed to their care, and by the divine authority might instruct them in the way of obtaining salvation by prayer. I am aware of the peacefulness as well as the fear of our people who would be watchful in the satisfaction and deprecation of God's anger unless some of the presbyters by way of gratifying them had deceived them. Even you, therefore, 
yourselves, guide them, each one, and control the minds of the lapsed by counsel and by your own moderation, according to the divine precepts. Let no one pluck the unripe fruit at a time as yet premature. Let no one commit his ship, shattered and broken with the waves, and new to the deep, before he has carefully repaired it. Let none be in haste to accept and to put on a rent tunic, unless he has seen it mended by a skillful workman, and has received it arranged by the fuller. Let them bear with patience my advice, I beg. Let them look for my return, that when, by God's mercy, I come to you, I, with many of my co-bishops, being called together according to the Lord's discipline, and in the presence of the confessors, and with your opinion also, may be able to examine the letters and the wishes of the blessed martyrs. Concerning this matter, I have written both to the clergy and to the martyrs and confessors, both of which letters I have directed to be read to you. I bid you, brethren, beloved and most longed for, ever heartily farewell in the Lord, and have me in remembrance. Fare ye well. End of Epistle 11 by Cyprian Read by David Ronald Epistle 12 of Epistles of Cyprian by Cyprian this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Epistle 12. To the clergy, concerning the lapsed, and catechumens, that they should not be left without superintendence. Argument. The burden of this letter, as of the succeeding one, is found below in the fourteenth epistle. Quote, but afterwards, he says, when some of the lapsed, whether of their own accord, or by the suggestion of any other, broke forth with a daring demand as though they would endeavor by a violent effort to extort the peace that had been promised to them by the martyrs and confessors concerning this also i wrote twice to the clergy and commanded it to be read to them that for the mitigation of their violence in any manner for the meantime if any who had received a certificate from the martyrs were departing from this life having made confession and received the hands imposed upon them for repentance they should be remitted to the lord with the peace promised them by the martyrs quote, etc cyprian to the presbyters and deacons his brethren greeting i marvel beloved brethren that you have answered nothing to me in reply to my many letters which i have frequently written to you although as well the advantage as the need of our brotherhood would certainly be best provided for if receiving information from you i could accurately investigate and advise upon the management of affairs since however i see that there is not yet any opportunity of coming to you and that the summer has already begun a season that is disturbed with continual and heavy sicknesses I think that our brethren must be dealt with, that they who have received certificates from the martyrs, and may be assisted by their privilege with God, if they should be seized with any misfortune and peril of sickness, should, without waiting for my presence, before any presbyter who might be present, or if a presbyter should not be found and death begins to be imminent, before even a deacon be able to make confession of their sin, that, with the imposition of hands upon them for repentance, they should come to the Lord with the peace which the martyrs have desired by their letters to us to be granted to them. Cherish, also, by your presence, the rest of the people who are lapsed, and cheer them by your consolation, that they may not fail of the faith and of God's mercy, for those shall not be forsaken by the aid and assistance of the lord who meekly humbly and with true penitence have persevered in good works but the divine remedy will be granted to them also to the hearers also if there are any overtaken by danger and placed near to death let your vigilance not be wanting let not the mercy of the lord be denied to those that are imploring the divine favor i bid you beloved brethren ever heartily farewell and remember me 
greet the whole brotherhood in my name, and remind them, and ask them to be mindful of me. Fare ye well. End of Epistle 12 by Cyprian Read by David Ronald Epistle 13 of Epistles of Cyprian by Cyprian This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Epistle 13 to the clergy concerning those who are in haste to receive peace. Argument. Peace must be attained through penitence, and penitence is realized by keeping the commandments. They who are oppressed with sickness, if they are relieved by the suffrages of the martyrs, may be admitted to peace, but others are to be kept back until the peace of the church is secured. Cyprian, to the presbyters and deacons, his brethren, greeting. I have read your letter, beloved brethren, wherein you wrote that your wholesome counsel was not wanting to our brethren, that, laying aside all rash haste, they should manifest a religious patience to God, so that when, by his mercy, we come together, we may debate upon all kinds of things according to the discipline of the church, especially since it is written, quote, Remember from whence thou hast fallen, and repent. End quote. Now he repents, who, remembering the divine precept with meekness and patience, and obeying the priests of God, deserves well of the Lord by his obedience and his righteous works. Since, however, you imitate that some are petulant and eagerly urge their being received to communion, and have desired in this matter that some rule should be given by me to you, I think I have sufficiently written on this subject in the last letter that was sent to you, that they who have received a certificate from the martyrs, and can be assisted by their help with the Lord in respect of their sins, if they begin to be oppressed with any sickness or risk, when they have made confession and have received the imposition of hands on them by you in acknowledgment of their penitence, should be remitted to the Lord with peace promised to them by the martyrs. But others who, without having received any certificate from the martyrs, are envious, since this is the cause not of a few, nor of one church, nor of one province, but of the whole world must wait in dependence on the protection of the Lord for the public peace of the church itself. For this is suitable to the modesty and the discipline and even the life of all of us, that the chief officers meeting together with the clergy in the presence also of the people who stand fast, to whom themselves, moreover, honor is to be shown for their faith and fear, we may be able to order all things with the religiousness of a common consultation. But how irreligious is it, and mischievous, even to those themselves who are eager, that while such as are exiles and driven from their country, and spoiled of all their property, have not yet returned to the church, some of the lapsed should be hasty to anticipate even confessors themselves, and to enter into the church before them. If they are so over-anxious, they have what they require in their own power, the times themselves, offering them freely more than they ask. The struggle is still going forward, and the strife is daily celebrated. If they truly and with constancy repent of what they have done, and the fervor of their faith prevails, he who cannot be delayed may be crowned. I bid you, beloved brethren, ever heartily farewell, and have me in remembrance. Greet all the brotherhood in my name, and tell them to be mindful of me. Fare ye well. End of Epistle 13 by Cyprian Read by David Ronald Epistle 14 of Epistles of Cyprian by Cyprian. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Epistle 14 to the presbyters and deacons assembled at Rome. Argument. He gives an account of his withdrawal and of the things which he did therein, having sent to Rome for his justification copies of the letters which he had written to his people. Nay, he makes use of the same words which he had employed in them. Compare Epistle 22-23. to 
to the Roman clergy. Cyprian, to his brethren, the presbyters and deacons assembled at Rome, greeting, Having ascertained, beloved brethren, that what I have done and am doing has been told to you in a somewhat garbled and untruthful manner, I have thought it necessary to write this letter to you, wherein I might give an account to you of my doings, my discipline, and my diligence. For, as the Lord's commands teach, immediately the first burst of the disturbance arose, and the people, with violent clamor, repeatedly demanded me, I, taking into consideration not so much my own safety as the public peace of the brethren, withdrew for a while, lest, by my overbold presence, the tumult which had begun might be still further provoked. Nevertheless, although absent in body, I was not wanting either in spirit, or in act, or in my advice, so as to fail in any benefit that I could afford my brethren by my counsel according to the Lord's precepts in anything that my poor abilities enabled me. And what I did, these thirteen letters sent forth at various times declare to you, which I have transmitted to you, in which neither counsel to the clergy, nor exhortation to the confessors, nor rebuke when it was necessary to the exiles, nor my appeals and persuasions to the whole brotherhood, that they should entreat the mercy of God, was wanting to the full extent that, according to the law of faith and the fear of God, with the Lord's help, my poor abilities could endeavor. But afterwards, when tortures came, my words reached both to our tortured brethren and to those who as yet were only imprisoned with a view to torture to strengthen and console them. Moreover, when I found that those who had polluted their hands and mouths with sacrilegious contact or had no less infected their consciences with wicked certificates, were everywhere soliciting the martyrs, and were also corrupting the confessors with importunate and excessive entreaties, so that, without any discrimination or examination of the individuals themselves, thousands of certificates were being daily given, contrary to the law of the gospel. I wrote letters in which I recalled, by my advice, as much as possible, the martyrs and confessors to the Lord's commands. To the presbyters and deacons also was not wanting the vigor of the priesthood, so that some, too little mindful of discipline, and hasty with a rash precipitation, who had already begun to communicate with the lapsed, were restrained by the interposition. Among the people, moreover, I have done what I could to quiet their minds, and have instructed them to maintain ecclesiastical discipline. But afterwards, when some of the lapsed, whether of their own accord, or by the suggestion of any other, broke forth with a daring demand, as though they would endeavor by a violent effort to extort the peace that had been promised to them by the martyrs and confessors, concerning this also I wrote twice to the clergy, and commanded it to be read to them, that for the mitigation of their violence in any manner, for the meantime, if any who had received a certificate from the martyrs were departing from this life, having made confession and received the imposition of hands on them for repentance, they should be remitted to the Lord with the peace promised them by the martyrs. Nor in this did I give them a law, or rashly constitute myself the author of the direction, but as it seemed fit both that honor should be paid to the martyrs, and that the vehemence of those who were anxious to disturb everything should be restrained, and when, besides, I had read your letter, which you lately wrote hither to my clergy by Crementius, the subdeacon, to the effect that assistance should be given to those who might, after their lapse, be seized with sickness, and might penitently desire communion, I judged it well to stand by your judgment, lest our proceedings, which ought to be united and to agree in all things, should in any respect be different. The cases of the rest, even although they might have received certificates from the martyrs, I ordered altogether to be put off, and to be reserved till I should be present, that so, when the Lord has given to us peace, and several bishops shall have begun to assemble into one place, we may be able to arrange and reform everything, having the advantage also of your counsel. I bid you, beloved brethren, ever heartily farewell.
end of Epistle 14 by Cyprian, read by David Ronald. Epistle 15 of Epistles of Cyprian by Cyprian. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Epistle 15 to Moises and Maximus and the rest of the confessors. Argument. The burden of this letter is given in Epistle 31, below, where the Roman clergy say, quote, On which subject we owe you, and give you our deepest and abundant thanks, that you threw light into the gloom of their prison by your letters, that you came to them in such way as you could enter, that you refreshed their minds, robust in their own faith and confession, by your appeals and your letters, that, accompanying their happiness with deserved praises, you inflamed them to a much more ardent desire for heavenly glory, that you urged them onward in the course, that you animated, as we believe and hope, future victors by the power of your address, so that, although all this may seem to come from the faith of the confessors and the divine indulgence, yet in their martyrdom they may seem in some manner to have become debtors to you. End quote. Cyprian, to Moises and Maximus, the presbyters and the other confessors, his brethren, greeting. Celerinus, a companion both of your faith and virtue, and God's soldier in glorious engagements, has come to me, beloved brethren, and represented all of you, as well as each individual, forcibly to my affection. I beheld in him, when he came, the whole of you, and when he spoke sweetly and often of your love to me, in his words I heard you. I rejoice very greatly when such things are brought to me from you by such men as he. In a certain manner, I am also there with you in prison. I think that I who am thus bound to your hearts enjoy with you the delights of the divine approval. Your individual love associates me with your honor. The Spirit does not allow our love to be separated. Confession shuts you up in prison. Affection shuts me up there. And I indeed, remembering you day and night, both when in the sacrifices I offer prayer with many, and when in retirement I pray with private petition, beseech of the Lord a full acknowledgment to your crowns and your praises. But my poor ability is too weak to recompense you. You give more when you remember me in prayer, since, already breathing only celestial things, and meditating only divine things, you ascend to loftier heights, even by the delay of your suffering, and by the long lapse of time are not wasting, but increasing your glory. A first and single confession makes blessed. You confess as often as, when asked to retire from prison, you prefer the prison with faith and virtue. Your praises are as numerous as the days, as the months roll onward, ever your merits increase. He conquers once who suffers at once, but he who continues always battling with punishment and is not overcome with suffering is daily crowned. Now, therefore, let magistrates and consuls and proconsuls go by, let them glory in the ensigns of their yearly dignity and in their twelve facies. Behold, the heavenly dignity in you is sealed by the brightness of a year's honor, and already, in the continuance of its victorious glory, has passed over the rolling circle of the returning year. The rising sun and the waning moon enlighten the world, but to you, he who made the sun and moon was a greater light in your dungeon, and the brightness of Christ glowing in your hearts and minds irradiated with that eternal and brilliant light the gloom of the place of punishment which to others was so horrible and deadly. The winter has passed through the vicissitudes of the months, but you, shut up in prison, were undergoing, instead of the inclemencies of winter, the winter of persecution. To the winter succeeded the mildness of spring, rejoicing with roses and crowned with flowers, but to you were present roses and flowers from the delights of paradise, and celestial garlands wreathed your brows. Behold, the summer is fruitful with the fertility of the harvest, and the threshing floor is filled with grain. But you who have sown glory reap the fruit of glory, and, placed in the Lord's threshing floor, 
Behold the chaff burnt up with unquenchable fire. You yourselves, as grains of wheat, winnowed and precious corn, now purged and garnered, regard the dwelling place of a prison as your granary. Nor is there wanting to the autumn spiritual grace for discharging the duties of the season. The vintage is pressed out of doors, and the grape which shall hereafter flow into the cups is trodden in the presses. You, rich bunches out of the Lord's vineyard, and branches with fruit already ripe, trodden by the tribulation of the worldly pressure, fill your wine press in the torturing prison, and shed your blood instead of wine. Brave to bear suffering, you willingly drink the cup of martyrdom. Thus the year rolls on with the Lord's servants. Thus is celebrated the vicissitude of the seasons with spiritual deserts, and with celestial rewards. Abundantly blessed are they who, from your number, passing through these footprints of glory, have already departed from the world, and, having finished their journey of virtue and faith, have attained the embrace and the kiss of the Lord, to the joy of the Lord himself. But yet your glory is not less, who are still engaged in contest, and, about to follow the glories of your comrades, are long waging the battle, and with an unmoved and unshaken faith, standing fast, are daily exhibiting in your virtues a spectacle in the sight of God. The longer is your strife, the loftier will be your crown. The struggle is won, but it is crowded with a manifold multitude of contests. You conquer hunger and despise thirst, and tread underfoot the squalor of the dungeon and the horror of the very abode of punishment by the vigor of your courage. Punishment is there subdued, torture is worn out, death is not feared but desired, being overcome by the reward of immortality, so that he who has conquered is crowned with eternity of life. What now must be the mind in you? How elevated, how large the heart, when such and so great things are resolved, when nothing but the precepts of God and the rewards of Christ are considered. The will is, then, only God's will, and although you are still placed in the flesh, it is the life not of the present world, but of the future, that you now live. It now remains, beloved brethren, that you should be mindful of me, that, among your great and divine considerations, you should also think of me in your mind and spirit, and that, I should be in your prayers and supplications, when that voice, which is illustrious by the purification of confession, and praiseworthy for the continual tenor of its honor, penetrates to God's ears, and heaven being open to it, passes from these regions of the world subdued to the realms above, and obtains from the Lord's goodness even what it asks. For, what do you ask from the Lord's mercy which you do not deserve to obtain? You who have thus observed the Lord's commands, who have maintained the gospel discipline with the simple vigor of your faith, who, with the glory of your virtue uncorrupted, have stood bravely by the Lord's commands, and by his apostles, and have confirmed the wavering faith of many by the truth of your martyrdom. Truly, gospel witnesses, and truly, Christ's martyrs, resting upon his roots, founded with strong foundation upon the rock, you have joined discipline with virtue, you have brought others to the fear of God, you have made your martyrdoms examples. I bid you, brethren, very brave and beloved, ever heartily farewell, and remember me. End of Epistle 15 by Cyprian Read by David Ronald Epistle 16 of Epistles of Cyprian by Cyprian. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Epistle 16. The Confessors to Cyprian. Argument. A certificate written in the name of the martyrs by Lucianus. All the confessors to Father Cyprian. Greeting. Know that, to all, concerning whom the account of what they have done since the commission of their sin has been, in your estimation, satisfactory, we have granted peace, and we have desired that this respect should be made known by you to the other bishops also. We bid you to have peace with the holy martyrs. Lucianus wrote this, there being present of the clergy, both an exorcist and a reader. End of Epistle 16 of Epistles of Cyprian 
Read by David Ronald. Epistle 17 of Epistles of Cyprian by Cyprian. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Epistle 17 to the presbyters and deacons about the foregoing and the following letters. Argument. No account is to be made of certificates from the martyrs before the peace of the church is restored. Cyprian, to the presbyters and deacons, his brethren, greeting. The Lord speaketh and saith, quote, Upon whom shall I look, but upon him that is humble and quiet, and that trembleth at my words? End quote. Although we ought all to be this, yet especially those ought to be so who must labor, that after their grave lapse they may, by true penitence and absolute humility, deserve well of the Lord. Now I have read the letter of the whole body of confessors, which they wish to be made known by me to all my colleagues, and in which they requested that the peace given by themselves should be assured to those concerning whom the account of what they have done since their crime has been, in our estimation, satisfactory which matter, as it waits for the counsel and judgment of all of us, I do not dare to prejudge, and so to assume a common cause for my own decision. And therefore, in the meantime, let us abide by the letters which I lately wrote to you, of which I have now sent a copy to many of my colleagues, who wrote in reply that they were pleased with what I had decided, and that there must be no departure therefrom, until peace being granted to us by the Lord, we shall be able to assemble together into one place, and to examine into the cases of individuals. But that you may know both what my colleague Caldonius wrote to me, and what I replied to him, I have enclosed with my letter a copy of each letter, the whole of which I beg you to read to our brethren, that they may be more and more settled down to patience, and not add another fault to what had hitherto been their former fault, not being willing to obey either me or the gospel, nor allowing their cases to be examined in accordance with the letters of all the confessors, I bid you, beloved brethren, ever heartily farewell, and have me in remembrance, salute all the brotherhood, fare ye well. End of Epistle 17 by Cyprian Read by David Ronald Epistle 18 of Epistles of Cyprian by Cyprian. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Epistle 18. Caldonius to Cyprian. Argument. When, in the urgency of a new persecution, certain of the lapsed had confessed Christ, and so, before they went away into exile, sought for peace, Caldonius consults Cyprian as to whether peace should be granted to them. Caldonius, to Cyprian, and his fellow presbyters abiding at Carthage, greeting. The necessity of the times induces us not hastily to grant peace, but it was well to write to you that they, who, after having sacrificed, were again tried, became exiles, and thus they seem to me to have atoned for their former crime, in that they now let go their possessions and homes, and, repenting, follow Christ. Thus, Felix, who assisted in the office of presbyter under Decimus, and was very near to me in bonds, I knew that same Felix very thoroughly. Victoria, his wife, and Lucius, being faithful, and have left their possessions, which the treasury now has in keeping. Moreover, a woman, Bona, by name, who is dragged by her husband to sacrifice, and, with no conscience guilty of the crime, but because those who held her hands sacrificed, began to cry against them, quote, I did not do it, you it was who did it, end quote, was also banished. Since, therefore, all these were asking for peace, saying, quote, We have recovered the faith which we had lost, we have repented and have publicly confessed Christ, end quote. Although it seems to me that they ought to receive peace, yet I have referred them to your judgment that I might not appear to presume anything rashly. If, therefore, you should wish me to do anything by the common decision, write to me. Greet our brethren, our brethren greet you. I bid you, beloved brethren, ever heartily farewell. 
End of Epistle 18 of Cyprian by Cyprian, read by David Ronald. Epistle 19 of Epistles of Cyprian by Cyprian. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Epistle 19. Cyprian replies to Caldonius. Argument. Cyprian treats of nothing peculiar in this epistle beyond acquiescing in the opinion of Caldonius to wit that peace should not be refused to such lapsed as, by a true repentance and confession of the name of Christ, have deserved it and have therefore returned to him. Cyprian, to Caldonius, his brother, greeting. We have received your letter, beloved brother, which is abundantly sensible and full of honesty and faith. Nor do we wonder that, skilled and exercised as you are in the scriptures of the Lord, you do everything discreetly and wisely. You have judged quite correctly about granting peace to our brethren, which they, by true penitence and by the glory of a confession of the Lord, have restored to themselves, being justified by their words, by which, before, they had condemned themselves. Since, then, they have washed away all their sin and their former stain, by the help of the Lord, has been done away by a more powerful virtue, they ought not to lie any longer under the power of the devil, as it were, prostrate, when, being banished and deprived of all their property, they have lifted themselves up and have begun to stand with Christ. And I wish that the others also would repent after their fall and be transferred into their former condition, and that you may know how we have dealt with these in their urgent and eager rashness and importunity to exhort peace. I have sent a book to you with letters to the number of five that I wrote to the clergy and to the people and to the martyrs also and confessors which letters have already been sent to many of our colleagues and have satisfied them. And they replied that they also agree with me in the same opinion according to the Catholic faith, which very thing do you also communicate to as many of our colleagues as you can, that among all these may be observed one mode of action and one agreement according to the Lord's precepts. I bid you, beloved brethren, ever heartily farewell. End of Epistle 19 by Cyprian Read by David Ronald Epistle 20 of Epistles of Cyprian by Cyprian This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Epistle 20 Celerinus to Lucian Argument Celerinus, on behalf of his lapsed sisters at Rome, beseeches peace from the Carthaginian confessors. Celerinus to Lucian, greeting. In writing this letter to you, my lord and brother, I have been rejoicing and sorrowful, rejoicing in that I had heard that you had been tried on behalf of the name of our Lord Jesus Christ our Saviour, and had confessed his name in the presence of the magistrates of the world, but sorrowful in that from the time when I was in your company, I have never been able to receive your letters, and now lately a twofold sorrow has fallen upon me, that although you knew that Montanus, our common brother, was coming to me from you out of the dungeon, you did not intimate anything to me concerning your well-being, nor about anything that is done in connection with you. This, however, continually happens to the servants of God, especially to those who are appointed for the confession of Christ. For I know that every one looks not now to the things that are of the world, but that he is hoping for a heavenly crown. Moreover, I said that perhaps you had forgotten to write me. For if, from the lowest place, I may be called by you, yours, or brother, if I should be worthy to hear myself named Celerinus, yet when I also was in such a purple confession, I remembered my oldest brethren, and I took notice of them in my letters, that their former love was still around me and mine. Yet I beseech, beloved of the Lord, that if, first of all, you are washed in that sacred blood 
and have suffered for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ before my letters find you in this world, or should they now reach you, that you would answer them to me. So may he crown you whose name you have confessed, for I believe that although in this world we do not see each other, yet in the future we shall embrace one another in the presence of Christ. Entreat that I may be worthy, even I, to be crowned along with your company. No, nevertheless, that I am placed in the midst of a great tribulation, and, as if you were present with me, I remember your former love day and night, God only knows. And therefore, I ask that you will grant my desire, and that you will grieve with me at the death of my sister, who in this time of devastation has fallen from Christ. For she has sacrificed and provoked our Lord, as seems manifest to us. And for her deeds, I in this day of paschal rejoicing, weeping day and night, have spent the days in tears, in sackcloth and ashes, and I am still spending them so to this day, until the aid of our Lord Jesus Christ, and affection manifested through you, or through those my lords who have been crowned, from whom you are about to ask it, shall come to the help of so terrible a shipwreck. For I remember your former love, that you will grieve with all the rest for our sisters, whom you also knew well, that is, knew Maria and Candida, for whose sin, because they have us as brethren, we ought to keep watch. For I believe that Christ, according to their repentance and the works which they have done towards our banished colleagues, who came from you, by whom themselves you will hear of their good works, that Christ, I say, will have mercy upon them, when you, his martyrs, beseech him. For I have heard that you have received the ministry of the purpled ones. O oh, happy are you, even sleeping on the ground to obtain your wishes, which you have always desired. You have desired to be sent into prison for his name's sake, which now has come to pass, as it is written, quote, the Lord grant thee according to thine own heart. End quote. And now made a priest of God over them, and the same their minister has acknowledged it. I ask, therefore, my Lord, and I entreat by our Lord Jesus Christ, that you will refer the case to the rest of your colleagues, your brethren, my lords, and ask from them that whichever of you is first crowned should remit such a great sin to those our sister knew Maria in Canada. For this latter I have always called Etacusa. God is my witness, because she gave gifts for herself that she might not sacrifice, but she appears only to have ascended to the tree of Fata, and thence to have descended. I know, therefore, that she has not sacrificed. Their cause, having been lately heard, the chief rulers commanded them, in the meantime, to remain as they are, until a bishop should be appointed. But, as far as possible, by your holy prayers and petitions, in which we trust, since you are friends as well as witnesses of Christ, we pray that you would be indulgent in all these matters. I entreat, therefore, beloved Lord Lucian, be mindful of me, and acquiesce in my petition, so may Christ grant you that sacred crown which he has given you, not only in confession, but also in holiness, in which you have always walked and have always been an example to the saints, as well as a witness, that you will relate to all my lords, your brethren, the confessors, all about this matter, that they may receive help from you. For this, my lord and brother, you ought to know, that it is not I alone who ask this on their behalf, but also Statius and Severianus, and all the confessors who have come thence hither from you, to whom these very sisters went down to the harbor and took them up into the city, and they have ministered to sixty-five, and even to this day have tended them in all things. For all are with them, but I ought not to burden that sacred heart of yours any more, since I know that you will labor with a ready will. Macarius, with his sisters, Cornelia and Emeretta, salute you, 
rejoicing in your sanguinary confession, as well as in that of all the brethren, and Saturninus, who himself also wrestled with the devil, who also bravely confessed the name of Christ, and moreover, under the torture of the grappling claws, bravely confessed, and who also strongly begs and entreats this, your brethren, Calphurnius and Maria, and all the holy brethren, salute you, for you ought to know this too, that I have written also to my lords your brethren letters, which I request that you will deign to read them. End of Epistle 20 of Epistles of Cyprian Read by David Ronald Epistle 21 of Epistles of Cyprian by Cyprian This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Epistle 21 Lucian replies to Salarinus Argument Lucian assents to the petition of Salarinus Lucian to Salarinus, his lord, and, if I shall be worthy to be called so, colleague in Christ, greeting. I received your letter, most dearly beloved lord and brother, in which you have so laden me with expressions of kindness, that by reason of your burdening me I was almost overcome with such excessive joy, so that I exulted in reading, by the benefit of your so great humility, the letter which I also earnestly desired after so long a time to read, in which you deigned to call me to remembrance, saying to me in your writing, quote, If I may be worthy to be called your brother, end quote, of a man such as I am who confess the name of God with trembling before the inferior magistrates. For you, by God's will, when you confessed, not only frightened back the great serpent himself, the pioneer of Antichrist, but have conquered him by that voice and those divine words, whereby I know how you love the faith, and how zealous you are for Christ's discipline, in which I know and rejoice that you are actively occupied. Now, beloved, already to be esteemed among the martyrs, you have wished to overload me with your letter in which you told us concerning our sisters, on whose behalf I wish that we could by possibility mention them, without remembering also so great a crime committed. Assuredly, we should not then think of them with so many tears as we do now. You ought to know what has been done concerning us. When the blessed martyr Paulus was still in the body, he called me and said to me, quote, Lucian, in the presence of Christ, I say to you, if any one, after my being called away, shall ask for peace from you, grant it in my name. End quote. Moreover, all of us whom the Lord has condescended in such tribulation to call away, by our letters, by mutual agreement, have given peace to all. You see, then, brother, how I have done this, in part of what Paulus bade me, as what we, in all cases, decreed, when we were in this tribulation, wherein, by the command of the emperor, we were ordered to be put to death by hunger and thirst, and were shut up in two cells, that so they might weaken us by hunger and thirst. Moreover, the fire from the effect of our torture was so intolerable that nobody could bear it. But now we have attained the brightness itself, and therefore, beloved brother, greet Nemeria and Candida, who shall have peace according to the precept of Paulus, and the rest of the martyrs whose names I subjoin, basis in the dungeon of the perjured, Mopalicus at the torture, Fortunio in prison, Paulus after torture, Fortunata, Victorinus, Victor, Herinius, Julia, Marshall, and Aristo, who by God's will were put to death in the prison by hunger, of whom in a few days you will hear of me as a companion. For now there are eight days, from the day in which I was shut up again, to the day in which I wrote my letter to you. For before these eight days, for five intervening days, I received a morsel of bread and water my measure. And therefore, brother, I ask that, as here, since the Lord has begun to give peace to the church itself, according to the precept of Paulus, and our tract it, the case being set forth before the bishop 
and confession being made, not only these may have peace, but also those whom you know to be very near to our heart. All my colleagues greet you. Do you greet the confessors of the Lord, who are there with you, whose names you have intimated, among whom also are Satininus with his companions, but who also is my colleague, and Maris, Collecta, and Emeretta, Calphurnius, and Maria, Sabina, Spessina, and the sisters, Januaria, Dativa, Donata. We greet Satyrus with his family, Bassianus, and all the clergy, Uranius, Alexius, Quintianus, Colonica, and all whose names I have not written, because I am already weary. Therefore, they must pardon me. I bid you heartily farewell, and Alexius, and Gedalucus, and the money changers, and the sisters, my sisters, Januaria, and Sophia, whom I commend to you, greet you. End of Epistle 21 of Cyprian, read by David Ronald. Epistle 22 of Epistles of Cyprian by Cyprian. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Epistle 22. To the clergy abiding at Rome, concerning many of the confessors, and concerning the forwardness of Lucian, and the modesty of Celerinus, the confessor. Argument. In this letter, Cyprian informs the Roman clergy of the seditious demand of the lapsed to be restored to peace, and of the forwardness of Lucian, in order that they may better understand these matters, Cyprian takes care that not only his own letters, but also those of Salarinus and Lucian should be sent to them. Cyprian, to the presbyters and deacons abiding at Rome, his brethren, greeting. After the letters that I wrote to you, beloved brethren, in which what I had done was explained, and some slight account was given of my discipline and diligence, there came another matter which, any more than the others, ought not to be concealed from you. For our brother, Lucian, who himself also is one of the confessors, earnest indeed in faith and robust in virtue, but little established in the reading of the Lord's word, has attempted certain things constituting himself for a time and authority for unskilled people, so that certificates written by his hand were given indiscriminately to many persons in the name of Paulus, whereas Mapalicus, the martyr, cautious and modest, mindful of the law and discipline, wrote no letters contrary to the gospel, but only moved with domestic affection for his mother, who had fallen, commanded peace to be given to her. Saturninus, moreover, after his torture, still remaining in prison, sent out no letters of this kind. But Lucian, not only while Paulus was still in prison, gave everywhere in his name certificates written with his own hand, but even after his decease, persisted in doing the same things under his name, saying that this had been commanded him by Paulus, ignorant that he must obey the Lord rather than his fellow servant. In the name also of Aurelius, a young man who had undergone the torture, many certificates were given, written by the hand of the same Lucian, because Aurelius did not know how to write himself. In order, in some measure, to put a stop to this practice, I wrote letters to them, which I have sent to you under the enclosure of the former letter, in which I did not fail to ask and persuade them that consideration might be had for the law of the Lord and the gospel. But after I sent my letters to them, that, as it were, something might be done more moderately and temperately, the same Lucian wrote a letter in the name of all the confessors, in which, well nigh, every bond of faith and fear of God and the Lord's command and the sacredness and sincerity of the gospel were dissolved. For he wrote in the name of all, that they had given peace to all, and that he wished that this decree should be communicated through me to the other bishops, of which letter I transmitted a copy to you. It was added, indeed, Quote, of whom the account of what they have done since their crime has been satisfactory, End quote. a thing 
this which excites a greater odium against me, because I, when I have begun to hear the cases of each one, and to examine into them, seem to deny to many what they now are all boasting that they have received from the martyrs and confessors. Finally, this seditious practice has already begun to appear, for in our province, through some of its cities, an attack has been made by the multitude upon their rulers, and they have compelled that peace to be given to them immediately, which they all cried out had been once given to them by the martyrs and confessors. Their rulers, being frightened and subdued, were of little avail to resist them, either by vigor of mind or by strength of faith. With us, moreover, some turbulent spirits, who in time past were with difficulty governed by me, and were delayed till my coming, were inflamed by this letter as if by a firebrand, and began to be more violent, and to extort the peace granted to them. I have sent a copy to you of the letters that I wrote to my clergy about these matters, and, moreover, what Caldonius, my colleague, of his integrity and faithfulness wrote, and what I replied to him. I have sent both to you to read, copies also of the letters of Salarinus, the good and stout confessor, which he wrote to Lucian, the same confessor, and what Lucian replied to him. I have sent to you, that you may know both my labor in respect of everything, and my diligence, and might learn the truth itself, how moderate and cautious is Salarinus the confessor, and how reverent both in his humility and fear for our faith, while Lucian, as I have said, is less skillful concerning the understanding of the Lord's word, and by his facility is mischievous on account of the dislike that he causes for my reverential dealing. For while the Lord has said that the nations are to be baptized in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, and their past sins are to be done away in baptism, this man, ignorant of the precept and of the law, commands peace to be granted and sin to be done away in the name of Paulus, and he says that this was commanded him by Paulus, as you will observe in the letter sent by the same Lucian to Salarinus, in which he very little considered that it is not martyrs that make the gospel, but that martyrs are made by the gospel, since Paul, also, the apostle whom the Lord called a chosen vessel unto him, laid down in his epistle, quote, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you, and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed, as we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. End quote. But your letter, which I received, written to my clergy, came opportunely, as also did those which the blessed confessors Moises and Maximus, Nicostratus, and the rest sent to Saturninus and Aurelius and the others, in which are contained the full vigor of the gospel and the robust discipline of the law of the Lord. Your words much assisted me as I labored here, and withstood with the whole strength of faith the onset of ill will, so that my work was shortened from above, and that before the letters which I last sent you reached you, you declared to me that according to the gospel law, your judgment also strongly and unanimously concurred with mine. I bid you, brethren, beloved and longed for, ever heartily farewell. End of Epistle 22 of Cyprian Read by David Ronald Epistle 23 of Epistles of Cyprian by Cyprian This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Epistle 23 to the clergy on the letters sent to Rome, and about the appointment of Satyrus as reader, and Optatus as subdeacon. Argument. The clergy are informed by this letter of the ordination of Satyrus and Optatus, and what Cyprian had written to Rome. Cyprian, to the presbyters and deacons, his brethren, greeting. 
that nothing may be unknown to your consciousness, beloved brethren, of what was written to me and what I replied, I have sent you a copy of each letter, and I believe that my rejoinder will not displease you. But I ought to acquaint you in my letter concerning this, that for a very urgent reason I have sent a letter to the clergy who abide in the city. And since it behooved me to write by clergy, while well, I know that very many of ours are absent, and the few that are there are hardly sufficient for the ministry of the daily duty, it was necessary to appoint some new ones who might be sent. No, then, that I have made Satyrus a reader, and Optatus the confessor a subdeacon, whom already, by the general advice, we had made next to the clergy, in having entrusted to Satyrus on Easter day, once and again, the reading, and when, with the teacher presbyters, we were carefully trying readers, and appointing Optatus from among the readers to be a teacher of the hearers, examining, first of all, whether all things were found fitting in them, which ought to be found in such as were being prepared for the clerical office. Nothing new, therefore, has been done by me in your absence, but what, on the general advice of all of us, had been begun, has, upon urgent necessity, been accomplished. I bid you, beloved brethren, ever heartily farewell, and remember me, fare ye well. End of Epistle 23 of Cyprian, read by David Ronald Epistle 24 of Epistles of Cyprian by Cyprian. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Epistle 24 to Moises and Maximus and the rest of the confessors. Argument. This letter is one of congratulation to the Roman confessors. Cyprian to Moises and Maximus, the presbyters, and to the other confessors, his very beloved brethren. Greeting. I had already known from rumor most brave and blessed brethren, the glory of your faith and virtue, rejoicing greatly and abundantly congratulating you, that the highest condensation of our Lord Jesus Christ should have prepared you for the crown by confession of his name, for you who have become chiefs and leaders in the battle of our day have set forward the standard of the celestial warfare, you have made a beginning of the spiritual contest which God has purposed to be now waged by your valor. You, with unshaken strength and unyielding firmness, have broken the first onset of the rising war. Thence have arisen happy openings of the fight. Thence have begun good auspices of victory. It happened that here martyrdoms were consummated by tortures, but he who, preceding in the struggle, has been made an example of virtue to the brethren, is on common ground with the martyrs in honor. Hence you have delivered to us garlands woven by your hand, and have pledged your brethren from the cup of salvation. To these glorious beginnings of confession, and the omens of a victorious warfare, has been added the maintenance of discipline, which I observed from the vigor of your letter that you lately sent to your colleagues joined with you to the Lord in confession, with anxious admonition, that the sacred precepts of the gospel and the commandments of life once delivered to us should be kept with firm and rigid observance. Behold, another lofty degree of your glory. Behold, with confession, a double title to deserving well of God to stand with a firm step, and to drive away in this struggle, by the strength of your faith, those who endeavor to make a breach in the gospel, and bring impious hands to the work of undermining the Lord's precepts, to have before afforded the indications of courage, and now to afford lessons of life. The Lord, when, after his resurrection, he sent forth his apostles, charges them, saying, Quote, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, 
teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. End quote. And the Apostle John, remembering this charge, subsequently lays it down in his epistle. Quote, Hereby, says he, we do know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He that saith he knoweth him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. End quote. You prompt the keeping of these precepts. You observe the divine and heavenly commands. This is to be a confessor of the Lord. This is to be a martyr of Christ, to keep the firmness of one's profession inviolate among all evils and secure, for to wish to become a martyr for the Lord and to try to overthrow the Lord's precepts, to use against him the condensation that he has granted you, to become, as it were, a rebel with arms that you have received from him, this is to wish to confess Christ and to deny Christ's gospel. I rejoice, therefore, on your behalf, most brave and faithful brethren, and as much as I congratulate the martyrs, there honored for the glory of their strength, so much do I also equally congratulate you for the crown of the Lord's discipline. The Lord has shed forth his condensation in manifold kinds of liberality. He has distributed the praises of good soldiers and their spiritual glories in plentiful variety. We also are sharers in your honor. We count your glory our glory, whose times have been brightened by such a felicity that it should be the fortune of our day to see the proved servants of God and Christ's soldiers crowned. I bid you, most brave and blessed brethren, ever heartily farewell and remember me. End of Epistle 24 of Cyprian, read by David Ronald. Epistle 25 of Epistles of Cyprian by Cyprian, translated by Robert Wallace. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Epistle 25, Moises, Maximus, Nicostratus, and the other confessors answer the foregoing letter argument they gratefully acknowledge the consolation which the roman confessors had received from cyprian's letter martyrdom is not a punishment but a happiness the words of the gospel are brands to inflame faith in the case of the lapsed the judgment of cyprian is acquiesced in to caecilius cyprian bishop of the church of the carthaginians moises and maximus presbyters and Nicostratus and Rufinus, deacons, and the other confessors persevering in the faith of the truth, in God the Father, and in his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and in the Holy Spirit, greeting, placed, brother, as we are among various and manifold sorrows, on account of the present desolations of many brethren throughout almost the whole world, this chief consolation has reached us, that we have been lifted up by the receipt of your letter, and have gathered some alleviation for the griefs of our saddened spirit, from which we can already perceive that the grace of divine providence wished to keep us so long shut up in the prison chains, perhaps for no other reason than that, instructed and more vigorously animated by your letter, we might with a more earnest will attain to the destined crown for your letter has shown upon us as a calm in the midst of a tempest and as the longed-for tranquillity in the midst of a troubled sea and as repose in labors as health in dangers and pains as in the densest darkness the bright and glowing light thus we drank it up with a thirsty spirit and received it with a hungry desire, so that we rejoice to find ourselves by it sufficiently fed and strengthened for encounter with the foe. The Lord will reward you for that love of yours, and will restore you the fruit due to this so good work. For he who exhorts is not less worthy of the reward of the crown than he who suffers. Not less worthy of praise is he who has taught than he who has acted also he is not less to be honored 
who has warned than he who has fought, except that sometimes the weight of glory more redounds to him who trains than to him who has shown himself a teachable learner, for the latter, perchance, would not have had what he has practiced unless the former had taught him. Therefore, again, we say, Brother Cyprian, we have received great joy, great comfort, great refreshment, especially in that you have described with glorious and deserved praises the glorious, I will not say, deaths, but immortalities of martyrs. For such departures should have been proclaimed with such words, that the things which were related might be told in such manner as they were done. Thus, from your letter, we saw those glorious triumphs of the martyrs, and with our eyes in some sort have followed them as they went to heaven, and have contemplated them seated among angels, and the powers and dominions of heaven. Moreover, we have in some manner perceived with our ears the Lord giving them the promised testimony in the presence of the Father. It is this, then, which also raises our spirit day by day, and inflames us to the following of the track of such dignity. For what more glorious, or what more blessed, can happen to any man from the divine condensation than to confess the Lord God in death itself, before his very executioners, than among the raging and varied and exquisite tortures of worldly power, even when the body is racked and torn and cut to pieces, to confess Christ, the Son of God, with the Spirit still free, although departing, than to have mounted to heaven with the world left behind, than having forsaken man to stand among the angels, than all worldly impediments being broken through, all ready to stand free in the sight of God, than to enjoy the heavenly kingdom without delay, than to have become an associate of Christ's passion in Christ's name, than to have become by the divine condensation the judge of one's own judge, than to have brought off an unstained conscience from the confession of his name, than to have refused to obey human and sacrilegious laws against the faith, than to have borne witness to the truth with a public testimony, than by dying to have subdued death itself, which is dreaded by all, than by death itself to have attained immortality, than when torn to pieces and tortured by all the instruments of cruelty, to have overcome the torture by the tortures themselves, than by strength of mind to have wrestled with all the agonies of a mangled body, than not to have shuddered at the flow of one's own blood, than to have begun to love one's punishments after having faith to bear them, than to think it an injury to one's life not to have left it. For to this battle, our Lord, as with the trumpet of his gospel, stimulates us when he says, quote, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he that loveth his own soul more than me is not worthy of me, and he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. End quote. And again, quote, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed shall ye be when men shall persecute you and hate you. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for so did their fathers persecute the prophets which were before you. End quote. And again, quote, because ye shall stand before kings and powers, and the brother shall deliver up the brother to death, and the father the son, and he that endureth to the end shall be saved. End quote. And, quote, to him that overcometh will I give to sit on my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down on the throne of my father. End quote. Moreover, the apostle, quote, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, 
or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake are we killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors for him who hath loved us. End quote. When we read these things, and things of the like kind, brought together in the gospel, and feel, as it were, torches placed upon us, with the Lord's words to inflame our faith, we not only do not dread, but we even provoke the enemies of the truth, and we have already conquered the opponents of God by the very fact of our not yielding to them, and have subdued their nefarious laws against the truth. And although we have not yet shed our blood, we are prepared to shed it. Let no one think that this delay of our departure is any clemency, for it obstructs us, it makes a hindrance to our glory, it puts off heaven, it withholds the glorious sight of God. For in a contest of this kind, and in the kind of contest when faith is struggling in the encounter, it is not true clemency to put off martyrs by delay. Entreat, therefore, beloved Cyprian, that of his mercy the Lord will every day more and more arm and adorn every one of us with greater abundance and readiness, and will confirm and strengthen us by the strength of his power, and, as a good captain, will at length bring forth his soldiers, whom he has hitherto trained and proved in the camp of our passion, to the field of the battle set before them. May he hold forth to us the divine arms, those weapons that know not how to be conquered, the breastplate of righteousness, which is never accustomed to be broken, the shield of faith, which cannot be pierced through, the helmet of salvation, which cannot be shattered, and the sword of the Spirit, which has never been wont to be injured. For to whom should we rather commit these things for him to ask for us than to our so glorious bishop as destined victims ask help of the priest? Behold, another joy of ours, that, in the duty of your episcopate, although, in the meantime, you have been, owing to the condition of the times, divided from your brethren, you have frequently confirmed the confessors by your letters, that you have ever afforded necessary supplies from your own just acquisitions, that in all things you have always shown yourself in some sense present, that in no part of your duty have you hung behind as a deserter. But what more strongly stimulated us to a greater joy we cannot be silent upon, but must describe with all the testimony of our voice. For we observe that you have both rebuked with fitting censure and worthily those who, unmindful of their sins, had, with hasty and eager desire, extorted peace from the presbyters in your absence, and those who, without respect for the gospel, had with profane facility granted the holiness of the Lord unto dogs and pearls to swine, although a great crime, and one which has extended with incredible destructiveness, almost over the whole earth, ought only, as you yourself write, to be treated cautiously and with moderation, and the advice of all the bishops, presbyters, deacons, confessors, and even the laymen who abide fast, as in your letters, you yourself also testify, so that, while wishing unseasonably to bring repairs to the ruins, we may not appear to be bringing about other and greater destruction. For where is the divine word left if pardon be so easily granted to sinners? Certainly, their spirits are to be cheered and to be nourished up to the season of their maturity, and they are to be instructed from the holy scriptures how great and surpassing a sin they have committed. Nor let them be animated by the fact that they are many, but rather let them be checked by the fact that they are not few. An unblushing number has never been accustomed to have weight in extenuation of a crime, but shame, modesty, patience, discipline, humility, and subjection, waiting for the judgment of others upon itself, 
and bearing the sentence of others upon its own judgment. This it is which proves penitence. This it is which skins over a deep wound. This it is which raises up the ruins of the fallen spirit and restores them, which quells and restrains the burning vapor of their raging sins. For the physician will not give to the sick the food of healthy bodies, lest the unseasonable nourishment, instead of repressing, should stimulate the power of the raging disease, that is to say, lest what might have been sooner diminished by abstinence, should, through impatience, be prolonged by growing indigestion. Hands, therefore, polluted with impious sacrifices, must be purified with good works, and wretched mouths, defiled with accursed foods, must be purged with words of true penitence, and the spirit must be renewed and consecrated in the recesses of the faithful heart. Let the frequent groanings of the penitence be heard, let faithful tears be shed from the eyes not once only, but again and again, so that those very eyes which wickedly looked upon idols may wash away, with tears that satisfy God, the unlawful things that they had done. Nothing is necessary for diseases but patience. They who are weary and weak wrestle with their pain, and so at length hope for health, if, by tolerating it, they can overcome their suffering. For unfaithful is the scar which the physician has too quickly produced, and the healing is undone by any little casualty, if the remedies be not used faithfully from their very slowness. The flame is quickly recalled again to a conflagration unless the material of the whole fire be extinguished even to the extremest spark so that men of this kind should justly know that even they themselves are more advantaged by the very delay, and that more trusty remedies are applied by the necessary postponement. Besides, where shall it be said that they who confess Christ are shut up in the keeping of a squalid prison if they who have denied him are in no peril of their faith? Where? that they are bound in the cincture of chains in God's name, if they who have not kept the confession of God are not deprived of communion, where that the imprisoned martyrs lay down their glorious lives, if those who have forsaken the faith do not feel the magnitude of their dangers and their sins, but if they betray too much impatience and demand communion with intolerable eagerness, they vainly utter with petulant and unbridled tongues those querulous and invidious reproaches which avail nothing against the truth, since they might have retained by their own right what now by necessity, which they of their own free will have sought, they are compelled to sue for. For the faith which could confess Christ could also have been kept by Christ in communion. We bid you, blessed and most glorious Father, ever heartily farewell in the Lord, and have us in remembrance. End of Epistle 25 Read by David Ronald Epistle 26 of Epistles of Cyprian by Cyprian Translated by Robert Wallace This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Epistle 26 Cyprian to the Lapsed Argument. The argument of this letter is found below in letter 27. They wrote to me, says he, not asking that peace should be granted them, but claiming it for themselves, as already granted, because they say that Paulus has given peace to all, as you will read in their letter of which I have sent you a copy, together with what I briefly replied to them. But the letter of the lapsed to which he is replying is wanting. Our Lord, whose precepts and admonitions we ought to observe, describing the honor of a bishop and the order of his church, speaks in the gospel, and says to Peter, I say unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock will I build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, and I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, 
and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Thence, through the changes of times and successions, the ordering of bishops and the plan of the church flows on words, so that the church is founded upon the bishops, and every act of the church is controlled by these same rulers. Since this, then, is founded on the divine law, I marvel that some, with daring temerity, have chosen to write to me as if they wrote in the name of the church, when the church is established in the bishop and the clergy, and all who stand fast in the faith. For far be it from the mercy of God and his uncontrolled might to suffer the number of the lapse to be called the church, since it is written, God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. For we indeed desire that all may be made alive, and we pray that, by our supplications and groans, they may be restored to their original state. But if certain lapsed ones claim to be the church, and if the church be among them, and in them, what is left for us but to ask of these very persons that they would deign to admit us into the church? Therefore it behooves them to be submissive and quiet and modest as those who ought to appease God in remembrance of their sin and not to write letters in the name of the church when they should rather be aware that they are writing to the church. But some have lately written to me who are of the lapsed, and are humble, and meek, and trembling, and fearing God, and who have always labored in the church gloriously and liberally, and who have never made a boast of their labor to the Lord, knowing that he had said, When ye shall have done all these things, say, We are unprofitable servants, we have done that which was our duty to do. Thinking of which things, and although they had received certificates from the martyrs, Nevertheless, that their satisfaction might be admitted by the Lord, these persons beseeching have written to me that they acknowledge their sin and are truly repentant, and do not hurry rashly or importunately to secure peace, but that they are waiting for my presence, saying that even peace itself, if they should receive it when I was present, would be sweeter to them. How greatly I congratulate these! The Lord is my witness, who hath condescended to tell what such and such kind of servants deserve of his kindness, which letters, as I lately received, and now read, that you have written very differently, I beg that you will discriminate between your wishes and whoever you are who have sent this letter, add your names to the certificate, and transmit the certificate to me with your several names, for I must first know to whom I have to reply, then I will respond to each of the matters that you have written, having regard to the mediocrity of my place and conduct. I bid you, beloved brethren, ever heartily farewell, and live quietly and tranquilly, according to the Lord's discipline. Fare ye well. End of Epistle 26 by Cyprian Read by David Ronald Epistle 27 of Epistles of Cyprian by Cyprian, translated by Robert Wallace. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Epistle 27 to the Presbyters and Deacons. Argument. The argument of this letter is sufficiently in agreement with the preceding, and it appears that it is the one of which he speaks in the following letter, for he praises his clergy for having rejected from communion Gaius of Dida, a presbyter, and his deacon, who rashly communicated with the lapsed, and exhorts them to do the same with certain others. Cyprian, to the presbyters and deacons, his brethren, greeting. You have done uprightly, and with discipline, beloved brethren, that, by the advice of my colleagues who were present, you have decided not to communicate with Gaius the presbyter of Dida, and his deacon, who, by communicating with the lapsed and offering their oblations, have been frequently taken in their wicked errors, and who once and again, as you wrote to me, when warned by my colleagues not to do this, have persisted obstinately in their presumption and audacity, deceiving certain brethren also from among our people, whose benefit we desire with all humility to consult, and whose salvation we take care for, not with affected adulation, but with sincere faith, 
that they may supplicate the Lord with true penitence and groaning and sorrow, since it is written, quote, Remember from whence thou art fallen, and repent. End quote. And again, the divine scripture says, quote, Thus saith the Lord, When thou shalt be converted and lament, then thou shalt be saved, and shalt know where thou hast been. End quote. Yet how can those mourn and repent, whose groanings and tears some of the presbyters obstruct, when they rashly think that they may be communicated with, not knowing that it is written, quote, They who call you happy cause you to err, and destroy the path of your feet. End quote. Naturally, our wholesome and true counsels have no success, whilst the salutary truth is hindered by mischievous blandishments and flatteries, and the wounded and unhealthy mind of the lapse suffers what those also who are bodily diseased and sick often suffer, that while they refuse wholesome food and beneficial drink as bitter and distasteful, and crave those things which seem to please them and to be sweet for the present, they are inviting to themselves mischief and death by their regardlessness and intemperance. Nor does the true remedy of the skillful physician avail to their safety, whilst the sweet enticement is deceiving with its charms. Do you, therefore, according to my letters, take counsel about this faithfully and wholesomely, and do not recede from better counsels, and be careful to read these same letters to my colleagues also, if there are any present, or if any should come to you, that, with unanimity and concord, we may maintain a healthful plan for soothing and healing the wounds of the lapsed, intending to deal very fully with all when, by the Lord's mercy, we shall begin to assemble together. In the meantime, if any unrestrained and impetuous person, whether of our presbyters or deacons or of strangers, should dare, before our decree, to communicate with the lapsed, let him be expelled from our communion, and plead the cause of his rashness before all of us when, by the Lord's permission, we shall assemble together again. Moreover, you wished me to reply what I thought concerning Philomenus and Fortunatus, subdeacons, and Favorinus, an acolyte, who retired in the midst of the time of trial, and have now returned of which thing I cannot make myself sole judge, since many of the clergy are still absent, and have not considered, even thus late, that they should return to their place, and this case of each one must be considered separately and fully investigated, not only with my colleagues, but also with the whole of the people themselves. For a matter which hereafter may constitute an example as regards the ministers of the church must be weighed and adjudged with careful deliberation. In the meanwhile, let them only abstain from the monthly division, not so as to seem to be deprived of the ministry of the church, but that all matters being in a sound state, they may be reserved till my coming. I bid you, beloved brethren, ever heartily farewell. Greet all the brotherhood, and fare ye well. End of Epistle 27 Read by David Ronald Epistle 28 of Epistles of Cyprian by Cyprian. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Epistle 28 to the Presbyters and Deacons abiding at Rome. Argument. The Roman clergy are informed of the temerity of the lapsed who are demanding peace. Cyprian to the Presbyters and Deacons abiding at Rome, his brethren. Greeting. Both our common love and the reason of the thing demand beloved brethren that i should keep back from your knowledge nothing of those matters which are transacted among us that so we may have a common plan for the advantage of the administration of the church for after i wrote to you the letter which i sent by satyrus the reader and optatus the subdeacon the combined temerity of certain of the lapsed who refused to repent and to make satisfaction to god wrote to me not asking that peace might be given to them, but claiming it is already given, because they say that Paulus has given peace to all, as you will read in their letter of which I have sent you a copy, as well as what I briefly replied to them in the meantime, but that you may also know what sort of a letter I afterwards wrote to the clergy, 
I have, moreover, sent you a copy of this. But if, after all, their temerity should not be repressed, either by my letters or by yours, and should not yield to wholesome counsels, I shall take such proceedings as the Lord, according to his gospel, has enjoined to be taken. I bid you, beloved brethren, ever heartily farewell. End of Epistle 28 of Cyprian Read by David Ronald Epistle 29 of Epistles of Cyprian by Cyprian Translated by Robert Wallace This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Epistle 29 The Presbyters and Deacons Abiding at Rome to Cyprian Argument the Roman Church declares its judgment concerning the lapse to be in agreement with the Carthaginian decrees. Any indulgence shown to the lapsed is required to be in accordance with the law of the gospel, that the peace granted by the confessors depends only upon grace and goodwill, is manifest from the fact that the lapsed are referred to the bishops. The seditious demand for peace made by Felicimus is to be attributed to faction. The presbyters and deacons abiding at Rome to Father Cyprian, greeting. When, beloved brother, we carefully read your letter which you had sent by Fortunatus, the subdeacon, we were smitten with a double sorrow, and disordered with a twofold grief, that there was not any rest given to you in such necessities of the persecution, and that the unreasonable petulance of the lapsed brethren was declared to be carried even to a dangerous boldness of expression. But although those things which we have spoken of severely afflicted us and our spirit, yet your vigor and the severity that you have used according to the proper discipline moderates the so heavy load of our grief, in that you rightly restrain the wickedness of some, and, by your exhortation to repentance, show the legitimate way of salvation." that they should have wished to hurry to such an extreme as this we are indeed considerably surprised as that with such urgency and at so unseasonable and bitter a time being in so great and excessive a sin they should not so much ask for as claim peace for themselves nay should say that they already have it in heaven if they have it why do they ask for what they possess but if, by the very fact that they are asking for it, it is proved that they have it not, wherefore do they not accept the judgment of those from whom they have thought fit to ask for the peace, which they certainly have not got? But if they think that they have from any other source the prerogative of communion, let them try to compare it with the gospel, that so at length it may abundantly avail them, if it is not out of harmony with the gospel law." But on what principle can that give gospel communion which seems to be established contrary to gospel truth? For since every prerogative contemplates the privilege of association precisely on the assumption of its not being out of harmony with the will of him with whom it seeks to be associated, then, because this is alien from his will with whom it seeks to be associated, it must of necessity lose the indulgence and privilege of the association. Let them, then, see what it is they are trying to do in this matter. For if they say that the gospel has established one decree, but the martyrs have established another, then they, setting the martyrs at variance with the gospel, will be in danger on both sides. For, on the one hand, the majesty of the gospel will already appear shattered and cast down if it can be overcome by the novelty of another decree. And, on the other, the glorious crown of confession will be taken from the heads of the martyrs if they be not found to have attained it by the observation of that gospel whence they become martyrs, so that, reasonably, no one should be more careful to determine nothing contrary to the gospel than he who strives to receive the name of martyr from the gospel. We should like, besides, to be informed of this, if martyrs become martyrs for no other reason than that by not sacrificing they may keep the peace of the church even to the shedding of their own blood, lest, overcome by the suffering of the torture, by losing peace they might lose salvation, 
on what principle do they think that the salvation which if they had sacrificed they thought that they should not have was to be given to those who are said to have sacrificed although they ought to maintain that law in others which they themselves appear to have held before their own eyes in which thing we observe that they have put forward against their own cause the very thing which they thought made for them for if the martyrs thought that peace was to be granted to them why did not they themselves grant it why did they think that as they themselves say they were to be referred to the bishops for he who orders a thing to be done can assuredly do that which he orders to be done but as we understand nay as the case itself speaks and proclaims the most holy martyrs thought that a proper measure of modesty and of truth must be observed on both sides for as they were urged by many in remitting them to the bishop they conceived that they would consult their own modesty so as to be no further disquieted and in not themselves holding communion with them they judged that the purity of the gospel law ought to be maintained unimpaired but of your charity brother never desist from soothing the spirits of the lapsed and affording to the erring the medicine of truth although the temper of the sick is wont to reject the kind offices of those who would heal them this wound of the lapsed is as yet fresh and the sore is still rising into a tumour and therefore we are certain that when in the course of a more protracted time that urgency of theirs shall have worn out they will love that very delay which refers them to a faithful medicine if only there be not those who arm them for their own danger and instructing them perversely demand on their behalf instead of the salutary remedies of delay the fatal poisons of a premature communion for we do not believe that without the instigation of certain persons they would all have dared so petulantly to claim peace for themselves we know the faith of the carthaginian church we know her training we know her humility whence also we have marvelled that we should observe certain things somewhat rudely suggested against you by letter although we have often become aware of your mutual love and charity in many illustrations of reciprocal affection of one another it is time therefore that they should repent of their fault that they should prove their grief for the lapse that they should show modesty that they should manifest humility that they should exhibit some shame that by their submission they should appeal to god's clemency for themselves and by due honour for god's priest should draw forth upon themselves the divine mercy how vastly better would have been the letters of these men themselves if the prayers of those who stood fast had been aided by their own humility since that which is asked for is more easily obtained when he for whom it is asked is worthy that what is asked should be obtained in respect however of privatus of limbessa you have acted as you usually do in desiring to inform us of the matter as being an object of anxiety for it becomes us all to watch for the body of the whole church whose members are scattered through every various province but the deceitfulness of that crafty man could not be hid from us even before we had your letters for previously when from the company of that very wickedness a certain futurist came a standard-bearer of privatus and was desirous of fraudulently obtaining letters from us we were neither ignorant who he was nor did he get the letters which he wanted we bid you farewell in the lord End of Epistle 29, read by David Ronald. Epistle 30 of Epistles of Cyprian by Cyprian, translated by Robert Wallace. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Epistle 30, the Roman clergy to Cyprian. Argument. The Roman clergy enter into the matters which they had spoken of in the foregoing letter more fully and substantially in the present one replying moreover to another letter of cyprian which is thought not to be extant and from which they quote a few words by the way also they thank cyprian for his letters sent to the roman confessors and martyrs 
this letter was written, as were also the others of the Roman clergy during the vacancy of the see after the death of Fabian, to Father Cyprian, the presbyters and deacons abiding at Rome, greeting, although a mind conscience to itself of uprightness and relying on the vigor of evangelical discipline and made a true witness to itself in the heavenly decrees is accustomed to be satisfied with God for its only judge and neither to seek the praises nor to dread the charges of any other yet those are worthy of double praise who knowing that they owe their conscience to God alone as the judge yet desire their doings should be approved also by their brethren themselves it is no wonder brother cyprian that you should do this who with your usual modesty and inborn industry have wished that we should be found not so much judges of as sharers in your counsels so that we might find praise with you in your doings while we approve them and might be able to be fellow heirs with you in your good counsels because we entirely accord with them in the same way we are all thought to have labored in that in which we are all regarded as allied in the same agreement of censure and discipline for what is there either in peace so suitable or in a war of persecution so necessary as to maintain the due severity of the divine vigor which he who resists will of necessity wander in the unsteady course of affairs and will be tossed hither and thither by the various and uncertain storm of things and the helm of counsel being as it were wrenched from his hands he will drive the ship of the church's safety among the rocks so that it would appear that the church's safety can be no otherwise secured than by repelling any who set themselves against it as adverse waves and by maintaining the ever guarded rule of discipline itself as if it were the rudder of safety in the tempest nor is it now but lately that this counsel has been considered by us nor have these sudden appliances against the wicked but recently occurred to us but this is read of among us as the ancient severity the ancient faith the ancient discipline since the apostle would not have published such praise concerning us when he said quote, that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world end quote. unless already from thence that vigor had borrowed the roots of faith from those times from which praise and glory it is a very great crime to have become degenerate for it is less disgraced never to have attained to the heraldry of praise than to have fallen from the height of praise it is a smaller crime not to have been honored with a good testimony than to have lost the honor of good testimonies it is less discredit to have lain without the announcement of virtues ignoble without praise than disinherited of the faith to have lost our proper praises for those things which are proclaimed to the glory of any one unless they are maintained by anxious and careful pains swell up into the odium of the greatest crime that we are not saying this dishonestly our former letters have proved wherein we have declared our opinion to you with a very plain statement both against those who had betrayed themselves as unfaithful by the unlawful presentation of wicked certificates as if they thought that they would escape those ensnaring nets of the devil whereas not less than if they had approached to the wicked altars they were held fast by the very fact that they had testified to him and against those who had used those certificates when made although they had not been present when they were made since they had certainly asserted their presence by ordering that they should be so written for he is not guiltless of wickedness who has bidden it to be done nor is he unconcerned in the crime with whose consent it is publicly spoken of although it was not committed by him and since the whole mystery of the faith is understood to be contained in the confession of the name of christ he who seeks for deceitful tricks to excuse himself has denied christ and he who wants to appear to have satisfied either edicts or laws put forth against the gospel has obeyed those edicts by the very fact by which he wished to appear to have obeyed them moreover also we have declared our faith and consent against those too who have polluted their hands and their mouths with unlawful sacrifices whose own minds were before polluted whence also their very hands and mouths were polluted also far be it from the roman church to slacken her vigor with so profane a facility 
and to loosen the nerves of her severity by overthrowing the majesty of faith, so that, when the wrecks of your ruined brethren are still not only lying, but are falling around, remedies of a too hasty kind, and certainly not likely to avail, should be afforded for communion, and by a false mercy new wounds should be impressed on the old wounds of their transgression, so that even repentance should be snatched from these wretched beings to their greater overthrow. For where can the medicine of indulgence profit, if even the physician himself, by intercepting repentance, makes easy way for new dangers, if he only hides the wound and does not suffer the necessary remedy of time to close the scar. This is not to cure, but, if we wish to speak the truth, to slay. Nevertheless, you have letters agreeing with our letters from the confessors, whom the dignity of their confession has still shut up here in prison, and whom, for the gospel contest, their faith has once already crowned in a glorious confession, letters wherein they have maintained the severity of the gospel discipline and have revoked the unlawful petitions so that they might not be a disgrace to the church unless they had done this the ruins of gospel discipline would not easily be restored especially since it was to none so fitting to maintain the tenor of evangelical vigor unimpaired and its dignity as to those who had given themselves up to be tortured and cut to pieces by raging men on behalf of the gospel, that they might not deservingly forfeit the honor of martyrdom, if, on the occasion of martyrdom, they had wished to be betrayers of the gospel. For he who does not guard what he has, in that condition whereon he possesses it, by violating the condition whereon he possesses it, loses what he possessed in which matter we ought to give you also, and we do give you, abundant thanks that you have brightened the darkness of their prison by your letters, that you came to them in whatever way you could enter, that you refreshed their minds, robust in their own faith and confession, by your addresses and letters, that, following up their felicities with worthy praises, you have inflamed them to a much more ardent desire of heavenly glory, that you urged them forward, that you animated, by the power of your discourse, those who, as we believe and hope, will be victors by and by, so that although all may seem to come from the faith of those who confess, and from the divine mercy, yet they seem in their martyrdom to have become in some sort debtors to you. But once more, to return to the point whence our discourse appears to have digressed, you shall find subjoined the sort of letters that we also sent to Sicily, although upon us is incumbent a greater necessity of delaying this affair, having, since the departure of Fabian, of most noble memory, had no bishop appointed as yet, on account of the difficulties of affairs and times, who can arrange all things of this kind, and who can take account of those who are lapsed with authority and wisdom. However, what you also have yourself declared in so important a matter is satisfactory to us that the peace of the church must first be maintained, then that an assembly for council being gathered together with bishops, presbyters, deacons, and confessors, as well as with the lady who stand fast, we should deal with the case of the lapsed. For it seems extremely invidious and burdensome to examine into what seems to have been committed by many, except by the advice of many, or that one should give a sentence when so great a crime is known to have gone forth, and to be diffused among so many, since that cannot be a firm decree which shall not appear to have had the consent of very many. Look upon almost the whole world devastated, and observe that the remains and the ruins of the fallen are lying about on every side, and consider that therefore an extent of counsel is asked for, large in proportion as the crime appears to be widely propagated. Let not the medicine be less than the wound, let not the remedies be fewer than the deaths, that in the same manner as those who fell, fell for this reason that they were too incautious with a blind rashness, so those who strive to set in order this mischief should use every moderation in counsels, lest anything done as it ought not to be should, as it were, be judged by all of no effect. Thus, with one in the same council, with the same prayers and tears, let us, 
who up to the present time seem to have escaped the destruction of these times of ours, as well as those who appear to have fallen into the calamities of the time, entreat the divine majesty and ask peace for the church's name. With mutual prayers, let us by turns cherish, guard, arm one another. Let us pray for the lapsed, that they may be raised up. Let us pray for those who stand, that they may not be tempted to such a degree as to be destroyed. Let us pray that those who are said to have fallen may acknowledge the greatness of their sin, and may perceive that it needs no momentary nor over-hasty cure. Let us pray that penitents may follow also the effects of the pardon of the lapsed, that so, when they have understood their own crime, they may be willing to have patience with us for a while and no longer disturb the fluctuating condition of the church, lest they may seem themselves to have inflamed an internal persecution for us, and the fact of their unquietness be added to the heap of their sins. For modesty is very greatly fitting for them, in whose sins it is an immodest mind that is condemned. Let them indeed knock at the doors, but assuredly let them not break them down. Let them present themselves at the threshold of the church, but certainly let them not leap over it. Let them watch at the gates of the heavenly camp, but let them be armed with modesty, by which they perceive that they have been deserters. Let them resume the trumpet of their prayers, but let them not therewith sound a point of war. Let them arm themselves indeed with the weapons of modesty, and let them resume the shield of faith, which they have put off by their denial through the fear of death, but let those that are even now armed believe that they are armed against their foe, the devil, not against the church which grieves over their fall. A modest petition will much avail them, a bashful entreaty, a necessary humility, a patience which is not careless. Let them send tears as their ambassadors for their sufferings. Let groanings brought forth from their deepest heart discharge the office of advocate, and prove their grief and shame for the crime they have committed. Nay, if they shudder at the magnitude of the guilt incurred, if with a truly medicinal hand they deal with the deadly wound of their heart and conscience and the deep recesses of the subtle mischief, let them blush even to ask, except, again, that it is a matter of greater risk and shame not to have besought the aid of peace. But let all this be in the sacrament, in the law of their very entreaty, let consideration be had for the time. Let it be, with downcast entreaty, with subdued petition, since he also who is besought ought to be bent, not provoked. And as the divine clemency ought to be looked to, so also ought the divine censure. And as it is written, quote, I forgave thee all that debt, because thou desirest me. End quote. So it is written, quote, Whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my father and before his angels. End quote. For God, as he is merciful, so he exacts obedience to his precepts, and indeed carefully exacts it. And as he invites to the banquet, so the man that hath not a wedding garment, he binds hands and feet, and casts him out beyond the assembly of saints. He has prepared heaven, but he has also prepared hell. He has prepared places of refreshment, but he has also prepared eternal punishment. He has prepared the light that none can approach unto, but he has also prepared the vast and eternal gloom of perpetual night. Desiring to maintain the moderation of this middle course in these matters, we for a long time, and indeed many of us, and, moreover, with some of the bishops who are near to us and within reach, and some whom, placed afar off, the heat of the persecution had driven out from other provinces, have thought that nothing new was to be done before the appointment of a bishop. But we believe that the care of the lapsed must be moderately dealt with, so that, in the meantime, whilst the grant of a bishop is withheld from us by God, the cause of such as are able to bear the delays of postponement should be kept in suspense. But if such an impending death does not suffer to bear the delay, having repented and professed a detestation of their deeds with frequency, if with tears, if with groans, if with weeping, they have betrayed the signs of a grieving and truly penitent spirit, when there remains, as far as man can tell, no hope of living, to them finally, 
such cautious and careful help should be ministered god himself knowing what he will do with such and in what way he will examine the balance of his judgment while we however take anxious care that neither ungodly men should praise our smooth facility nor truly penitent men accuse our severity as cruel we bid you most blessed and glorious father ever heartily farewell in the lord and have us in memory end of epistle thirty read by david ronald epistle thirty one of epistles of cyprian by cyprian this librivox recording is in the public domain epistle thirty one to the carthaginian clergy about the letters sent to rome and received thence argument the carthaginian clergy are requested to take care that the letters of the roman clergy and cyprian's answer are communicated cyprian to the presbyters and deacons his brethren greeting that you my beloved brethren might know what letters i have sent to the clergy acting at rome and what they have replied to me and moreover what moises and maximus the presbyters and rufinus and nicostratus deacons and the rest of the confessors that with them are kept in prison replied likewise to my letters i have sent you copies to read do you take care with as much diligence as you can that what i have written and what they have replied be made known to our brethren and moreover if any bishops from foreign places my colleagues or presbyters or deacons should be present or should arrive among you let them hear all these matters from you and if they wish to transcribe copies of the letters and to take them to their own people let them have the opportunity of transcribing them although i have moreover bidden satyrus the reader our brother to give liberty of copying them to any individuals who wish it so that in ordering for the present the condition of the church in any manner an agreement one and faithful may be observed by all but about the other matters which were to be dealt with as i have written to several of my colleagues we will more fully consider them in a common council when by the lord's permission we shall begin to assemble into one place. I bid you, brethren, beloved and longed for, ever heartily farewell. Salute the brotherhood. Fare ye well. End of Epistle 31 by Cyprian Read by David Ronald Epistle 32 of Cyprian by Cyprian This LibriVox recording is in the public domain epistle thirty two to the clergy and people about the ordination of aurelius as a reader argument cyprian tells the clergy and people that aurelius the confessor has been ordained a reader by him and commends by the way the constancy of his virtue and his mind whereby he was even deserving of a higher degree in the church cyprian to the elders and deacons and to the whole people greeting in ordinations of the clergy beloved brethren we usually consult you beforehand and weigh the character and deserts of individuals with the general advice but human testimonies must not be waited for when the divine approval proceeds aurelius our brother an illustrious youth already approved by the lord and dear to god in years still very young but in the praise of virtue and of faith advanced inferior in the natural abilities of his age but superior in the honour he has gained has contended here in a double conflict having twice confessed and twice been glorious in the victory of his confession both when he conquered in the course and was banished and when at length he fought in a severer conflict he was triumphant and victorious in the battle of suffering as often as the adversary wished to call forth the servants of god so often this prompt and brave soldier both fought and conquered it had been a slight matter previously to have engaged under the eyes of a few when he was banished he deserved also in the forum to engage with a more illustrious virtue so that after overcoming the magistrates he might also triumph over the proconsul and after exile 
might vanquish tortures also nor can i discover what ought to speak most of in him the glory of his wounds or the modesty of his character that he is distinguished by the honour of his virtue or praiseworthy for the admirableness of his bashfulness he is both so excellent in dignity and so lowly in humility that it seems that he is divinely reserved as one who should be an example to the rest for ecclesiastical discipline of the way in which the servants of god should in confession conquer by their courage and after confession be conspicuous for their character such an one to be estimated not by his years but by his deserts merited higher degrees of clerical ordination and larger increase but in the meantime i judge it well that he should begin with the office of reading because nothing is more suitable for the voice which has confessed the lord in a glorious utterance than to sound him forth in the solemn repetition of the divine lessons then after the sublime words which spoke out the witness of christ to read the gospel of christ whence martyrs are made to come to the desk after the scaffold there to have been conspicuous to the multitude of the gentiles here to be beheld by the brethren there to have been heard with the wonder of the surrounding people here to be heard with the joy of the brotherhood no then most beloved brethren that this man has been ordained by me and by my colleagues who were then present i know that you will both gladly welcome these tidings and that you desire that as many such as possible may be ordained in our church and since joy is always hasty and gladness can bear no delay he reads on the lord's day in the meantime for me that is he has made a beginning of peace by solemnly entering on his office of a reader do you frequently be urgent in supplications and assist my prayers by yours that the lord's mercy favoring us may soon restore both the priest safe to his people and the martyr for a reader with the priest i bid you beloved brethren in god the father and in jesus christ ever heartily farewell End of Epistle 32 by Cyprian, read by David Ronald. Epistle 33 of Epistles of Cyprian by Cyprian. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Epistle 33 to the clergy and people about the ordination of Celerinus as reader. Argument. This letter is about the same in purport with the preceding except that he largely commends the constancy of celerinus in his confession of the faith moreover that both of these letters were written during his retreat is sufficiently indicated by the very circumstances of the context cyprian to the presbyters and deacons and to the whole people his brethren in the lord greeting the divine benefits beloved brethren should be acknowledged and embraced wherewith the lord has condescended to embellish and illustrate his church in our times by granting a respite to his good confessors and his glorious martyrs that they who had grandly confessed christ should afterwards adorn christ's clergy in ecclesiastical ministries exalt therefore and rejoice with me on receiving my letter wherein i and my colleagues who were then present mention to you celerinus our brother glorious alike for his courage and his character as added to our clergy not by human recommendation but by divine condensation who when he hesitated to yield to the church was constrained by her own admonition and exhortation in a vision by night not to refuse our persuasions and she had more power and constrained him because it was not right nor was it becoming that he should be without ecclesiastical honour whom the lord honoured with the dignity of heavenly glory this man was the first in the struggle of our days he was the leader among christ's soldiers he in the midst of burning beginnings of the persecution engaged with the very chief and author of the disturbance 
in conquering with invincible firmness the adversary of his own conflict. He made a way for others to conquer, a victor with no small amount of wounds, but triumphant, by a miracle, with the long abiding and permanent penalties of a tedious conflict. For nineteen days, shut up in the close guard of a dungeon, he was racked and in irons, but, although his body was laid in chains, his spirit remained free and at liberty. His flesh wasted away by the long endurance of hunger and thirst, but God fed his soul that lived in faith and virtue with spiritual nourishments. He lay in punishments, the stronger for his punishments, imprisoned, greater than those that imprisoned him, lying prostrate, but loftier than those who stood, as bound and firmer than the links which bound him, judged and more sublime than those who judged him. And although his feet were bound on the rack, yet the serpent was trodden on and ground down and vanquished. In his glorious body shine the bright evidences of his wounds, their traces manifested, glow forth and appear on the man's sinews and limbs, worn out with tedious wasting away. Great things are they, marvelous things are they, which the brotherhood may hear of his virtues and of his praises. And should any one appear like Thomas, who has little faith in what he hears, the faith of the eyes is not wanting, so that what one hears he may also see. In the servant of God the glory of the wounds made the victory, the memory of the scars preserves that glory. Nor is that kind of title to glories in the case of Celerinus, our beloved, an unfamiliar and novel thing. He is advancing in the footsteps of his kindred. He rivals his parents and relations in equal honors of divine condensation. His grandmother, Celerina, was some time since crowned with martyrdom. Moreover, his paternal and maternal uncles, Laurentius and Ignatius, who themselves also were once warring in the camps of the world, but were true and spiritual soldiers of God, casting down the devil by the confession of Christ, merited palms and crowns from the Lord by their illustrious passion. We always offer sacrifices for them, as you remember, as often as we celebrate the passions and days of the martyrs in the annual commemoration. Nor could he, therefore, be degenerate and inferior, whom this family, dignity, and a generous nobility provoked by domestic examples of virtue and faith. But if, in a worldly family, it is a matter of heraldry and of praise to be a patrician, of how much greater praise and honor is it to become of noble rank in the celestial heraldry? I cannot tell whom I should call more blessed, whether those ancestors for a posterity so illustrious, or him for an origin so glorious. So equally between them does the divine condensation flow, and pass to and fro, that, just as the dignity of their offspring brightens their crown, so the sublimity of his ancestry illuminates his glory. When this man, beloved brethren, came to us with such condensation of the Lord, illustrious by the testimony and wonder of the very man who had persecuted him, what else behooved to be done, except that he should be placed on the desk, that is, on the tribunal of the church, that, resting on the loftiness of a higher station and conspicuous to the whole people for the brightness of his honor, he should read the precepts and gospel of the Lord, which he so bravely and faithfully follows. Let the voice that has confessed the Lord daily be heard in those things which the Lord spoke. Let it be seen whether there is any further degree to which he can be advanced in the church. There is nothing in which a confessor can do more good to the brethren than that, while the reading of the gospel is heard from his lips, every one who hears should imitate the faith of the reader. He should have been associated with Aurelius in reading, with whom, moreover, he was associated in the alliance of divine honor, with whom, in all the insignia of virtue and praise, he had been united, equal both and each like to the other, in proportion as they were sublime in glory, in that proportion they were humbled in modesty, 
as they were lifted up by divine condensation so they were lowly in their own peacefulness and tranquillity and equally affording examples to every one of virtues and character and fitted both for conflict and for peace praiseworthy in the former for strength and the latter for modesty in such servants the lord rejoices in confessors of this kind he glories whose way and conversation is so advantageous to the announcement of their glory that it affords to others a teaching of discipline for this purpose christ has willed them to remain long here in the church for this purpose he has kept them safe snatched from the midst of death a kind of resurrection so to speak being wrought on their behalf so that while nothing is seen by the brethren loftier in honour nothing more lowly in humility the way of life of the brotherhood may accompany these same persons know then that these for the present are appointed readers because it was fitting that the candle should be placed in a candlestick whence it may give light to all and that their glorious countenances should be established in a higher place where beheld by all the surrounding brotherhood they may give an incitement of glory to the beholders but know that i have already purposed the honour of the presbytery for them that so they may be honoured with the same presence as the presbyters and may share the monthly divisions in equal quantities to sit with us hereafter in their advanced and strengthened years although in nothing can he seem to be inferior in the qualities of age who has consummated his age by the dignity of his glory i bid you brethren beloved and earnestly longed for ever heartily farewell End of Epistle 33 by Cyprian, read by David Ronald. Epistle 34 of Epistles of Cyprian by Cyprian. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Epistle 34 to the same about the ordination of Numidicus as presbyter. Argument. Cyprian tells the clergy and people that Numidicus has been ordained by him presbyter and briefly commends his worth. Cyprian, to the presbyters and deacons, and to the whole people, his brethren, very dear and longed for, greeting, that which belongs, dearest brethren, both to the common joy and to the greatest glory of our church, ought to be told to you, for you must know that I have been admonished and instructed by divine condensation that Numidicus, the presbyter, should be appointed in the number of Carthaginian presbyters, and should sit with us among the clergy, a man illustrious by the brightest light of confession, exalted in the honor both of virtue and of faith, who by his exhortation sent before himself an abundant number of martyrs slain by stones and by the flames, and who beheld with joy his wife abiding by his side, burned, I should rather say, preserved, together with the rest. He himself, half consumed, overwhelmed with stones, and left for dead, when afterwards his daughter, with the anxious consideration of affection, sought for the corpse of her father, was found half dead, was drawn out and revived, and remained unwillingly from among the companions whom he himself had sent before but the reason of his remaining behind as we see was this that the lord might add him to our clergy and might adorn with glorious priests the number of our presbyters that had been desolated by the lapse of some and when god permits he shall be advanced to a larger office in his region when by the lord's protection we have come into your presence once more in the meantime let what is revealed be done that we receive this gift of god with thanksgiving hoping from the lord's mercy more ornaments of the same kind that so the strength of his church being renewed he may make men so meek and lowly to flourish in honour of our assembly i bid you brethren very dear and longed for ever heartily farewell End of Epistle 34 of Cyprian Read by David Ronald Epistle 35 
of Epistles of Cyprian by Cyprian. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Epistle 35. To the Clergy Concerning the Care of the Poor and Strangers. Argument. He cautions them against neglecting the widows, the sick, or the poor, or strangers. Cyprian. To the presbyters and deacons, his beloved brethren, greeting. In safety, by God's grace, I greet you, beloved brethren, desiring soon to come to you, and to satisfy the wish, as well of myself and you, as of all the brethren. It behooves me also, however, to have regard to the common peace, and, in the meantime, although with weariness of spirit to be absent from you, lest my presence should provoke the jealousy and violence of the heathens, and I should be the cause of breaking the peace, who ought rather to be careful for the quiet of all. When, therefore, you write that matters are arranged, and that I ought to come, or if the Lord should condescend to intimate it to me before, then I will come to you. For where could I be better or more joyful than there where the Lord willed me both to believe and to grow up in honor. I request that you will diligently take care of the widows and of the sick and of all the poor. Moreover, you may supply the expenses for strangers, if any should be indignant for my own portion, which I have left with Rogatianus, our fellow presbyter, which portion, lest it should be all appropriated, I have supplemented by sending to the same by Narcissus the acolyte, another share, so that the sufferers may be more largely and promptly dealt with. I bid you, beloved brethren, ever heartily farewell, and have me in remembrance. Greet your brotherhood in my name, and tell them to be mindful of me. End of Epistle 35 by Cyprian Read by David Ronald Epistle 36 of Epistles of Cyprian by Cyprian. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Epistle 36. To the clergy, bidding them show every kindness to the confessors in prison. Argument. He exhorts his clergy that every kindness and care should be exercised towards the confessors, as well towards those who were alive, as those who died in prison that the days of their death should be carefully noted for the purpose of celebrating their memory annually, and finally, that they should not forget the poor also. Cyprian, to the presbyters and deacons, his brethren, greeting. Although I know, dearest brethren, that you have frequently been admonished in my letters to manifest all care for those who with a glorious voice have confessed the Lord and are confined in prison, Yet again, and again, I urge it upon you, that no consideration be wanting to them, to whose glory there is nothing wanting. And I wish that the circumstances of the place, and of my station, would permit me to present myself at this time with them. Promptly, and gladly, would I fulfill all the duties of love towards our most courageous brethren in my appointed ministry. But I beseech you, let your diligence be the representative of my duty, and do all those things which behoove to be done in respect of those whom the divine condensation has rendered illustrious in such merits of their faith and virtue. Let there be also a more zealous watchfulness and care bestowed upon the bodies of all those who, although they were not tortured in prison, yet depart thence by the glorious exit of death, for neither is their virtue nor their honor too little for them also to be allied with the blessed martyrs. As far as they could, they bore whatever they were prepared and equipped to bear. He who, under the eyes of God, has offered himself to tortures and to death, has suffered whatever he was willing to suffer. For it was not he that was wanting to the tortures, but the tortures that were wanting to him. Quote, Whosoever shall confess me before men, him will I also confess before my Father which is in heaven. End quote. Saith the Lord, they have confessed him. Quote, he that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. End quote. Saith the Lord, 
they have endured and have carried the uncorrupted and unstained merits of their virtues through even unto the end and again it is written quote, be thou faithful unto death and i will give thee a crown of life end quote. they have preserved in their faithfulness and steadfastness the invincibleness even unto death when to the willingness and the confession of the name in prison and in chains is added also the conclusion of dying the glory of the martyr is consummated finally also take note of their days on which they depart that we may celebrate their commemoration among the memorials of the martyrs although tertullius our most faithful and devoted brother who in addition to the other solicitude and care which he shows to the brethren in all service of labor is not wanting besides in that respect in any care of their bodies has written and does write and intimate to me the days in which our blessed brethren in prison pass by the gate of a glorious death to their immortality and there are celebrated here by us oblations and sacrifices for their commemorations which things with the lord's protection we shall soon celebrate with you let your care also as i have already often written and your diligence not be wanting to the poor to such i mean as steadfast in the faith and bravely fight with us and have not left the camp of christ to whom indeed we should now show a greater love and care in that they are neither constrained by poverty nor prostrated by the tempest of persecution but finally serve with the lord and have given an example of faith to the other poor i bid you brethren beloved and greatly longed for ever heartily farewell and remember me greet the brotherhood in my name fare ye well end of epistle thirty six of cyprian read by david ronald epistle thirty seven of epistles of cyprian by cyprian this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Epistle 37. To Caldonius, Herculanus, and others about the excommunication of Philesimus. Argument. Philesimus, together with his companions in sedition, is to be restrained from the communion of all. Cyprian. To Caldonius, and Herculanus, his colleagues. Also, to Rogatianus, and Numidicus, his fellow presbyters. Greeting i have been greatly grieved dearest brethren at the receipt of your letter that although i have always proposed to myself and wished to keep all our brotherhood safe and to preserve the flock unharmed as charity requires you tell me now that philisimus has been attempting many things with wickedness and craft so that besides his old frauds and plundering of which i had formerly known a good deal he has now moreover tried to divide with the bishop a portion of the people that is to separate the sheep from the shepherd and sons from their parents and to scatter the members of christ and although i sent you as my substitutes to discharge the necessities of our brethren with funds and if any moreover wish to exercise their crafts to assist their wishes with such an addition as might be sufficient and at the same time also to take note of their ages and conditions and deserts that i also upon whom falls the charge of knowing all of them thoroughly might promote any that were worthy and humble and meek to the offices of the ecclesiastical administration he has interfered and directed that no one should be relieved and that those things which i had desired should not be ascertained by careful examination he has also threatened our brethren who had first approached to be relieved with the wicked exercise of power and with a violent dread that those who desire to obey me should not communicate with him in death and since after all these things neither moved by the honour of my station nor shaken by your authority and presence but of his own impulse disturbing the peace of the brethren 
he hath rushed forth with many more and asserted himself as a leader of a faction and chief of a sedition with a hasty madness in which respect indeed i congratulate several of the brethren that they have withdrawn from this boldness and have rather chosen to consent with you so that they may remain with the church their mother and receive their stipends from the bishop who dispenses them which indeed i know for certain that others also will peaceably do and will quickly withdraw from their rash error in the meantime since felicimus has threatened that they should not communicate with him in death who had obeyed us that is who communicated with us let him receive the sentence which he first of all declared that he may know that he is excommunicated by us inasmuch as he adds to his frauds and rapines which we have known by the clearest truth the crime also of adultery which our brethren grave men have declared that they have discovered and have asseverated that they will prove all which things we shall then judicially examine when with the lord's permission we shall assemble in one place with many of our colleagues but algendus also who considering neither his bishop nor his church has equally associated himself with him in this conspiracy and faction if he should further persevere with him let him bear the sentence which that factious and impetuous man has provoked on himself moreover whoever shall ally himself with his conspiracy and faction let him know that he shall not communicate in the church with us since of his own accord he has preferred to be separated from the church read this letter of mine to our brethren and also transmit it to carthage to the clergy the names being added of those who have joined themselves with Felicimus. i bid you beloved brethren ever heartily farewell and remember me fare ye well end of epistle thirty seven of cyprian read by david ronald epistle thirty eight of epistles of cyprian by cyprian this librivox recording is in the public domain epistle thirty eight the letter of caldonius herculanus and others on the excommunication of Felicimus with his people argument caldonius herculanus and others carry into effect what the preceding letter had bidden them caldonius and herculanus and victor his colleagues also with Rogatianus and numidicus presbyters we have rejected Felicimus and ogendus from communion also repostus from among the exiles and irene of the blood-stained ones and paula the semptress which you ought to know from my subscription also we have rejected sophronius and soliasus but inarius himself also one of the exiles end of epistle thirty eight of cyprian read by david ronald epistle thirty nine of epistles of cyprian by cyprian translated by robert wallace this librivox recording is in the public domain epistle thirty nine to the people concerning five schismatic presbyters of the faction of philesimus argument in like manner as in the epistle but one before this cyprian told the clergy so now he tells the people that philesimus is to be avoided together with the five presbyters of his faction who not only granted peace to the lapsed without any discrimination but stirred up sedition and schism against himself cyprian to the people greeting although dearest brethren Vertius, a most faithful and upright presbyter and also rogatianus and numidicus presbyters confessors and illustrious by the glory of the divine condensation and also the deacons 
good men and devoted to the ecclesiastical administration in all its duties, with the other ministers, afford you the full attention of their presence, and do not cease to confirm individuals by their assiduous exhortations, and, moreover, to govern and reform the minds of the lapsed by their wholesome counsels, yet, as much as I can, I admonish, and as I can, I visit you with my letters. By my letters, I say, dearest brethren, for the malignity and treachery of certain of the presbyters has accomplished this, that I should not be allowed to come to you before Easter Day, since mindful of their conspiracy, and retaining that ancient venom against my episcopate, that is, against your suffrage and God's judgment, they renew their old attack upon me, and once more begin their sacrilegious machinations with their accustomed craft, and, indeed, of God's providence, neither by our wish nor desire, nay, although we were forgiving and silent, they have suffered the punishment which they had deserved, so that, not cast out by us, they of their own accord have cast themselves out. They themselves, before their own conscience, have passed sentence on themselves in accordance with your suffrages, and the divine, these conspirators and evil men of their own accord have driven themselves from the church. Now it has appeared whence came the faction of Felicimus, on what root and by what strength it stood. These men supplied, in former times, encouragement and exhortations to certain confessors, not to agree with their bishop, not to maintain the ecclesiastical discipline with faith and quietness according to the Lord's precepts, not to keep the glory of their confession with an uncorrupt and unspotted conversation, and lest it should be too little to have corrupted the minds of certain confessors, and to have wished to arm a portion of our broken fraternity against God's priesthood. They have now turned their attention with their envenomed deceitfulness to the ruin of the lapsed, to turn away from the healing of their wound the sick and the wounded, and those who, by the misfortune of their fall, are less fit and less sturdy to take stronger counsel, and invite them, by the falsehood of a fallacious peace, to a fatal rashness, leaving off prayers and supplications, whereby, with long and continual satisfaction, the Lord is to be appeased. But I pray you, brethren, watch against the snares of the devil, and, taking care for your own salvation, be diligently on your guard against this death-bearing fallacy. This is another persecution and another temptation. Those five presbyters are none other than the five leaders who were lately associated with the magistrates in an edict, that they might overthrow our faith, that they might turn away the feeble hearts of the brethren to their deadly nets by the prevarication of the truth. Now the same scheme, the same overturning, is again brought about by the five presbyters linked with Philisimus, to the destruction of salvation, that God should not be besought, and that he who has denied Christ should not appeal for mercy to the same Christ whom he had denied, that after the fault of the crime, repentance also should be taken away, and that the Lord should not be appeased through bishops and priests, but that the Lord's priests being forsaken, a new tradition of sacrilegious appointment should arise, contrary to the evangelical discipline. And although it was once arranged as well by us as by the confessors and the city clergy, and moreover by all the bishops appointed either in our province or beyond the sea, that no novelty should be introduced in respect of the case of the lapsed unless we all assembled into one place, and our councils being compared, should decide upon a moderate sentence, tempered alike with discipline and with mercy, against this our council they have rebelled, and all priestly authority and power is destroyed by factious conspiracies. What sufferings do I now endure, dearest brethren, that I myself am not able to come to you at the present juncture, that I myself cannot approach you, each one, that I myself cannot exhort you according to the teaching of the Lord and of his gospel. An exile of now two years was not sufficient, and a mournful separation from you, from your countenance, and from your sight, continual grief and lamentation, which, in my loneliness without you, tears me to pieces with my constant mourning, nor my tears flowing day and night, that there is not even an opportunity for the priest 
whom you made with so much love and eagerness to greet you, nor to be enfolded in your embraces. This greater grief is added to my worn spirit, that in the midst of so much solicitude and necessity, I am not able myself to hasten to you, since, by the threats and by the snares of perfidious men, we are anxious that on our coming a greater tumult may not arise there. And so, although the bishop ought to be careful for peace and tranquillity in all things, he himself should seem to have afforded material for sedition, and to have embittered persecution anew. Hence, however, beloved brethren, I not only admonish, but counsel you, not rashly to trust to mischievous words, nor to yield an easy consent to deceitful sayings, nor to take darkness for light, night for day, hunger for food, thirst for drink, poison for medicine, death for safety. Let not the age nor the authority deceive you of those who, answering to the ancient wickedness of the two elders, as they attempted to corrupt and violate the chaste Susanna, are thus also attempting with their adulterous doctrines to corrupt the chastity of the church and violate the truth of the gospel. The Lord cries aloud, saying, quote, Hearken not unto the words of the false prophets, for the visions of their own hearts deceive them. They speak, but not out of the mouth of the Lord. They say to them that despise the word of the Lord, ye shall have peace. End quote. They are now offering peace who have not peace themselves. They are promising to bring back and recall the lapsed into the church who themselves have departed from the church. There is one God, and Christ is one, and there is one church, and one chair founded upon the rock by the word of the Lord. Another altar cannot be constituted or a new priesthood be made, except the one altar and the one priesthood. Whosoever gathereth elsewhere scattereth. Whatsoever is appointed by human madness, so that the divine disposition is violated, is adulterous, is impious, is sacrilegious. Depart far from the contagion of men of this kind, and flee from their words, avoiding them as a cancer and a plague, as the Lord warns you and says, quote, They are blind leaders of the blind, but if the blind lead the blind, they shall both fall into the ditch. End quote. They intercept your prayers which you pour forth with us to God day and night, to appease him with a righteous satisfaction. They intercept your tears, with which you wash away the guilt of the sin you have committed. They intercept the peace, which you truly and faithfully ask from the mercy of the Lord, and they do not know that it is written, quote, And that prophet, or that dreamer of dreams, that hath spoken to turn you away from the Lord your God, shall be put to death. End quote. Let no one, beloved brethren, make you to err from the ways of the Lord. Let no one snatch you, Christians, from the gospel of Christ. Let no one take sons of the church away from the church. Let them perish alone for themselves who have wished to perish. Let them remain outside the church alone who have departed from the church. Let them alone be without bishops who have rebelled against bishops. Let them alone undergo the penalties of their conspiracies who formerly, according to your votes and now according to God's judgment, have deserved to undergo the sentence of their own conspiracy and malignity. The Lord warns us in his gospel, saying, quote, Ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may establish your own tradition. End quote. Let them who reject the commandment of God and endeavor to keep their own tradition be bravely and firmly rejected by you. Let one downfall be sufficient for the lapsed. Let no one by his fraud hurl down those who wish to rise. Let no one cast down more deeply and depress those who are down, on whose behalf we pray that they may be raised up by God's hand and arm. Let no one turn away from all hope of safety those who are half alive and entreating that they may receive their former health. Let no one extinguish every light of the way of salvation to those that are wavering in the darkness of their laps. The apostle instructs us, saying, quote, If any man teach otherwise, and consent not to the wholesome words of our Lord Jesus Christ and his doctrine, he is lifted up with foolishness. From such withdraw thyself. End quote. And again he says, quote, Let no man deceive you with vain words, 
For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. End quote. There is no reason that you should be deceived with vain words and begin to be partakers of their depravity. Depart from such, I entreat you, and acquiesce in our counsels, who daily pour out for your continual prayers to the Lord, who desire that you should be recalled to the church by the clemency of the Lord, who pray for the fullest peace from God, first for the mother and then for her children. Join also your petitions and prayers with our prayers and petitions. Mingle your tears with our wailings. Avoid the wolves who separate the sheep from the shepherd. Avoid the envenomed tongue of the devil, who from the beginning of the world, always deceitful and lying, lies that he may deceive, cajoles that he may injure, promises good that he may give evil, promises life that he may put to death. Now also his words are evident, and his poisons are plain. He promises peace in order that peace may not possibly be attained. He promises salvation, that he who has sinned may not come to salvation. He promises a church, when he so contrives that he who believes him may utterly perish apart from the church. It is now the occasion, dearly beloved brethren, both for you who stand fast to persevere bravely, and to maintain your glorious stability, which you kept in persecution with a continual firmness, and if any of you, by the circumvention of the adversary, have fallen, that in this second temptation you should faithfully take counsel for your hope and your peace, and in order that the Lord may pardon you, that you should not depart from the priests of the Lord, since it is written, quote, And the man that will do presumptuously, and will not hearken unto the priest or unto the judge, that shall be in those days, even that man shall die, end quote. Of this persecution, this is the latest and final temptation, which itself also, by the Lord's protection, shall quickly pass away, so that I shall be again presented to you after Easter day with my colleagues, who, being present, we shall be able as well to arrange as to complete the matters which require to be done according to your judgment, and to the general advice of all of us, as it has been decided before." But if anybody refusing to repent and to make satisfaction to God shall yield to the party of Lysimus and his satellites, and shall join himself to the heretical faction, let him know that he cannot afterwards return to the church and communicate with the bishops and the people of Christ. I bid you, dearest brethren, ever heartily farewell, and that you plead with me in continual prayer that the mercy of God may be entreated. End of Epistle 39 Read by David Ronald Epistle 40 of Epistles of Cyprian by Cyprian Translated by Robert Wallace This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Epistle 40 To Cornelius on his refusal to receive Novatian's ordination Argument The messengers sent by Novatian to intimate his ordination to the church of Carthage are rejected by Cyprian. Cyprian, to Cornelius, his brother, greeting. There have come to us, beloved brother, sent by Novatian, Maximus the presbyter, and Argandus the deacon, and a certain Machaeus and Longinus. But, as we discovered, as well from the letters which they brought with them, as from their discourse and declaration, that Novatian had been made bishop, disturbed by the wickedness of an unlawful ordination made in opposition to the Catholic Church, we considered at once that they must be restrained from communion with us, and having, in the meanwhile, refuted and repelled the things which they pertinaciously and obstinately endeavored to assert, I and several of my colleagues who had come together to me, were awaiting the arrival of our colleagues, Caldonius and Fortunatus, whom we had lately sent to you as ambassadors, and to our fellow bishops, who were present at your ordination, in order that, when they came and reported the truth of the matter, the wickedness of the adverse party might be quelled through them by greater authority and manifest proof. 
But there came, in addition, Pompeius and Stephanus, our colleagues, who themselves also, by way of instructing us thereon, put forward manifest proofs and testimonies in conformity with their gravity and faithfulness, so that it was not even necessary that those who had come, as sent by Novatian, should be heard any further. And when, in our solemn assembly, they burst in with invidious abuse and turbulent clamor, demanding that the accusations which they said that they brought and would prove should be publicly investigated by us and by the people, we said that it was not consistent with our gravity to suffer the honor of our colleague, who had already been chosen and ordained and approved by the laudable sentence of many, to be called into question any further by the abusive voice of rivals. And because it would be a long business to collect into a letter the matters in which they have been refuted and repressed, and in which they have been manifested as having caused heresy by their unlawful attempts, you shall hear everything most fully from Primitivus, our co-presbyter, when he shall come to you. And lest their raging boldness should ever cease, they are striving here also to distract the members of Christ into schismatical parties, and to cut and tear the one body of the Catholic Church, so that, running about from door to door, through the houses of many, or from city to city, through certain districts, they seek for companions in their obstinacy and error to join to themselves to their schism. To whom we have once given this reply, nor shall we cease to command them to lay aside their pernicious dissensions and disputes, and to be aware that it is an impiety to forsake their mother, and to acknowledge and understand that when a bishop is once made and approved by the testimony and judgment of his colleagues and the people, another can be by no means appointed. Thus, if they consult their own interest peaceably and faithfully, if they confess themselves to be maintainers of the gospel of Christ, they must return to the church. I bid you, dearest brother, ever heartily farewell. End of Epistle 40 Read by David Ronald Epistle 41 of Epistles of Cyprian by Cyprian Translated by Robert Wallace. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Epistle 41 to Cornelius about Cyprian's approval of his ordination and concerning Felicimus. Argument. Cyprian excuses himself for not having without hesitation believed in the ordination of Cornelius until he received the letters of his colleagues Caldonius and Fortunatus, which fully testify to its legitimacy, and incidentally repeats in respect of the contrary faction of the Novatian party, that he did not in the very first instance give his adhesion to that, but rather to Cornelius, even to the extent of refusing to receive accusations against him. Cyprian, to Cornelius his brother, greeting. As was fitting for God's servants, and especially for upright and peaceable priests, dearest brother, we recently sent our colleagues Caldonius and Fortunatus, that they might, not only by the persuasion of our letters, but by their presence and the advice of all of you, strive and labor with all their power to bring the members of the divided body into the unity of the Catholic Church, and associate them into the bond of Christian charity. But since the obstinate and inflexible pertinacity of the adverse party has not only rejected the bosom and the embrace of its root and mother, but even with the discord, spreading and reviving itself worse and worse, has appointed a bishop for itself, and contrary to the sacrament once delivered of the divine appointment and of Catholic unity, has made an adulterous and opposed head outside the church, having received your letters as well as those of our colleagues at the coming also of our colleagues Pompeius and Stephanus, good men and very dear to us, 
by whom all these things were undoubtedly alleged and proved to us with general gladness in conformity with the requirements alike of the sanctity and the truth of the divine tradition and the ecclesiastical institution we have directed our letters to you moreover bringing these same things under the notice of our several colleagues throughout the province we have bidden also that our brethren with letters from them be directed to you this has been done although our mind and intention had been already plainly declared to the brethren and to the whole of the people in this place when having received letters lately from both parties we read your letters and intimated your ordination to the episcopate in the ears of every one moreover remembering the common honour and having respect for the sacerdotal gravity and sanctity we repudiated those things which from the other party had been heaped together with bitter virulence into a document transmitted to us alike considering and weighing that in so great and so religious an assembly of brethren in which god's priests were sitting together and his altar was set they ought neither to be read nor to be heard for those things should not easily be put forward nor carelessly and rudely published which may move as scandal by means of a quarrelsome pen in the minds of the hearers and confuse brethren who are placed far apart and dwelling across the sea with uncertain opinions let those beware who obeying either their own rage or lust and unmindful of the divine law and holiness rejoice to throw abroad in the meantime things which they cannot prove and although they may not be successful in destroying and ruining innocence are satisfied with scattering stains upon it with lying reports and false rumours assuredly we should exert ourselves as it is fitting for prelates and priests to do that such things when they are written by any should be repudiated as far as we are concerned for otherwise what will become of that which we learn and which we declare to be laid down in scripture quote, keep thy tongue from evil and thy lips from speaking guile end quote. and elsewhere quote, thy mouth abounded in malice and thy tongue embraced deceit thou saddest and spakest against thy brother and slanderest thine own mother's son end quote. also what the apostle says quote, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth but that which is good to the edifying of faith that it may minister grace unto the hearers end quote further we show what the right course of conduct to pursue is if when such things are written by the calamnious temerity of some we do not allow them to be read among us and therefore dearest brother when such letters come to me against you even though they were the letters of your co-presbyters sitting with you as they breathed a tone of religious simplicity and did not echo with any barkings of curses and revilings i ordered them to be read to the clergy and the people but in desiring letters from our colleagues who were present at your ordination at that place we did not forget the ancient usage nor did we seek for any novelty for it was sufficient for you to announce yourself by letters to have been made bishop unless there had been a dissenting faction on the other side who by their slanderous and calumnious fabrications disturbed the minds and perplexed the hearts of our colleagues as well as of several of the brethren to set this matter at rest we judged it necessary to obtain thence the strong and decided authority of our colleagues who wrote to us and they declaring the testimony of their letters to be fully deserved by your character and life and teaching have deprived even your rivals and those who delight either in novelty or evil of every scruple of doubt or of difference and according to our advice weighed in wholesome reason the minds of the brethren tossing about in this sea have sincerely and decidedly approved your priesthood for this my brother we especially both labor after and ought to labor after to be careful to maintain as much as we can the unity delivered by the lord and through his apostles to us their successors and as far as in us lies to gather into the church the dispersed and wandering sheep which the wilful faction and heretical temptation of some is separating from their mother those only being left outside who by their obstinacy and madness have persisted 
and have been unwilling to return to us, who themselves will have to give an account to the Lord of the dissension and separation made by them, and of the church that they have forsaken. But, so far as pertains to the cause of certain presbyters here, and of Philisimus, that you may know what has been done here, our colleagues have sent you letters subscribed by their own hand, that you may learn, when you have heard the parties, from their letters what they have thought, and what they have pronounced. But you will do better, brother, if you will also bid copies of the letters which I had sent lately by our colleagues Caldonius and Fortunatus to you, to be read for the common satisfaction which I had written concerning the same Philisimus and his presbytery to the clergy there, and also to the people to be read to the brethren there, declaring your ordination and the course of the whole transaction, that so as well there as here the brotherhood may be informed of all things by us. Moreover, I have here transmitted also copies of the same by Medius, the subdeacon sent by me, and by Nisphorus, the acolyte. I bid you, dearest brother, ever heartily farewell. End of Epistle 41 Read by David Ronald Epistle 42 of Epistles of Cyprian by Cyprian Translated by Robert Wallace This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Epistle 42 To the same on his having sent letters to the confessors whom Novatian had seduced. Argument The argument of this letter sufficiently appears from the title. It is manifest that this letter and the following were sent by one messenger. Cyprian to Cornelius, his brother greeting i have thought it both obligatory on me and necessary for you dearest brother to write a short letter to the confessors who are there with you and seduced by the obstinacy and depravity of novatian and novatus have departed from the church in which letter i might induce them for the sake of our mutual affection to return to their mother that is to the catholic church this letter i have first of all entrusted to you by Medius, the subdeacon, for your perusal, lest any one should pretend that I had written otherwise than according to the contents of my letter. I have, moreover, charged the same Medius, sent by me to you, that he should be guided by your decision, and if you should think that this letter should be given to the confessors, then that he should deliver it. I bid you, dearest brother, ever heartily farewell. End of Epistle 42 by Cyprian Read by David Ronald Epistle 43 of Epistles of Cyprian by Cyprian This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Epistle 43 To the Roman Confessors that they should return to unity. Argument He exhorts the Roman Confessors who had been seduced by the faction of Novatian and Novatus to return to unity. Cyprian, to Maximus, and Nicostratus, and the other confessors, greeting. As you have frequently gathered from my letters, beloved, what honor I have ever observed in my mode of speaking for your confession, and what love for the associated brotherhood, believe, I entreat you, and acquiesce in these my letters, wherein I both write and with simplicity and fidelity consult for you and for your doings and for your praise for it weighs me down and saddens me and the intolerable grief of a smitten almost prostrate spirit seizes me when i find that you there contrary to ecclesiastical order contrary to evangelical law contrary to the unity of the catholic institution had consented that another bishop should be made that is what is neither right nor allowable to be done that another church should be set up that christ's members should be torn asunder that the one mind and body of the lord's flock should be lacerated by a divided emulation i entreat that in you at all events that unlawful rending of our brotherhood may not continue but remembering both your confession and the divine tradition 
you may return to the mother whence you have gone forth, whence you came to the glory of confession with the rejoicing of the same mother. And think not that you are thus maintaining the gospel of Christ when you separate yourselves from the flock of Christ and from his peace and concord, since it is more fitting for glorious and good soldiers to sit down within their own camp and so placed within to manage and provide for those things which are to be dealt with in common. For as our unanimity and concord ought by no means to be divided, and because we cannot forsake the church and go outside her to come to you, we beg and entreat you with what exhortations we can, rather to return to the church, your mother, and to our brotherhood. I bid you, dearest brethren, ever heartily farewell. End of Epistle 43 by Cyprian Read by David Ronald Epistle 44 of Epistles of Cyprian by Cyprian This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Epistle 44 to Cornelius concerning Polycarp the Adrumatine Argument He excuses himself in this letter for what had occurred in that during the time that he was at Adramentum, letters had been sent thence by the clergy of Polycarp, not to Cornelius, but to the Roman clergy, notwithstanding that previously Polycarp himself had written rather to Cornelius. It appears tolerably plain from the context itself that this was written after the preceding ones. Cyprian, to Cornelius his brother, greeting. I have read your letters, dearest brother, which you sent by Primitivus, our co-presbyter, in which I perceived that you were annoyed that, whereas letters from the Adramentine colony in the name of Polycarp were directed to you, yet after Liberalis and I came to that place, letters began to be directed thence to the presbyters and to the deacons, in respect of which I wish you to know, and certainly to believe, that it was done from no levity or contempt, but when several of our colleagues who had assembled into one place had determined that, while our co-bishops, Caledonus and Fortunatus, were sent as ambassadors to you, all things should be in the meantime suspended as they were, until the same colleagues of ours, having reduced matters there to peace, or having discovered their truth, should return to us, the presbyters and deacons abiding in the Adramentine colony, in the absence of our co-bishop, Polycarp, were ignorant of what had been decided in common by us. But when we came before them, and our purpose was understood, they themselves also began to observe what the others did, so that the agreement of the churches abiding there was in no respect broken. Some persons, however, sometimes disturb men's minds and spirits by their words, in that they relate things otherwise than is the truth. For we, who furnish every person who sails hence with a plan that they may sail without any offense, know that we have exhorted them to acknowledge and hold the root and womb of the Catholic Church. But since our province is widespread, and has Numidia and Maritonia attached to it, lest a schism made in the city should confuse the minds of the absent with uncertain opinions, we decided, having obtained by means of the bishops the truth of the matter, and having got a greater authority for the proof of your ordination, and so at length every scruple being got rid of from the breast of every one, that letters should be sent you by all who were placed anywhere in the province, as in fact is done, that so the whole of our colleagues might decidedly approve of and maintain both you and your communion that is as well to the unity of the Catholic Church as to its charity. That all which has by God's direction come to pass and that our design has, under providence, been forwarded, we rejoice. For thus as well the truth as the dignity of your episcopate has been established in the most open light, and with the most manifest and substantial approval, so that from the replies of our colleagues, 
who have thence written to us, and from the account, and from the testimonies of our co-bishops, Pompeius, and Stephanus, and Caledonius, and Fortunatus, both the needful cause and the right order, and moreover the glorious innocence of your ordination might be known by all, that we, with the rest of our colleagues, may steadily and firmly administer this office, and keep it in the concordant unanimity of the Catholic Church, the divine condensation will accomplish, so that the Lord, who condescends to elect and appoint for himself priests in his church, may protect them also when elected and appointed by his good will and help, inspiring them to govern, and supplying both vigor for restraining the contumacy of the wicked, and gentleness for cherishing the penitence of the lapsed. I bid you, dearest brother, ever heartily farewell. End of Epistle 44 by Cyprian Read by David Ronald Epistle 45 of Epistles of Cyprian by Cyprian This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Epistle 45 Cornelius to Cyprian on the return of the confessors to unity. Argument Cornelius informs Cyprian of the solemn return of the confessors to the church and describes it. Cornelius to Cyprian, his brother, greeting. In proportion to the solicitude and anxiety that we sustained in respect of those confessors who had been circumvented and almost deceived and alienated from the church by the craft and malice of that wily and subtle man was the joy with which we were affected and the thanks which we gave to almighty god and to our lord christ when they acknowledging their error and perceiving the poisoned cunning of the malignant man as if of a serpent came back as they with one heart profess with singleness of will to the church from which they had gone forth. And first, indeed, our brethren of approved faith, loving peace and desiring unity, announced that the swelling pride of these men was already soothed. Yet there was no fitting assurance to induce us easily to believe that they were thoroughly changed. But afterwards, Urbanus and Sidonius, the confessors came to our presbyters, affirming that Maximus, the confessor and presbyter, equally with themselves, desired to return into the church. But since many things had preceded this which they had contrived, of which you also have been made aware from our co-bishops and from my letters, so that faith could not hastily be reposed in them, we determined to hear from their own mouth and confession those things which they had sent by the messengers. And when they came and were required by the presbyters to give an account of what they had done, and were charged with having very lately repeatedly sent letters full of calumnies and reproaches in their name through all the churches and had disturbed nearly all the churches, they affirmed that they had been deceived and that they had not known what was in those letters, declaring that only through being misled they had also committed schismatical acts and being the authors of heresy, so that they suffered hands to be imposed on him as if upon a bishop. And when these and other matters had been charged upon them, they entreated that they might be done away and altogether discharged from memory. The whole of this transaction, therefore, being brought before me, I decided that the presbytery should be brought together, for there were present five bishops who were also present today, so that, by well-grounded counsel, it might be determined with the consent of all what ought to be observed in respect to their persons and that you may know the feeling of all and the advice of each one i decided also to bring to your knowledge our various opinions which you will read subjoined when these things were done maximus urbanus sidonius and several brethren who had joined themselves to them came to the presbytery desiring with earnest prayers that what had been done before might fall into oblivion 
and no mention might be made of it, and promising that henceforth, as though nothing had been either done or said, all things on both sides being forgiven, they would now exhibit to God a heart clean and pure, following the evangelical word which says, quote, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. End quote. What remained was that the people should be informed of all this proceeding that they might see those very men established in the church whom they had long seen and mourned as wanderers and scattered. Their will being known, a great concourse of the brotherhood was assembled. There was one voice from all, giving thanks to God, all were expressing the joy of their heart by tears, embracing them as if they had this day been set free from the penalty of the dungeon. And to quote their very own words, quote, We, they say, know that Cornelius is bishop of the most holy Catholic Church, elected by Almighty God and by Christ our Lord. We confess our error. We have suffered imposture. We were deceived by captious, perfidy and loquacity for although we seemed as it were to have held a kind of communion with a man who was a schismatic and a heretic yet our mind was always sincere in the church for we are not ignorant that there is one god that there is one christ the lord whom we have confessed and one holy spirit and that there ought to be one bishop in the catholic church End quote. Were we not rightly induced by that confession of theirs to allow that what they had confessed before the power of the world they might approve when established in the church? Wherefore, we bade Maximus the presbyter to take his own place. The rest we received with great approbation of the people. But we remitted all things to Almighty God, in whose power all things are reserved. These things, therefore, brother, written to you in the same hour, at the same moment, we have transmitted, and I have sent away at once Nicephorus, the acolyte, hastening to descend to embarkation, that so, no delay being made, you might, as if you had been present among that clergy and in that assembly of people, give thanks to Almighty God and to Christ our Lord. But we believe, nay, we confide in it for certain, that the others, also who have been ranged in this error, will shortly return into the church when they see their leaders acting with us. I think, brother, that you ought to send these letters also to the other churches, that all may know that the craft and prevarication of the schismatic and heretic are from day to day being reduced to nothing. Farewell, dearest brother. End of Epistle 45 by Cyprian Read by David Ronald Epistle 46 of Epistles of Cyprian by Cyprian This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Epistle 46 Cyprian's answer to Cornelius congratulating him on the return of the confessors from schism. Argument. He congratulates him on the return of the confessors to the church and reminds him how much that return benefits the Catholic Church. Cyprian to Cornelius his brother. Greeting. I profess that I both have rendered and do render the greatest thanks without ceasing, dearest brother, to God the Father Almighty, and to his Christ the Lord, and our God and Saviour, that the Church is thus divinely protected, and its unity and holiness is not constantly nor altogether corrupted by the obstinacy of perfidy and heretical wickedness. For we have read your letter, and have exultingly received the greatest joy from the fulfillment of our common desire, to wit, that Maximus the Presbyter, and Urbanus the Confessors, with Sidonius and Macarius, have re-entered into the Catholic Church, that is, that they have laid aside their error, and given up their schismatical 
nay their heretical madness and have sought again in the soundness of faith the home of unity and truth that whence they had gone forth to glory thither they might gloriously return and that they who had confessed christ should not afterwards desert the camp of christ and that they might not tempt the faith of their charity and unity who had not been overcome in strength and courage behold the safe and unspotted integrity of their praise behold the uncorrupted and substantial dignity of these confessors that they have departed with the deserters and fugitives that they have left the betrayers of the faith and the impugners of the catholic church with reason did both the people and the brotherhood receive them when they returned as you write with the greatest joy since in the glory of confessors who had maintained their glory and returned to unity there is none who does not reckon himself a partner and a sharer we can estimate the joy of that day from our own feelings for if in this place the whole number of the brethren rejoiced at your letter which you sent concerning their confession and received this tidings of common rejoicing with the greatest alacrity what must have been the joy there when the matter itself and the general gladness was carried on under the eyes of all for since the lord in his gospel says that there is the highest quote, joy in heaven over one sinner that repenteth End quote. how much greater is the joy in earth no less than in heaven over confessors who return with their glory and with praise to the church of god and make a way of returning for others by the faith and approval of their example for this error had led away certain of our brethren so that they thought they were following the communion of confessors when this error was removed light was infused into the breasts of all and the catholic church has been shown to be one and to be able neither to be cut nor divided nor can any one now be easily deceived by the talkative words of a raging schismatic since it has been proved that good and glorious soldiers of christ could not long be detained without the church by the deceitfulness and perfidy of others i bid you dearest brother ever heartily farewell end of epistle forty six by cyprian read by david ronald epistle forty seven of epistles of cyprian by cyprian this librivox recording is in the public domain epistle forty seven cornelius to cyprian concerning the faction of novatian with his party argument cornelius gives cyprian an account of the faction of novatian cornelius to cyprian his brother greeting that nothing might be wanting to the future punishment of this wretched man when cast down by the powers of god on the expulsion by you of maximus and longinus and machaeus he has risen again and as i intimated in my former letter which i sent to you by argundus the confessor i think that nicostratus and novatus and everistus and primus and dionysus have already come thither therefore let care be taken that it be made known to all our co-bishops and brethren that nicostratus is accused of many crimes and not only has he committed frauds and plunders on his secular patroness whose affairs he managed but moreover which is reserved to him for a perpetual punishment he has abstracted no small deposits of the church that everistus has been the author of a schism and that zetus has been appointed bishop in his room and his successor to the people over whom he had previously presided but he contrived greater and worse things by his malice and insatiable wickedness than those which he was then always practising among his own people so that you may know what kind of leaders and protectors that schismatic and heretic constantly have joined to his side i bid you dearest brother ever heartily farewell end of epistle forty seven by cyprian read by david ronald epistle forty eight of epistles of cyprian by cyprian this librivox recording is in the public domain epistle forty eight cyprian's answer to cornelius concerning the crimes of novatus argument he praises cornelius that he had given him timely warning 
Seeing that the day after the guilty faction had come to him, he had received Cornelius's letter. Then he describes at length Novatus's crimes and the schism that had before been stirred up by him in Africa. Cyprian to Cornelius his brother, greeting. You have acted, dearest brother, both with diligence and love in sending us in haste Nicephorus the Acolyte, who both told us the glorious gladness concerning the return of the confessors and most fully instructed us against the new and mischievous devices of Novatian and Novitas for attacking the Church of Christ. For whereas on the day before that mischievous faction of heretical wickedness had arrived here, itself already lost and ready to ruin others who should join it, on the day after Nicephorus arrived with your letter, from which we both learnt ourselves and have begun to teach and to instruct others that Evaristus, from being a bishop, has now not remained even a layman, but banished from the sea and from the people and in exile from the church of Christ, he roves about far and wide through other provinces and himself having made shipwreck of truth and faith, is preparing for some who are like him as fearful shipwrecks. Moreover, that Nicostratus, having lost the diaconate of sacred administrations because he had abstracted the church's money by a sacrilegious fraud and disowned the deposits of the widows and orphans, did not wish so much to come into Africa as to escape thither from the city, from the consciousness of his repines and his frightful crimes. And now a deserter and a fugitive from the church, as if to have changed the clime, were to change the man. He goes on to boast and announce himself a confessor, although he can no longer either be called or be a confessor of Christ who has denied Christ's church. For when the Apostle Paul says, quote, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. End quote. When, I say, the blessed apostle says this, and with his sacred voice testifies to the unity of Christ with the church, cleaving to one another with indivisible links, how can he be with Christ who is not with the spouse of Christ and in his church? Or how does he assume to himself the charge of ruling or governing the church who has spoiled and wronged the church of Christ? For about Novatus, there need have been nothing told by you to us, since Novatus ought rather to have been shown by us to you, as always greedy of novelty, raging with the rapacity of an insatiable avarice, inflated with the arrogance and stupidity of swelling pride, always known with bad repute to the bishops there, always condemned by the voice of all the priests as a heretic and a perfidious man always inquisitive that he may betray he flatters for the purpose of deceiving never faithful that he may love a torch and fire to blow up the flames of sedition a whirlwind and tempest to make shipwrecks of the faith the foe of quiet the adversary of tranquillity the enemy of peace finally when novatus withdrew thence from among you that is when the storm and the whirlwind departed Calm arose there in part, and the glorious and good confessors who by his instigation had departed from the church, after he retired from the city, returned to the church. This is the same Novatus, who first sowed among us the flames of discord and schism, who separated some of the brethren here from the bishop, who in the persecution itself was to our people, as it were, another persecution, to overthrow the minds of the brethren. He it is who, without my leave or knowledge, of his own factitious and ambition, appointed his attendant, Felicimus, a deacon, and with his own tempest, sailing also to Rome, to overthrow the church, endeavored to do similar and equal things there, forcibly separating a part of the people from the clergy, and dividing the concord of the fraternity that was firmly knit together and mutually loving one another. Since Rome, from her greatness, plainly ought to take precedence of Carthage, he there committed still graver and graver crimes. He who, in the one place, had made a deacon contrary to the church, in the other made a bishop, nor let any one be surprised at this in such men, 
The wicked are always madly carried away by their own furious passions, and after they have committed crimes, they are agitated by the very consciousness of a depraved mind. Neither can those remain in God's church who have not maintained its divine and ecclesiastical discipline, either in the conversation of their life or the peace of their character. Orphans despoiled by him, widows defrauded, monies moreover of the church withheld, exact from him those penalties which we behold inflicted in his madness. His father also died of hunger in the street, and afterwards even in death was not buried by him. The womb of his wife was smitten by a blow of his heel, and in the miscarriage that soon followed, the offspring was brought forth, the fruit of a father's murder. And now does he dare to condemn the hands of those who sacrifice when he himself is more guilty in his feet by which the son who was being born was slain. He long ago feared this consciousness of crime. On account of this, he regarded it as certain that he would not only be turned out of the presbytery, but restrained from communion, and by the urgency of the brethren, the day of investigation was coming on, on which his cause was to be dealt with before us, if the persecution had not prevented. He, welcoming this, with a sort of desire of escaping and evading condemnation, committed all these crimes and wrought all this stir, so that he who was to be ejected and excluded from the church anticipated the judgment of the priests by a voluntary departure, as if to have anticipated the sentence or to have escaped the punishment. But in respect to the other brethren, over whom we grieve, that they were circumvented by him, we labor that they may avoid the mischievous neighborhood of the crafty impostor, that they may escape the deadly nets of his solicitations, that they may once more seek the church from which he deserved by divine authority to be expelled. Such indeed, with the Lord's help, we trust may return by his mercy, for one cannot perish unless it is plain that he must perish, since the Lord in his gospel says, quote, Every planting which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. End quote. He alone who has not been planted in the precepts and warnings of God the Father can depart from the church. He alone can forsake the bishops and abide in his madness with schismatics and heretics. But the mercy of God the Father and the indulgence of Christ our Lord and our own patience will unite the rest with us. I bid you, dearest brother, Ever heartily farewell. End of Epistle 58 by Cyprian. Read by David Ronald. Epistle 49 of Epistles of Cyprian by Cyprian. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Epistle 49 Maximus and the other confessors to Cyprian about their return from schism. Argument. They inform Cyprian that they had returned to the church. Maximus, Urbanus, Sidonius, and Macarius, to Cyprian, their brother, greeting. We are certain, dearest brother, that you also rejoice together with us with equal earnestness, that we, having taken advice, and especially considering the interests and in the peace of the church, having passed by all other matters, and reserved them to God's judgment, have made peace with Cornelius, our bishop, as well as with the whole clergy. You ought most certainly to know from these our letters that this was done with the joy of the whole church, and even with the forward affection of the brethren. We pray, dearest brother, that for many years you may fare well. End of Epistle 49 by Cyprian Read by David Ronald Epistle 50 of Cyprian by Cyprian. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Epistle 50 from Cyprian to the Confessors, congratulating them on their return from schism. Argument. Cyprian congratulates the Roman Confessors on their return into the church and replies to their letters. Cyprian to Maximus the Presbyter, also to Urbanus and Sidonius and Macarius, his brethren. Greeting. When I read your letters, dearest brethren, that you wrote to me about your return, 
and about the peace of the church and the brotherly restoration i confess that i was as greatly overjoyed as i had before being overjoyed when i learnt the glory of your confession and thankfully received tidings of the heavenly and spiritual renown of your warfare for this moreover is another confession of your faith and praise to confess that the church is one and not to become a sharer in other men's errors or rather wickedness to seek anew the same camp whence you went forth whence with the most vigorous strength you leapt forth to wage the battle and to subdue the adversary for the trophies from the battlefield ought to be brought back thither whence the arms for the field had been received lest the church of christ should not retain those same glorious warriors whom christ had furnished for glory now however you have kept in the peace of the lord the fitting tenor of your faith and the law of undivided charity and concord and have given by your walk an example of love and peace to others so that the truth of the church and the unity of the gospel mystery which is held by us are also linked together by your consent and bond and confessors of christ do not become the leaders of error after having stood forth as praiseworthy originators of virtue and honour let others consider how much they may congratulate you or how much each one may glory for himself i confess that i congratulate you more and i more boast of you to others in respect of this your peaceful return and charity for you ought in simplicity to hear what was in my heart i grieved vehemently and i was greatly affected that i could not hold communion with those whom once i had begun to love after the schismatical and heretical error laid hold of you on your going forth from prison it seemed as if your glory had been left in the dungeon for there the dignity of your name seemed to have stayed behind when the soldiers of christ did not return from the prison to the church although they had gone into the prison with the praise and congratulations of the church for although there seemed to be tares in the church yet neither our faith nor our charity ought to be hindered so that we see that there are tares in the church we ourselves should withdraw from the church we ought only to labor that we may be wheat that when the wheat shall begin to be gathered into the lord's barns we may receive fruit for our labor and work the apostle in his epistle says quote, in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver but also of wood and of earth and some to honor and some to dishonor end quote. let us strive dearest brethren and labor as much as we possibly can that we may be vessels of gold or silver but to the lord alone it is granted to break the vessels of earth to whom also is given the rod of iron the servant cannot be greater than his lord nor may any one claim to himself what the father has given to the son alone so as to think that he can take the fan for winnowing and purging and threshing floor or can separate by human judgment all the tares from the wheat that is a proud obstinacy and a sacrilegious presumption which a depraved madness assumes to itself and while some are always assuming to themselves more dominion than meek justice demands they perish from the church and while they insolently extol themselves blinded by their own swelling they lose the light of truth for which reason we also keeping moderation and considering the lord's balances and thinking of the love and mercy of god the father have long and carefully pondered with ourselves and have weighed what was to be done with due moderation all which matters you can look into thoroughly if you will read the pamphlets which i have lately read here and have for the sake of our mutual love transmitted to you also for you to read wherein there is neither wanting for the lapsed censure which may rebuke nor medicine which may heal moreover my feeble ability has expressed as well as it could the unity of the catholic church which pamphlet i now more and more trust will be pleasing to you since you now read it in such a way as to approve and love it inasmuch as what we have written in words you fulfil in deeds when you return to the church in the unity of charity and peace i bid you 
dearest brethren, and greatly longed for, ever heartily farewell. End of Epistle 50 by Cyprian Read by David Ronald